Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the 2021 AMSAT Dr. Tom Clark K3IO Memorial Space Symposium and Annual General Meeting. Uh, my name is Paul Stetzer, NHHM, AMSAT's Executive Vice President, and uh, uh, thank you all for attending. We have a great lineup of presentations here today. And with that, I will turn the turn this, and welcome to the turn this over to uh, Clark, hold on Memorial Space Symposium and Annual Sorry about that. With that, I will turn it over to AMSAT President Robert Bankston, KE4AL. Good morning, Paul, uh, and uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Robert Bankston, KE4AL, and I am the president of AMSAT. It's my privilege to open the 2021 AMSAT Dr. Tom Clark K3IO Memorial Space Symposium, our 39th annual space symposium. Uh, while we are unable to meet in person this year, we are fortunate to have two great platforms online to interact with our members on Zoom and our visitors following on YouTube. What a wonderful opportunity to get together to explore and share the opportunities for amateur radio in space and celebrate the life of Dr. Tom Clark, K3IOO, who served us as AMSAT's board of directors for 44 years, uh, that's continuous years, and was a true pioneer of amateur satellite and digital technical innovation. I want to personally thank our symposium volunteers, the virtual teams, those who submitted papers, and our speakers today. Enjoy the symposium. We look forward to interacting with you during this event. Back to you, Paul. Okay. Uh... Thank you, Robert. Um, our first uh, presenter today will be uh, Dr. Bob McGuire. He will be um, he will be presenting a uh, a memorial presentation uh, about uh, the life of uh, Dr. Dr. Clark. Tom, so on one second. With that, I will uh, turn it over to uh, to Bob. Take a second to get ready here. Yeah, I'm trying to figure out how to share the screen. Oh, there we go. And uh, for everyone, can, yeah, so I'm sharing the screen. Okay, so we're here today to honor our friend and mentor Tom Clark, K3IO. Tom died on 28th of September this year, following a brief, thankfully brief, uh, collapse due to uh, stroke, one stroke and then another. Um, the thing what we should all remember about the end is Tom knew that his body was getting frail and that he was no longer able to keep up the, even the small rigors one might have to go through to come to AMSAT board meetings. And so he discontinued being uh, an AMSAT director uh, in the year in 2020. So uh, he knew that he, things were, were getting tough, but Tom was not giving up. I can assure you of that. So, and you'll find that out very quickly as we uh, begin the slides. So Tom was to many of us, friend, mentor, scientist, and engineer, and being a radio amateur and part of AMSAT was in his blood. There was no way Tom's life cannot be defined by at least half of it, radio, being a radio amateur and AMSAT, in addition to that, we'll cover those things that many of you may not know about Tom being a scientist and something of his early trajectory. The thing Tom and I shared in common was that we both grew up in rural areas. We both had parents that encouraged us at a very young age, and both of us became uh, radio amateurs at approximately the same age. I was a little over 10 and Tom was 11, and both of us just had this kind of similar uh, both uh, similar introduction to amateur radio, and both of us eventually became scientists, and beginning in 1980, 
uh, when I was a first year graduate student at Brown University, Tom and I really became close friends. Uh, that was the year in which he encouraged me, given other things that I had done for AMSAT, to take the rate at, at tracking program he had done and do things with it. So uh, that began this now decades long friendship, which has not ended with his death, but is not the same. Uh, during the last uh, month of his life, it began with Tom planning on taking a thousand, multi thousand mile car trip and train trip. Tom was planning to come to through Alabama and spend time with Sharon and I. Sharon is in one SMM and I'm in 4HY. And uh, Tom was very close friends with us. And he was driving on his way to go to Texas, where many of you may uh, know that he had a friendship with Jerry Checon. And th they became traveling companions and friends. And they were going to get on a train trip and go to the West Coast and uh, around. And then he would return through here and go back. So Tom was not sitting down and dying. He had no plans for that. He was making plans. So I want to uh, try to read a couple of lines of this poem, because if I try to read all of it, I promise you, I just I won't make it through it. Tom was not rolling over and dying. He was not going gentle into that good night. He was living. We regularly argued. We talked on the phone about technical matters. Tom was beginning to get involved in the uh, ARDC. Uh, he was a sta staged to join the Grants Advisory Committee. He was going to continue. And I couldn't think of anyone better than Tom Clark to help go over the grant submissions uh, because the ARDC uh, encourages and, and, and uh, helps those people who apply, apply to ARDC uh, for grants to not overlook things and so forth. We've hired a pro professional grant person. And Tom was going to join the ARDC Grants Advisory Committee. Uh, and then the strokes uh, cut him first of his travel off and then his life. Uh, Tom suffered very little after the uh, second stroke. Uh, he was uh, not uh, awake. He was a comatose. And it was quickly determined that uh, he was, had met all the conditions of his living will and everyone involved agreed that he had. And so he was moved into hospice within 24 hours of his having moved into hospice, he passed. So Tom roared into uh, the end of his life, planning lots of things, but when it came, he roared his way out. Uh, so let's, uh, let's go move on now and see if we can't learn some things about Tom. For those of you who don't know him or, or need a reminder, Tom was born in Alameda, Colorado in the 1930s. He became a ham at age 11 and was WN0IVF. Tom and his father uh, kind of had the same relation my, my father and I had in that uh, uh, his, his father helped him get his first amateur radio equipment, which was a Heathkit AT1 and uh, uh, a Howard 430 uh, communications receiver. I ham had a Hamilton HQ150, and he also had a BC348, a little higher performance receiver. And his, his father and he fit fiddled around with the mechanics of antennas and other things. And back then, you had one year to leave the novice rank uh, and uh, move up. And Tom was over 150 miles away in the middle of nowhere, Colorado. Uh, so he got his mentors, uh, uh, W0KQD and Jim Kraft, uh, to help him move up. And he upgraded conditional general and became W0IVF. And uh, the, you, you guys should check out this equipment. Uh, Tom 
I uh, lo- love tinkering with his stuff. And the AT-1 was still in his basement when he cleared out the house and sold it. So in his late, uh, teens, he moved to Pueblo, Colorado, and there became protege of Ed Tilton, uh, where they had uh, Tom's first VHF QSO. Tilton had a Gonzett communicator in his car, and Tom had this little tube rig. And Tom got his first QSO and then became a VHF and plus uh, person for the remainder of his life. He loved it. And Tom went on to go to school in Denver. He had great Elmer's physics teachers and hams. And eventually he decided he would go to uh, the University of Colorado in Boulder and during his life, Tom held the calls WN0IUF, W0IUF, K0RBI, W4JBL, WA3LND, W3IWI, G4UTL, and finally K3IO. And while these calls, you might remember, of course, one used to be unable to keep the call you were given if you moved out of the district in which that call applied. So when Tom moved from the zero district to the fourth district, he had to get W4JBL and so forth. So that's why all these call signs, except for the last one. Uh, Tom, uh, Tom loves to tell the story, and I will tell it as the, as the topic comes up of how he came to get K3IO. When Tom uh, went to Colorado, he first got his degree in um, uh, uh, engineering physics because he wanted to be a radio guy. He was trying to continue uh, into his professional life, the fun he was having as an amateur radio operator. And he did very well as an undergraduate. But he really enjoyed it when he got to be working on his doctoral degree where he got a PhD in astrophysics and astrogeophysics. This is a picture from above and on the ground of the 10 megahertz radio telescope Tom used for his PhD. Tom made radio telescope observations of the sun, the planet Jupiter, and the interactions between Jupiter and Io, and the uh, emissions from electrons that are flying around our galaxy uh, as uh, uh, really high speed particles interacting with magnetic fields, which give off emissions. So Tom loved this. He loved doing this so much that he stayed, stayed at graduate school for nearly a decade. But finally, they forced him to write a PhD, kicked him out, and he had done his thing. And so IO was, to his mind, the most interesting part of the work he did with the radio telescope he built with his own hands out at the University of Colorado. So when K3IO became available, that's when he got that call sign. And IO is a really interesting moon of Jupiter. As it goes through Jupiter's magnetic field, it has these volcanoes that spew out uh, sulfur and other particles and these particles become ionized and they interact with Jupiter's magnetosphere and turn into little transmitters because as you accelerate electrons, they give off photons and these photons are, are radio frequency uh, uh, emitters as well as others, but radio frequencies that you can hear on earth with modest antennas. So as Tom left Colorado, he also had to join the service and he wasn't in, he wasn't up for six years. So he got, he agreed to the draft for, for three years. And he was certain that he was going to go to Vietnam where he would build or blow up bridges and bomb things, et cetera, during the Vietnam War. And then a great thing happened. Even though he was in the active duty service, Marshall Space Flight Center is at Redstone Arsenal and next to Redstone Arsenal, and he get, was given the opportunity with a PhD in physics to go join Werner von Braun's staff at Marshall from 1966 to 1968. This allowed him to continue his physics and learning and be around really, really smart people uh, that were different from the ones he knew in Colorado, so it expanded his consciousness. 
uh, in terms of science. And he, and of course, in addition to that, it kept him out of the rice paddies. So we got to keep him around for a few decades. During this time, Tom earned a decent living. So he began racing cars and doing road rallies while he was in Alabama. I can tell you to this day, people drive crazy while they're here. So it's not a really big stretch of the imagination that one would do that. But Tom had an interesting uh, way of doing road rallies, car racing, because he had a small house and he regularly had to work on his engines and he would work on his engines inside of his living room. And he regularly put the crankcase in the dishwasher to clean it out. So Elizabeth, his wife, was working in at, at, for the government in, in Huntsville and he met her. She was a South Carolina lady and she was working in Huntsville and she didn't seem to mind that this weird guy washed his engines in his dishwasher so he went hmm he asked her to marry him and the arc of tom's adult life began with their marriage and the work he did for uh, Werner von braun so tom moved to goddard and uh this is an excerpt this is from a slide deck where tom many of you may have seen tom uh, give his talk on 60 years a prisoner of amateur radio, like many of us are. So he went to, uh, after uh, um, going to uh, Marshall and working for Werner, he went to Goddard and started working on very low frequency radio astronomies uh, with RAE 1 and 2, the Explorer 38 and 49 satellites, which the uh, which was sent up on the army rockets that came from Redstone Arsenal. I mean, he was connected because he knew Werner von Braun. So he got to participate in these great experiments and build his physics reputations, uh, reputation. So at about the time this work was coming to an end or had done its most, most um, uh, interesting work, including building that spacecraft, which is depicted on the right part of the slide, which had humongous antennas. I mean, they were hundreds of meters across uh, with, the, with the dipole antennas extended. And then there was a bar that extended, which was, the, which was filled full of um, a gel, a gelatin. And that was a libration damper. And so this, this spacecraft, given these long antenna appendages, would be gravity gradient locked after it stopped wobbling and the nutation damper helped it stop its wobbling. So this was really interesting. So right here, you can see the beginnings of Tom's interest in doing fun things in space. So in 69, he joined the University of Maryland Physics and Astronomy faculty, and he began his lifelong work and very long baseline interferometry, and he continued to do road rallies and build race cars. So very long baseline interferometry arrives in the late 60s at Goddard, and Tom was a technical leader very quickly. As, as many of you know, but let me emphasize, Tom was much more than a theoretical physicist. He was an engineering instrumentation uh, physicist, and he could build instruments and then do the theory. He was very, very unusual in terms of the class of person he would interact with technically. And it and that was, we all benefited from that because he came into AMSAT and helped us with all sorts of things. But he wanted to use quasars and see if he could do very long baseline interferometry uh, to look at these quasars and, and figure out how big the antennas, had, the virtual antennas had to be in order to get an image of the shape and the density and the emission profile, et cetera, of these quasars. And he figured out soon enough with others that the, the uh, telescope, virtual or real, had to be the diameter of the earth or larger, but we were limited to the diameter of the earth then. So Tom was critical in figuring out the way to make this work. So if you look at a quasar, which is most of the way across the universe, it's not in our galaxy, they're way across the universe and they're ancient, they're billions of years old. But by the time 
the light and radio emissions from the quasar reach the earth, it doesn't matter where on the earth you are, the same signal arrives because all the degradations have happened along the path. And so essentially, everyone on earth sees the same signal. Now, what you don't have the same at all points on earth are the angle you're pointing at the quasar, the noise sources that are at your local site and the interference sources, which are at your local site because they were observing these quasars in microwave frequencies. And these microwave frequencies were line of sight unless you had some weird uh, propagation like ducting, et cetera. So, so the, the noises and interferences were independent. And so if you take this same signal and you try to do constructive interference of the quasar, you could get a big signal to noise ratio improvement on the signal from the quasar. But you had to figure out how to line these things up so they constructively uh, interfered rather than destructively interfered or wobbled around. So at that time, just in the nick of time, uh, hydrogen and masers were expensive, but they were available. And you sitting at Goddard, you could, uh, car, you, could, uh, you could calibrate them and move them to the place on the earth where the antenna was. And these hydrogen masers would lose less than one second of precision uh, uh, in a million years. Not only that, they kept, they kept the time ticks coming along regularly for millions of years. But in addition to that, they didn't wobble a lot down in the nanosecond or picosecond range. So uh, they were, the, the, the phase noise they introduced on the signal was minimal and they were hyper accurate. So this enabled these antennas and receivers that were thousands and thousands of miles apart to constructively add their signals together, even though they were recorded on tape. So the hydrogen maser would be used to generate a timing signal that was added to the incoming signal of the quasar and then recorded on magnetic tape. These magnetic tapes would be boxed up and sent back to Goddard and the magnetic tapes from all over the world for one observation period would be loaded onto a big IBM mainframe and they would be lined up because it had this timing signal. And then the phase offset would be calculated. And this basic phase and timing offset would, would be sufficient for you to image in the radio waves the quasar. Well, Tom became a master of this art. Uh, and he really got it down pat. And his group led, led the world in, in kind of going down this path. But Tom didn't want to stop there because his mind never stopped working, not even until the last days of his life. So Tom figured out that as we look at these quasars, we could look at the change of the signal and timing, frequency, whatever, from these different antennas. And it would tell us things about how the earth was moving beneath the antenna. So Tom turned very long baseline interferometry into an amazing science of geodesy. And with that, he was able to measure uh, plate tectonics and other things. So look, Tom's rise over his VLBR career made senior scientists at Goddard Space Flight Center. He had 150 peer reviewed or referee journal papers. Tom's team became the most accurate geodesy team in the world. These VLBI measurements, more than just doing radio astronomy, they were now measuring the motion of the earth underneath the instrument. And they could do things like measure plate tectonics, velocities changes and position changes every single day, not over years or average, but the actual daily time series, they could measure them. 
and they could easily see El Nino currents in the oceans, changes in the Earth's rotation on a daily basis. And as, as, as the equipment got better, you could see the regular daily rotations, the moon wobbling the Earth in its orbit, and other things. It just was remarkable. And he could show that the Earth, with all the sun and moon gravity, moved up and down inches underneath our feet every single day. Well, this work really astounded the American Geophysical Unit because Tom's measurements were used as the thing that scientists uh, looked to to validate their models for all sorts of things. So theoretical scientists typically make models and do math on paper or calculations on a computer. And, but in order to make a theory be acceptable to a wide range of people in a scientific field, there needs to be experimental data to confirm these theories predictions. And Tom's, was, Tom's work with VLBI and astronomy at, and doing this geophysical work was, was one of the principal sources of data that helped prove and improve these theories. And uh, Tom, uh, had reg about every year, he threw his, his measurements throughout about half of, a new, half of all the new theories. Because one thing a scientist knows, your theory is only as good as does it, does it, at, does it match the data. If the, if the theory doesn't work with actual data, the theory is wrong in the story. So for this, uh, Tom became a fellow of the American Geophysical Union. And this was one of those times when we were such good friends. Uh, my wife and I were invited to the ceremony and we got to see Tom awarded uh, his big plaque and, and inducted as a fellow. And very, very less than 1% of all the geophysical people get, in, uh, get made a fellow. And Tom had six people on his team become fellows of the AGU. They were that important. I mean, you imagine there are not that many uh, geophysical scientists working at the tip of the iceberg. And so for Tom to get six of them, he was probably like six out of 100, let's say. Uh, so it was really remarkable that his team did so well and was so important, the Geophysical Union honored him. And so Tom was not just staying at home. He was going all around the world trying to get others involved in VLBI so they could get more data and get more science. And he encouraged and aided the Russians to participate in this very long baseline interferometry worked all the details out of the cooperation, even though they were still the Soviet Union and we were enemies. Uh, it was like the current work that goes on on the International Space Station. The politics was one thing, they, they weren't doing politics uh, when they were doing science. Or if they were doing politics, they were lying to their politicians so they could do the science. And so Tom went over and helped them set up BLBI instruments all, all over the Soviet Union and then Russia later. And he was the first non-Russian to win the Russian Academy of Science gold medal for his leadership and the work he helped them do and join. So VLBI was Tom's life until it wasn't. And look, in the early 2000s and late 1990s and 2000s, uh, NASA had shrinking budgets and they wanted to reallocate monies or Tom was just having a harder and harder time getting support for his team. It was a lot of responsibility to have to provide for all that team. He could afford to retire, and so he did. He retired in 2001, and then rather than be a 40-hour-a-week person, which is really more than 40 when you do this kind of work, uh, and it can vary a lot, and it's a little bit unpredictable with these large worldwide teams. So Tom uh, moved on and became a consultant. He uh, was on the board of Haystack, the advisory board of Haystack, and also an advisory board of SETI. And as some of you may know, and I didn't put in a slide here, Tom and I helped to work, work on the early part of, of the SETI stuff out in California. And we were invited to the, the opening salvo from uh, the Allen Telescope. And we uh, watched Paul Allen push a button and get the official first signal through the Allen Telescope for the SETI Institute. 
Okay, so let's be, move on now from his uh, career to AMSAT. Tom was an early member of AMSAT. He was not a founder, but he joined really shortly after its formation. And after everybody clearly saw his worth, uh, he became uh, a member of the AMSAT board in 1974 and served until the fall of 2020 when he said, I just can't go off to these meetings anymore and so forth. And so he resigned in fall of 2020 and turned to other things. But let's look at some of the things he did while he was a member of AMSAT. Tom anticipated the phase Phase three, sorry, that's, I wrote phase four and I meant phase three. My apologies. Anticipating phase three, Tom writes the first open source general orbiting tracking program where that had been relegated to governments and big scientists. Tom figured out a terrific approximation that allowed these computations that would put our spacecraft, that being AMSATs, et cetera, inside about a 10 kilometer box anywhere in orbit from the two line elements that were coming out of NORAD. So uh, Tom is the father of all of that. And I can tell you from uh, befriending Tom and him encouraged me to do the work and me doing quick track uh, way back then when it was still Commodore basic and following that, Franklin, Antonio, and Paul uh, did, did uh, easy track and so forth. Uh, it raised a huge amount of money and was a large portion of the funding of the technical work of AMSAT for years. And that's all attributed to Tom and his inspirational leadership and his actually having done the prototype work. The thing that Tom uh, encouraged me to do, as I'm sure many of you are old enough to remember when these computers were slow as molasses, but he knew I was a somewhat capable applied mathematician. And he says, is there anything we can do to speed this computation up? So I began doing exactly what all research scientists and developers do. I started studying the problem and read what others had done. And I discovered these magnificent books by Pedro Escobar, where he had done all of this mathematical derivation of all sorts of equations that were, were able to help you do computations. And I found in there where Pedro Escobar had derived a function that was zero when the spacecraft was on your horizon. So, uh, and what does that mean? That means this function was zero when you had AOS or LOS. And I quickly realized that though this equation was extremely complicated looking, in fact, it was mathematically simple. And not only that, it, was, it had the properties that allowed it to be utilized in a well-known technique called Newton's method for finding these zeros. And it was quadratic converged. I mean, it's really fast. So the way Tom's program work and others, they just step through time very slowly, chunk, 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 until they saw the satellite was above the horizon or going below the horizon. And they announced AOS or LOS and printed out the tracking ephemeris. Well, this thing that I did with Tom's encouragement was jump through time through using mathematical hoops. So it would quickly go from one AOS or LOS to the next AOS very quickly. And it took uh, a Commodore 64 from taking 20 minutes to paint the screen full of passes to under a minute. And it was kind of neat. So I kept, the that's when Tom and I really got to know each other. And we started doing things together uh, regularly then. So, uh, that was his major, major input there. Just if he had done nothing else, this would have been amazing. So Tom became executive vice president of AMSAT in 1975 until the ocean geostationary version. And I put four again, and I meant phase 3A, sorry, in 1980 when uh, phase 3A did not become an Oscar because it went under the water when the Ariane launcher failed. 
Shortly after that, the board of AMSAT makes Tom president, and he is tasked with helping save the organization. And Tom led the organization, along with our AMSAT DL partners and others, uh, all the way through the uh, launch of Oscar 10. In the late 80s, he stepped down as AMSAT president. Tom became AMSAT president emeritus and the official commergent. But some of the things he did along the way, he built a 10-meter antenna for Oscar 8. And while everyone wasn't looking, he grabbed the spacecraft, which was had large instability and leakage problems, ran himself into a bathroom and locked the door and soldered in bypass capacitors all over the thing. And when they came out, they fired it up and it was still working, but all the problems were gone. Tom just had a knack and knew what needed to be done. And rather than argue about it, the typical Tom just did it. Uh, so Oscar 8 was up for years and all of us know how well that went. Tom worked on the design of packet radio satellites, PACSAT, with NK6K and KD2S and Martin Sweeting of USAT and got, got the thing uh, all up and at him. Uh, he designed and built the SARETS packet robot for Ron Paris to fly, WA4SIR, to fly on the shuttle. He was a Microsat concept developer with Jan King, Gordon Hardman, Phil Karn, and me in a hotel room. And I can assure you more than one of us were doing designs under the influence. And Martha and John were listening through the wall with a water glass in the next door room to try to figure out what we were doing. And so Microsat was born. I mean, this was typical of a Tom interaction and development. We'd have good ideas, we'd sit around and argue with them. And of course, uh, when I get into other things, we'll tell for his further work uh, in packet radio. Tom designed all of the uplink receivers and the serial control bus for Microsats, which, had, which were incarnated and reincarnated in Oscar 16, 17, 18, 19, 26, 27, and 31. Tom had a remarkable career with AppSat. So Tom and Packet Radio and Tapper. Well, Tom was nearly a founding member of Tapper like he was nearly a founding member of, of AMSAT because he was always trying to figure out how he could play and participate at the leading edge of everything. Tom always lived at the bleeding edge. And he was around during the TNC1 and TNC2. So Tom was a member of the Tapper board from 1983 to 1988. But of course, during uh, those the, 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 the early days of packet radio, Tom wanted to be able to send packet radio digital signals through the high earth orbit satellites. And so fearing chaos in the packet protocols, well, he figured out how we could point our antennas with his tracking program, but he feared chaos because the packet protocol wars were really heating up. So Tom did what he do usually does. He called everybody, arranged for transportation, talked the meet people at Goddard into allowing a meeting on campus, and he brought all the stakeholders he could, and this was almost all of them, to Goddard Space Flight Center, and he locked them in a room and told them they were not leaving until amateur radio packet was decided and we had a single standard and AX25 was born. It was not perfect, all of us know that, but a quick and quickly after version two came out to fix many of the problems. And Phil Karn and Terry Fox and others worked on lots of these, these things, but this work gave us AX25. And on top of that, Phil Karn built TCP IP and NOS and put TCP IP over the radio for the first time. Then he left his Bellcore job and went to Qualcomm, where TCP IP went over the air regularly and gave us smartphones. I mean, it's just remarkable, the things that Tom touched that turned into something amazing. So while he was at Tapper, of course, Tom was really enamored of timing. Remember, he did these hydrogen maser clocks and oscillator, the tamed oscillators to use on his very long baseline interferometry stations. But then GPS came along. 
And Tom wanted the what was available uh, as a maser, maybe not as accurate, maybe a little less stable, but more accurate than we could get any other way. He wanted totally accurate clocks in our laboratories and in our shacks for cheap. And it was not cheap for somebody who was earning minimum wage, but as far as an instrument for people who had the funds to go and do things in an interesting way, and I'm not talking ridiculous, I'm not talking the price of a car, I'm talking about something within reason. He designed the totally accurate clock and, and, and T Tapper put it out. So this brought to bear uh, GPS tamed frequency and time standards to amateur radio. And Rick Hambly's company, CNS Systems, is born from the totally accurate clock work that Tom did. And then they became uh, 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 sparring partners over technology and CNS Systems almost to the end of Tom's life. And just let me say, uh, now that I've mentioned Rick, I also want to mention Martha and John and uh, uh, Frank Bauer. Tom got in really bad shape around 2011. And Sharon and I went to Tom's house after Shirley White, his next door neighbor, told us that Tom had been in a hospital and he needed help. So we came and we found that Tom was not taking care of himself. So Rick and Elaine, Frank, Sharon and I, we intervened and uh, uh, Tom was just in bad shape, but we got him to take care of himself. And he lived a, a good extra 10 years uh, doing uh, fun activities and helping AMSAT. So uh, Tapper and AMSAT together, uh, basic, with, mostly with Tom's leadership, did a lot of interesting things. So Tom and I and a few others bought the Delanco Spry TMS320 C10, that's a TI DSP chip board that was being put together in the garage of an engineer in Washington, DC. So we went along and uh, I wrote some modems. And I remember what the first thing I did and went around the country showing it off was I took in PSK signals that were intended to be downlinked from spacecraft and with a DSP program a modem, turned it into FSK signals that could be pushed into the front of a regular TNC. And the regular TNC would need no modification. You would just do this external connection. And that eventually got turned into a product of Tapper. And uh, when Reedy and a bunch of others turns it into a product that sold it all over. So that was the first actual DSP project that I am aware of in amateur radio that turned into an actual product. So several digital modems were born, all sorts of experimentation was done, learning to code DSP spread in and around amateur radio and the Tapper and AMSAT DSP project just had a big impact. So being an applied mathematician and an electrical engineer, because I had a dual degree from Auburn before I got my PhD from Brown, most of the coding circuitry is best done in complex baseband processing. I'm not going to go into what that means here, but it's just kind of the natural math of doing radios. So we soon realized that all analog and digital radio ideas naturally can be done and want to use this process that had been developed. So Tom and I proposed to AEA, who did the PK-232, that a software radio could be built. But they went, well, we're not gonna jump all the way there. We're gonna do some other stuff first. So Tapper produces several DSP projects and eventually high performance software defined radios. And Tom and I demonstrate with the Delanco Spry board that 100 watt satellite class stations, that's typical KLM across Yaggies and 100 watts. And we could produce detectable, uh, detectable EME signals off the moon. Later, Tom and Phil Karn proposed a digital scheme to do EME. It had all sorts of features to it that were lovely. Joe Taylor quickly realized that you've got to spend a ton of power doing frequency and timing synchronization. And so the jumpy, chirping signal 
was born and Joe Taylor coded the signaling characteristics that Tom and Phil produced that built on the ideas that we showed you had detectable signals off the moon into WSJT and Joe has now changed the world. And all this stuff has its birth in Tapper and AMSAT DSP project. Okay, so software defined radio is born. So the board you're seeing here with all the blue wires that fix all the problems on serial number one to make it work, where software defined radio was born. Uh, so uh, Tom proposed an analog interface and uh, so we could hook it to the IF uh, that was bringing signals down because at that time we could get like 13 megahertz, mega samples per, uh, 13 uh, megahertz samples per second, uh, uh, analog digital converters and digital analog converters. And so we proposed a baseband complex, uh, baseband, complex baseband processing for all analog modes. And, but first we did the digital modes on the 56001 and with uh, Brooks Van Pelt and Pat Spadapore and I uh, uh, proposed this and AEA turned it into the DSP 2232. Now, this, the work we did here and proposed to AEA was the first outside in the world software defined radio proposal. Unknown to any of us, e-systems, which, which is a very high level uh, contractor doing classified work for the government, uh, proposed software radio in an internal paper in 1984, but it didn't go anywhere. So, uh, so we proposed to AEA in 1988 that following the DSP through 2232, we would do a software radio where it had this hybrid approach, ADC and DAC at the IF, and all the regular processing sideband, CW, radio, teletype, digital modems, all of that would be done in the baseband. And now we'd have a software radio with an analog front end interface that made the ADC and DAC usable. So we proposed that and AEA said yes. Within six months, George Buxton, who was the general manager of AEA, uh, contracted non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, and basically the company and this effort fell apart. So this work was followed in 1992 by Joe Matola, who knew of the work because I had taken this work inside to the National Security Agency, was allowed to write several papers and he became worldwide known as the father of software radio. Now, Joe and I know this, uh, we, we, and, and we're friends. We're friends enough that he and I co-founded the company Federated Wireless together. So this is known, we both admit it and laugh about it, but we've gone on and do, done other things together. So Tom receives the ARRL President's Award from uh, N3KN near the end of his AMSAT and Tapper career. Uh, and Tom was really happy with this. He was a big time donor. Uh, Diamond Club, et cetera, to, to ARRL and uh, for all the work he did and his ongoing support of ARRL, he was awarded the President's Award. This is Tom Clark sitting in a hotel room we shared, a life member of the Central States VHF Society the year he won the Chambers Award. And everyone that knows Tom knows this is Tom. Uh, he was probably, he wouldn't bring his CPAP machine, so he didn't, didn't sleep good, and he would fall asleep at the drop pad. So I would shake him awake and get him to the meetings. And, of course, during the meetings, uh, if he wasn't talking, he would also snore and, and sleep. But when he was awake, he was a firebrand to deal with. And uh, the, Tom loved, loved, loved the Central States VHF Society. They loved him and they honored him for all of his technical work in VHF, UHF, and microwave, which included things like worked all continents on 70 centimeters in 12 hours using a 140 foot dish at the Green Bank Observatory. I mean, Tom was always marrying in amateur radio escapades with his professional work because he had taken a bunch of graduate students to to Green Bank with him and forced them to climb all over that antenna and even out of prime focus to hang, hang pre-amplifiers and amplifiers 
so he could make these signals. And they made one mistake and had the um, transmitter blanket the receiver or they would have done 10 gigahertz work off the moon with 140, but they did 70 centimeters and he got worked all continents in half a day. Tom was inducted into the Radio Club of America and made a fellow of RCA. Uh, and that was a great honor to him because Radio Club of America is the oldest radio club in the world. So in the Microsat lab, Tom, as I told you, designed all of the receivers and the interface board that was uh, made the, the, the build a satellite out of stacked modules process work. And you can see that in this left picture. The five chips are the five receiver chips that made the uplink receivers and all the microsats. You can see the helical resonators back there giving you a little IF filtering. And you can see the chips, which did the FSK detection. And down along the bottom, where you see that DB25 connector, that little circuit board between the edge of the module and the connector and that board, that board is the AART based serial bus that made these spacecraft work. And six AO16 through AO31 microsats all ran this module and that board. There were probably modifications and changes and components and layouts. And this is Jose Machao, Jan King, Tom and me looking at an oscilloscope showing us um, uh, the day we got bits to come out of these receivers on, uh, on two meters. And we all were in the Boulder lab working on all sorts of stuff uh, when we assembled the microsats and flew them in the early 1990s. Oh, here's Tom and Carl checking out AO10 and don't they look oh so happy. I was really happy to see Tom write a very, very nice, uh, uh, Carl write a very, very nice note recognizing the loss of Tom. Uh, and in the end, uh, all of the initial cantankerous natures and uh, arguments they had because they were two really, really smart people that sometimes had disagreements. But in the end, there was a rapprochement and uh, a settling of all that. And you can see it in Carl's very nice letter at Tom's end. So look, I'm gonna miss Tom Clark a lot. He's a friend, a mentor, and this, this talk uh, doesn't do justice to all that he has done. I've left things out, I've left people out, and I'm just trying to give you a taste of the impact this man has had. And with that, I'm, I'm done. Thank you very much, Bob. Uh, that was a, a wonderful presentation uh, and a tribute to, uh, to Tom. Uh, so thank you very much for, uh, for sharing that with us today. Um, I did have uh, a request from uh, Nick Pugue, uh, K5 uh, QXJ. Uh, he'd also like to say a couple of words about Tom. So let me, um, let me uh, get him up here on the screen here and uh, turn it over to uh, turn it over to Nick and uh, just uh, just a second here is uh, get him uh, set up for uh, for uh, for talking. All right, Nick, uh, over to you. Okay. Well, hello, everybody. Uh, really quick, uh, the Lord has uh, put Tom in a little higher orbit, and he hasn't given us enough radio to talk to him yet. But uh, one of my finest memories, and uh, Bob kind of talked on that, was uh, VHF Packet. Uh, about three and a half decades ago, Tom and a couple of guys over here were uh, connecting a uh, mighty fine blazing 1200 baud VHF radio to a server at UL when we were trading emails. And in typical Tom uh, fashion, to test the link, he uh, picked up a ditty on the on the on the internet called uh, "My Dog Named Sex." You guys can go Google that. It's uh, pretty much FCC friendly and kind of shows you what uh, Tom Tom was up to. 
so uh, uh, the next uh, the next thing, of course, and Bob touched on it very uh, very elegantly about uh, Tom. Oh, uh, let me back up and say uh, one of the other memories, fond memories I had with uh, Tom, uh, Bob, and uh, Phil Corns was uh, over a cold beer and terrible chicken at McNasty's at Dayton. Uh, we had some very uh, lively discussions. And again, Bob touched on Tom's career. I had a discussion with him. He was telling me that uh, the uh, drift between Hawaii and uh, Alaska is about six centimeters. And I asked him how accurate that was. And uh, I got blessed with a conversation about uh, all what it took to do that. So in closing, uh, Godspeed to Tom and uh, 73s, we'll miss you, Tom. Thanks. Back to you, uh, Paul. Okay, uh, thank you, thank you very much for that, uh, uh, that Nick uh, as well. Um, well, we do have, we are uh, a bit ahead of schedule here. Um, so our next presentation is going to be from um, from Burns Fisher, uh, WB1FJ on uh, AO 109. Um, so. Uh, Suppose we can uh, get right to that uh, in just a second here. And thank you, uh, thank you again to uh, Bob and Nick. Uh, Tom will uh, certainly be missed. Um, I was fortunate enough to have a few conversations with him, but uh, not nearly enough to uh, to gain all the wisdom uh, that he had to share. Hi everyone, I'm Burns Fisher, WB1FJ, an AMSAT life member and currently a volunteer software writer for AMSAT satellites, including the Fox series and Golf T. See my shirt. You all know that AO109 is not working as well as we had hoped. I'm going to tell you how we debugged it, what we found out, and how you can still use it. First, let me say that AO109 is also called FOX1E, our FOX series number, and RADFXSAT2, the official name from Vanderbilt University, whose onboard experiment got us the NASA CSLI flight into orbit. FOX1E was built from spare parts from the other FM repeater FOX satellites, but with some differences. This one has a linear transponder and a new command receiver. This, is, this picture uh, is not FOX 1E, it may be 1B, but 1E looks essentially the same. I want to emphasize that FOX 1E was handled the same way as our previous FOX satellites. It was tested the same way, including the vibration testing that you see down here at the lower right. We finished in plenty of time, but well, as usual, hurry up and wait. The satellite had to sit around for several years and no changes were allowed other than keeping it charged. Uh, we had to wait to be told to deliver it. The first Virgin Orbit Launcher 1 mission ended up with a negative and very wet perigee, which caused more delay. But finally, FOX 1E was placed on the second Launcher 1 and it flew successfully into orbit. You see, uh, see here the Cosmic Girl 747-400 carrier aircraft, which has just dropped Launcher 1 from under its wing. Launcher 1 has fired its engine and taken off into orbit with FOX-1E and several other small satellites. As we always do with uh, new satellites, we listened from stations all over the world but this one was different. We never received a signal. Flat line right here, nothing. 
we have an in-orbit testing and problem flow chart. Uh, and in this case, we had to obviously go right to the problem flow chart. And among, among other things, what we did was to wait to ensure that the batteries get charged from the onboard solar panels. Um, we had to send a command to force the antennas to be open. We had to send a command to force the telemetry power uh, to be changed to a higher, um, higher level. And we sent a command to reboot the flight computer. But these are all done in the blind. There is no information of uh, the current spacecraft state. There is uh, no information about which commands were received and acted on. And after all our attempts of following the flowchart, well, nothing happened. No effect, at least nothing we could see. Uh, notice that since we didn't know which, if any, commands were received, nor what parts of the satellite, if any, were working, we didn't know what state it was in. Is it still in startup? Uh, is it still in safe mode? Is it in transponder mode? Is the IHU powered on? Is it powered off? Same with the transmitter, we just had no idea. It turns out that in our commanding, we had left the satellite in a state where the transponder could work and someone actually noticed. We had been looking for telemetry, but Brad W5SAT noticed a very weak transponder response to an uplink signal. Since it now meets the requirements for an Oscar number, Fox 1E was assigned the name AMSAT Oscar 109, AO109. But check out this odd behavior. When we sent a command to turn the IHU or the flight computer off, the transponder came on. When we commanded the IHU back on, the transponder went off. It happens that this is the exact behavior that we would expect if the transponder was not working with the IHU turned on. Fox 1E has a contingency mode that turns the transponder on if the, trans, if the IHU fails or if it's powered off. We now know that the IHU on off command, well, works. Although commanding requires a lot of repetition. We also know that the IHU, uh, the transponder I should say is very weak, but with no telemetry, no other information, including why the transponder is off when the IHU goes on. It's time to do some thinking and planning. Switching from contingency mode back to normal mode takes several seconds after the IHU is turned on. Essentially, the IHU has to boot. The time depends on how long the IHU does take to reboot, which is a number of seconds. After a lot of thinking and experimenting with the flight spare hardware, we came up with a, time, a timing table. The idea is to time how long it takes between turning the IHU on and the transponder going off. This tells how long it takes to boot, which in turn gives us several clues to its operation. The table looks something like this. Uh, if it's instant, the satellite thinks it was just released from the launcher and has never been fully booted. 20 seconds is the nominal IHU startup time. If it took around 45 seconds, the satellite sensors are showing that one of the antennas is not released. So it spends extra time trying to release it. If it took 70 seconds, uh, the IHU sensors show that both antennas are not released. So it tries to release both. Well, there's one problem with the timing scheme. The AL-109 not only has a very weak transponder, but it's difficult to command. Uh, we found that it required many repetitions of commands to take, but which one actually started the IHU? When do we start the timer? To get the commands to work quickly so we could time them better, Drew, KO4MA, offered his EME class station. He sent, um, 
he only sent, I should say, the commands for a few seconds, and we discovered that he could command reliably. Thus, we started the stopwatch the very moment that he started transmitting. We got the information we wanted. And I'll just say that, no, this is not a KO4MA station. It's, a, it's an EME, an Earth Moon Earth station that actually is owned by uh, a nearby friend of mine, AB1OC, Fred. But it's a good picture of a high power EME station. And the answer is the timing very closely matched the flight spares boot time with no antenna opening delays. I think it was 21 seconds that we measured. Uh, so chances are very good that in space, A09 looks not like this with the antenna, the antenna wrapped around itself, but rather uh, like this with the antenna uh, going out. So it's booted, but is the IHU running or is it limping? Is it in safe mode? Is, it a pro is there a problem? Um, we still don't quite know that. Uh, was the fact that the transponder stopped working due to an IHU bug? We'd, we'd really like to eliminate or point the finger at the software or the IHU right now. So now that we know the IHU is booted and that we can send a command, uh, which the IHU uh, itself acts on, we sent the transponder mode command and bingo, that turned the transponder back on. That tells us that the IHU can receive some commands. It can send messages between tasks and it can turn on the transponder by itself. So good news there. There are some ground commands that are totally decoded by the IHU. And in fact, it's another part of the IHU. So the next thing we did was to prove that software commands worked as well. This proves that the telemetry task is working because the telemetry task and the software command task are one and the same. It also gives us some additional commands that are known to work and to be received, or to, I should say to be received at the very least. So more complex commands were available. So now we sent a force antenna release command, first to each individual antenna, and then uh, using our extra capabilities of, the, uh, of these commands, we gave it extra time for the burn just in case the antenna had been slightly released, but not fully released enough to, um, for the telemetry to show that it's been, that it's open, but it's yet not open fully. We then sent commands to increase the telemetry gain first by three, by six, by nine, and then by 12 dB. Uh, unfortunately, there's still no behavior change. In May though, um, someone actually noticed that there was some weak telemetry visible uh, in some SATNOG stations. Uh, SATNOGS has stations all over the world, some with uh, simple small antennas and some with bigger antennas. In this case, W7KKE with a fairly uh, long Yagi was able to receive some telemetry, which you can see here in the water in the Satnogs waterfall. It was too weak to decode, but it looks right, except for the fact that there are all of these uh, additional um, information, uh, all these additional sidebands, I should say. Later, W7KKE, WA7FWF, and K8DP were all able to receive a few decodable frames with slightly larger antennas during high passes. So we say thank you very much to them. And by the way, I want to encourage you to collect telemetry from any satellite that you can as well. You can do it cheaply with a Raspberry Pi and a Fox in the Box software on the MSAT store. We're in the process of <clears throat> updating the Fox in the Box software and uh, have a lot of um, additional goodies on that Pi SD card uh, as well. 
So I encourage you to watch presentations um, by our Vice President of Educational Relations uh, to uh, see more information about this as well. So in the meantime, uh, and I don't expect you to have one of these, by the way, uh, there are some Nether Netherland hams um, that have access to a radio telescope. And you can see big antennas do wonders. Um, this particular signal is very easily decodable by Fox to Lim. Uh, the Dwinglo 25 meter radio telescope just received hundreds of frames and we give them great thanks. This is uh, wonderful information available here from Dwinglo. Uh, so what happened from the telemetry? What did we learn? First, uh, it confirmed our earlier experiments. The antennas are open. They're in transponder mode. Essentially, all the IHU tasks are working. They're power positive. But we also found out that the 8 milliwatt RF power output, uh, sorry, I should say the, uh, the RF power output is only 8 milliwatts now. The telemetry tells us that it started out with 100 milliwatts, but with poor uh, SWR. So that means that the um, that means that the the um, failure actually happened in orbit, uh, probably because of this SWR. Uh, the power amp current is too high, and the ground receive power is uh, kind of cyclic. You you can see that there's strong weak, strong weak, strong weak on on this particular thing. Um, so I'm showing you this picture, and it's just an example of what we can get from the telemetry. Uh, it's, it's only slightly interesting that this is the temperature. This is the current out of the power supply board. So uh, we get into the sun. Uh, the current starts suddenly. The temperature goes up slowly. Just a, an example of what you can do with Fox Telem. So our current guesses, um, we believe that one of the dual PAICs is blown or shorted. This explains the weak power and the high current. And, you know, we double checked this and this information came from uh, Dan, our RF uh, guru. So something caused the poor uh, SWR. We don't know what, but that does explain poor initial reception, but not completely. And it certainly explains the blown PA. Could something, that something that we're talking about, be the antennas not fully open? Well, we don't really know, but it seems a little unlikely. Um, the design is identical to the previous uh, Foxes. And we have both RX uh, uh, rate or receive and transmit problems. So if that's the problem, it had to have happened to both antennas. The spin fading that we see though, is, and the difficulty commanding is consistent with the antennas not being fully open. So that is something that we just can't answer at this point. But I wanna tell you, you can still use uh, Oscar 109. CW is certainly usable. The command team also had the great idea that AO 109 could be used with a weak signal mode like FT4. I've tried this myself, it works well, despite seeing absolutely no telemetry. I can transmit up with the full power of my IC9700, that's 100 watts. So I call this QRP with 100 watts. I'm gonna show a video to prove that I can uh, uh, get an FT4 signal through a, uh, AO109, but the video is cut off a bit on the right side. <clears throat> so I just wanna show you this picture first. This is two copies of the FT4 software. The one on the right is the one that you would normally use. Uh, the one on the left is uh, a receive only version. And uh, I use this just like you would use a full duplex um, radio um, to hear your, yourself with a phone signal. Um, it's, it's going to be able to show me that my uh, FT4 signal has reached AO109 and has come all the way back. So here's the video. Okay, uh, you are looking at Mac Doppler right now. And right here you see uh, AO109, 
which is just about to rise over my QTH. And I'm going to attempt to send FT4 packets to it, and I'll show you that in a second. Uh, the FT4 is running on a PC, which is right here. Uh, the left FT4 screen is receive only, and I'm using it so that I can tell if my signal gets to the um, to the satellite and back, just like you would use full, dupl uh, full duplex radios to hear yourself um, on a phone satellite. The one on the right is the one that I send with and also listen for other um, for other stations. Don't imagine we'll have any other stations on this time, but um, well, we'll see. I'm mainly interested in getting myself and we shall see what happens. I'm going to push, um, now that we're up by a few degrees, I'm going to push Enable TX, and it will, um, it's now sending um, CQ, WB1, FJ, and my grid square. So we'll just keep watching. I have my radio power on at full strength at the moment. That full power is 100 watts. Now look to the right and you can see just barely on the edge of my cutoff FT4 that uh, there are yellow lines appearing and each one of those yellow lines is me transmitting CQ. Nothing as yet. We're up to six degrees, that's not very high. Now you notice that on the receive end we're cranking up the gain at uh, every seven and a half second interval to listen carefully, and then it goes back down. Ha, ah, I'm seeing myself. Look at this. See that? See that bump? And here it is. I have received myself. Excellent. Okay, so thank you very much. I hope this has been interesting and useful. Thanks for listening. And uh, I'll come on live now and answer any questions. Hi there. So uh, um, I'm not sure if you can hear me, but Mark and I, uh, who Mark uh, also uh, listened, um, uh, worked on this whole thing with me and worked on the paper. Um, we're here to listen to questions, and there's Paul to be the moderator. All right, yeah, thank you, Burns, and uh, thanks, uh, Mark, for uh, for being here for the Q and A session as well. Uh, if any participants have any questions for either uh, Burns or Mark or both, uh, please use the uh, Q and A button. It should be at the bottom middle of your screen, um, rather than placing that the questions in the chat box. That can get a little uh, tough to um, tough to parse. So. Uh, do we have any questions for uh, for Burns and Mark? I don't see any as of yet, but uh, well, there's one that popped in. Um, okay, so uh, Steve uh, KS1G uh, asked, um, what seems to be a minimal station for CW or FT4 use? Uh, well, I'll, I'll tell you what my station is and Mark can uh, tell what his is. He's done it as well. Uh, I, I, I have a 100 watt um, radio and um, I also have a, um, an LEO pack uh, with a G5500 rotator. So I have um, the sort of modest, most modest LEO pack Yagis uh, and I can point at the satellite. How about you, Mark? Yeah, good question. <clears throat> One of the things uh, those of us that have used 109 uh, will share, it's, it's um, there's a lot of variability <clears throat> in terms of ascending, descending, uh, is it to the east of you, west of you, and <clears throat> they're, they're in the satellite itself is spinning and whatnot too. So <clears throat> on a, a really, really great pass, um, uh, similar to Burns, you know, using an M squared Leo pack, I've been able to, to 
turn it down into single digit watts out of the radio and, you know, losing half of the coax, or, you know, half the signal through coax or whatever, you can, you can see a carrier. So, you know, the, the, <clears throat> it's sometimes it's a pretty small signal that you can actually detect, but in practicality, you know, it, it takes an antenna with gain and a preamp that, that's a good preamp and gain in, in order to use it. So there's the ideal and then there's the real. So as little as a couple watts, but ordinarily we're, we're thinking it's probably a, a couple hundred watts of effective radiated power. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Mark and Burns. Um, Steve mentions uh, that he's um, managed some barely visible uh, CWs, CNEC, uh, heard, heard uh, Kate YSE on CW near his uh, time of closest approach with his um, uh, 14 element M squared um, and uh, uh, on two meters and then uh, for the uplink, the Leo pack downlink and uh, uh, ARR preamp uh, on the downlink with his IC9700. Uh, and I know that um, Kate YSE recently worked, uh, Kate YSE is in uh, John in Ohio, and he recently worked uh, A5PK Glen in uh, Texas on CW for a 2000 kilometer uh, contact, which uh, so far is the uh, distance record. Um, Chris Thompson, uh, G0KLA, also AC2CZ, our Foxtel M developer asks, uh, can you tell us how the experiment data has been used? Uh, actually, I just uh, had some contact with the um, Vanderbilt University, and um, uh, if if uh, anyone is familiar with uh, Fox One E, there are there are three boards on it. Uh, of uh, uh, Vanderbilt University has uh, memory chips on board, and they are trying to um, determine the um, uh, what radiation does to these memory boards. And there are three boards with three different kinds of chips. One of the boards. Um, in fact, unfortunately, the one that um, they were most interested in apparently does not work. And um, uh, he tells me he believes that that is their problem and not anything to do with the telemetry. But he is happy with the rest of the telemetry that he's getting. And again, this is, um, you know, special thanks to uh, the folks that have received this telemetry and especially to the Duenglo. Uh, radio telescope where we can get a whole lot of whole orbit data. So we get more data than, than uh, normal uh, about, the, about the experiment. Um, yeah, so, so uh, he is happy with the other two boards uh, information, Chris, and uh, getting more, uh, more information from anyone is wonderful, especially since the Vanderbilt University people are essentially the ones that got our ride into orbit because of their experiments on this particular uh, satellite. I'll add a couple details. Um, this information Burns is sharing about communications with the Vanderbilt uh, uh, experimental people is, is just from a couple days ago. <laughs> this is not information that is uh, months old. Um, so uh, there is still much to be learned. Uh, the good news, it, it looks like periodic information is exactly the kind of data that, that they would like from the satellite rather than continuous. So the fact that a few frames are captured occasionally um, is actually going to be uh, helpful to them in, in their experimentation. And so we're, we're, this is still an active project, uh, both experimentally from the perspective of the science experiment that's flown in there, but also from a CubeSat experiment, if you will and you know, design and construction and operation. Uh, I, I should also, by the way, give, give credit to Chris um, who asked this question. And Chris is the one who not only wrote Fox to him, but also um, managed to downlink the data from, uh, from Duenglo and the other uh, providers over Satnogs. Uh, I guess some of, the Satnog, some of the other providers managed to uh, get it direct, but uh, Chris downlinked the Duenglo information and managed to um, decode this whole thing and get it up to our um, uh, AMSAT servers. 
Okay, uh, thank you. And uh, Doug, uh, Doug Phelps had also asked the uh, uh, same question, are we able to get telemetry for Vanderbilt? And I think you've uh, answered that uh, well here. Um, another Doug asks, uh, if I capture any data, who do I send it to? Yeah, so if you, if you capture data using Fox Telem and you simply have the checkbox under uh, properties or uh, uh, um, what is it called? Anyway, the, the, uh, the things that you one can see. What was that? Sorry, one of the menus, right? So yeah, yeah, under, under the menus, file, yeah. file and properties, I think it's called. Uh, set the checkbox to say upload to MSAT server or something like that. And it will go to the right place automatically within a few seconds of when you collect that data. So thanks, uh, thanks in advance for giving that a try. If uh, uh, Doug that asked, if you have any questions or you are in the circumstance of having some data, please feel free to contact me directly or Burns directly. We we are excited to get data, so um, don't don't hesitate to reach out if if you have something that you think you'd like to share or. Uh, put into the archive. Okay, uh, I think that uh, that answers the questions that we have uh, so far. Um, so I, uh, um, so one one question that uh, I think uh, would be would be good to um, be good to answer, and I I don't know necessarily Burns. Uh, I believe Burns, you probably should have the answer. So. Uh, knowing that the um, knowing that the power amplifier uh, transistor likely failed due to high SWR, um, are there steps that can be taken for uh, future satellites that use that are going to use a similar uh, transponder board, uh, such as uh, MESAT one, Golf T's linear transponder, et cetera? Are there steps that can be taken to uh, improve the robustness of the power amplifier for those future satellites? Yes, yes, indeed. Uh, in fact. We had uh, on the radios for for one E. We had had kind of seen this behavior be when we were not being careful of the antennas. Um, so we sort of uh, it had been it had been um, uh, made. Um, no, I'm looking I'm looking for a word, but essentially fixed up a little bit uh, for one E to try to make it a little bit more robust. Uh, apparently, not enough. Uh, and of course, we didn't expect the, the poor SWR. But regardless, uh, MESAT and FOXT both have a similar radio, but this radio has been changed considerably. And not only are we doing uh, much more temperature excursion testing, but we are um, beating the heck out of this thing uh, without trying to be too careful to make sure it works. But uh, Dan does believe that um, the, the new one will solve the problem. So yeah, again, this is, you know, we have these failures uh, and just like on, um, on other satellites, you look at the failures, you look at the telemetry, you try to figure out what goes on and occasionally you can remedy it by commanding. And um, sometimes all we can do is say, yes, uh, we understand this problem and we will uh, use this information to go forward. Um, Paul, I want to say one more thing about um, uh, FT4, and that is, and and the way that I had the two screens up, and I, I think um, Mark has done this too, and in fact he gave me a link. But uh, do some searching if you want to try this. Uh, that Ant uh, NU1U has a wonderful video uh, on YouTube to show exactly how to do this and how to get FT4 set up for working with satellites. There, there also is a relevant journal article from a few issues ago um, where um, Ron W5RKN and colleagues, sorry, I can't remember off the top of my head, there were several that, that had gone and, and done this on, I think it was probably RS-44. I don't remember what other satellites, but doing some FT4 over satellite. And so that became a good piece of information as we explored this too. And uh, there's no question that the idea of the FT4 over satellite was inspired by their article. You know, I thought this is a weak signal. It's a linear bird. We, we, we ought to be able to use it for some application since we knew that it was um, uh, transponding. 
So it was a pretty neat application. And, and Burns is right. Ant's uh, video is a very nice how-to to talk you through doing it with, I think, the uh, ICOM 9700, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. But they're, they're all going to be very similar. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, FT4 uh, turned out to be, turned out to work, uh, you know, surprisingly nicely. But if you want to get it set up, uh, what I did was to try it out first on RS44. RS44 is, in fact, a really nice bird and at the low end is where uh, is where the uh, FT4 people tend to hang out of, of its passband. So try that out first and you know make sure everything is working because uh, as we said, 109 is more difficult, more weak signal and so on. So try it on a, on a bird that uh, is a lot easier to work with first. It's a very good point there, uh, Burns. Uh, Mark, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, John Breyer, uh, KG4AKV asks, uh, since there's a pre-planned process to troubleshoot a just launched satellite, can there be a plan uh, on how to inform the amateur radio satellite community on that process and any progress? That sounds like a good idea to me. Um, not my decision to make, but uh, certainly will pass it on. Um, I think I think part of the part of the issue is going to be simply that the satellites, the people that are running these check box, uh, check marks, are are kind of um, aware of how the internals of the satellite work. And you may have uh, have actually seen my paper, which is I don't know five six seven pages long, uh, that explains enough of of how the internals of the satellite work, in order to understand why we were doing what we were doing. So it's kind of difficult just to say, okay, we did this on the checkbox um, without uh, you know, an, an enormous amount of explaining of what that's for. But certainly we should be more quickly saying, I think, uh, at least this is my opinion, again, not my decision to make, uh, that, that uh, you know, what, uh, we've tried this and it hasn't worked, there's a problem or, or whatever. Uh, I'll add a little bit. Uh, John asked a really good question, and it, it represents the, what I see as one of the great ironies of our hobby, right, is for us to be effective communicators about what we're doing regarding our communications hobby is hard. Um, there's a lot of irony in it, and it is something that we can improve on, and, and it's noted, and part of it, I mean, we, we launch a satellite once every couple years or sometimes a couple in a year if we're on a roll like 91 and 92 we're pretty close timing and so honestly we're, we're out of practice but you're right we need to build out a framework of information the other thing is when you're in the midst of of helping um you know try to uh, characterize um commission one of the satellites figure out what's working and what's not too it's usually horrible sleep conditions and sleep deprived. And so we, we should focus on identifying somebody who, whose responsibility that is. So um, good point. Yeah, uh, thanks, uh, thanks Mark and Burns for that. It is, um, it, it does seem that at least the last few launches, the, uh, the initial passes have not been, uh, uh, have not been favorable uh, to, uh, to uh, our uh, operations and engineering team for troubleshooting. Uh, the um, the uh, the uh, the satellites. So uh, yeah, I certainly agree. Uh, I think uh, the optimists. We always have a good plan for uh, for uh, the public presentation of a of a of a initial success in orbit, and uh, the contingency plans are certainly just as important. Um, Mark Johns, uh, K0JM, our ANS senior editor, uh, points out uh, in the Q and A. A uh, very, very good point that uh, any stations that are trying out FT4 on RS44 or, or any other satellite for that matter should not be using anywhere close to 100, uh, 100 watts of power output. Uh, so um, you, you, you might want to use 100 watts uh, to, to try this on AO109, but please do not use uh, anywhere close to that on any other satellite. Uh, Absolutely. During, yeah, yeah, yeah I, I have done that by mistake in both directions, 109 with too low a power and 44 with too high a power. Yeah, yeah, good point, Mark, thanks. Yeah, I, I know, uh, I, I, I mean, FT4 is going to, is uh, essentially a continuous mode while it's transmitting just like CW. And I was on uh, JO97 the other night um, 
and uh, there was some stations uh, on CW that were using a little bit too much power and you could hear it pumping the entire uh, transponder passband uh, because of uh, the, the drawdown of, um, or the AGC circuit and the uh, transponder drawing down everybody's signal. So certainly please, please do not, uh, please do not use 100 watts on any other satellite, but AO 109. I would also like to uh, point out in, in terms of, uh, in terms of these weak signal experiments with uh, AO109, you know, it's possible that uh, that we might get, um, the, you know, we might have an opportunity in the future to get something into a much higher orbit, but we're severely constrained by space and power limitations. Um, you know, it's possible that maybe maybe we get to maybe we get to send something to uh, to a HEO type orbit, but we only are able to put out one or two watts of RF and we might not be able to point it. So we have to use VHF, UHF. Uh, the eight milliwatt signal condition on uh, AO109 is certainly good practice for, uh, for, any, uh, for a satellite that, that might have those, uh, those features. Um, so it's a uh, uh, good practice, good challenge, and uh, certainly, certainly encourage everybody to, uh, to give it a try. All right, uh, I don't see any more questions. Uh, we are uh, a few minutes uh, ahead of schedule right now, but uh, that's, that's okay. Um, so thank you very much, uh, Mark uh, and, uh, and uh, Burns. A wonderful presentation, Burns. Um, uh, so thank you very much for that. And uh, again, thank you on behalf of everyone. Thank you for, uh, thank you and uh, Burns, Mark, Drew, Jerry, and everybody, uh, the entire engineering team who, um, who had lots of traffic back and forth uh, to uh, to try to determine what the causes uh, and um, what the um, what the um, potential solutions and potential uses um, would be of AO one hundred nine once we uh, found out that it was working and um, but with very very low RF power output. So thank you very much. And Mark, there's another question. If you if you have another minute, oh, yes, we do. Yeah. So uh, yes, um, yeah, I, I, I'll ask this. Yeah, so if the power amplifier is blown, why do you need to drive the input with high power? Yeah, so there's there's two two PAs, and I don't think it's a push pull. I don't exactly know how this works. I'm not an RF engineer, <clears throat> um, but there there seems to be two problems with the thing. One is that the output uh, is only eight milliwatts, uh, but the other problem is that we have problems with the input as well, um, which is explaining the commanding issue, uh, why it's so hard to command. So uh, because the, um, you know, a lot of the antenna and uh, the uh, preamp is the same for both commanding and for transponder, somewhere in that uh, receive chain, there's also uh, an issue. And that's why you have to use uh, high power to input as well as getting low power on the output. Yeah, uh, th thanks, Burns. Um, and that question comes from Ed uh, N3DJH. So thanks for that question. Um, all right, I think uh, I think that about wraps it up for that those questions. Um, so again, thank you very much uh, for your wonderful presentation, Burns, and um, for your uh, for your participation in the Q and A, uh, Mark. Um, now, Burns does have a paper in the symposium proceedings. I know that we have not yet uh, published those proceedings. Those will be coming uh, later today. Uh, we'll email all of the participants with a link to download uh, the proceedings uh, and they'll be available for AMSAT members uh, on the uh, AMSAT member portal as well. So again, thank you very much. Um, right now, it is time for our first prize drawing. So I'm gonna hand this over to our Vice President of Development, Frank Karnowskis, N1UW, and he will conduct that uh, first drawing. Okay, Frank. good morning, everybody from uh, Tucson, Arizona. And uh, the, we've got the, uh, the drawing for our first uh, of nine prizes today. And our first prize is a uh, all expense paid trip for three days, uh, for three days and three nights in Yuma, Arizona. Actually, we have a nice prize and it's a printed copy of the uh, Getting Started with, with Satellites book. So I'm going to uh, share my screen here and we will start the, uh, the wheel of prizes. Okay, any mark, get set.
Okay, so our winner is Ed Dunlop, November 3 Delta Juliet Hotel. We'll have our uh, printer send that uh, book off to you uh, uh, first thing on uh, Monday morning. Thank you, Ed, and uh, back to you, Paul. Okay, uh, Frank. Well, thank thank you very much for that. That's um, uh, quite a quite a coincidence there that uh, Ed had just asked a question and uh, then wins uh, wins our first prize. So. I trust everybody, uh, hope, uh, hope everybody trusts us that we are not rigging these prizes. They are randomly drawn, but uh, that, that was quite a good uh, coincidence. And my, my apologies to the kind people of Yuma, Arizona. We're just having fun today. <laughs> Thanks, Frank. Um, okay, uh, well, uh, we are uh, a couple minutes uh, ahead of schedule. So what I think we are going to do is uh, take a very brief uh, five-minute break here. Um, we'll come back at uh, uh, 11.45 or I mean, 10.45 Central uh, and uh, um, uh, 15.45 UTC. And uh, we'll uh, go on to a presentation from the IARU Satellite Advisor, Hans Timmerman, PB2T. So back at uh, 15.45 UTC.
Okay, uh, welcome back, everybody. Um, so uh, next up, we have uh, we have a presentation uh, on the IARU uh, satellite uh, satellite panel, an update from the uh, IARU satellite panel with uh, the I IARU satellite advisor Hans Bondiel Timmerman, uh, Papa Bravo to Tango, and I note in his uh, name that he is also I had forgotten that he is also November Bravo to Tango here in the United States. And uh, since we're in the US now, I see he's changed his uh, Zoom name to uh, reflect his US call sign. Um, so uh, Hans, uh, over to you. Thank you, uh, Paul. And uh, I also had almost forgotten my, uh, my US call sign. I don't use it uh, very often nowadays, but uh, still have it. And I think I will keep it for uh, some more years. So a uh, good morning, good afternoon. I think I need to share my screen here. All right. And I hope that's right uh, now. Uh, so I'm Hans, PB2T, the IRU satellite coordinator. And especially for the US audience, I uh, showed my uh, my US call sign uh, here on the, on the presentation. So thank you, Paul, for inviting me to this uh, space uh, uh, space symposium. And thank you to uh, to the audience for listening to a rather boring presentation, but it won't take long. I'm uh, glad to tell you that uh, I don't do this work alone. There is a wonderful group of people that helps me with the coordination work. And we all look at coordination requests from a different angle. And I think that is a, a good thing, a good approach. Uh, we're always looking to additions, uh, for additions to, uh, to our team. We meet every two or three weeks, and I am told that uh, these meetings are uh, fun. So uh, why uh, why don't you join? This is uh, the guidance given us by the IRU Administrative Council. Hans, Hans. Yes. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry to interrupt, but we're, we're seeing your full desktop. Did you want to? Uh, did you? No, want no, to no. I want to show. I yeah. want to show my uh, my presentation. But I think this is a, uh, a rather. This is uh, a Mac uh, a Mac problem that it doesn't show uh, the uh, the just the presentation. Uh, so I need to. Get rid of this. This is no, still no good. This is the maximum I can get, uh, Paul. Uh, will this do? Yes, that that certainly looks just fine. Thank you. Okay. Um, well, the guidance given us by the uh, administrative council is that uh, Spectrum is a scarce uh, resource, and. Uh, that we uh, and we should manage this spectrum in uh, an efficient way. Uh, we're reminded that amateurs have always maintained an effective tradition of self-regulation. Uh, satellite frequencies in bands allocated to the amateur satellite service are coordinated by uh, the panel, and uh, it is not only the uh, frequency bands uh, allocated to the amateur satellite service. There is also the regional band plans that we have to uh, take into account. Satellites using spectrum uh, allocated uh, to the amateur satellite service operate under amateur licenses and within the definition of the amateur satellite service specified in Article 25 of the radio regulation. IRU believes that the definitions are sufficiently broad to encompass nearly all 
educational satellite projects and educational and university projects will only be coordinated when there is an identified amateur component and the mission is to teach and train students in satellite communication and building and launching, launching satellites. The responsible person for these satellite communications must be a licensed radio amateur. And IRU will only coordinate a non-amateur satellite if an administration directs in writing that it be operated in an amateur satellite band under an experimental or non-amateur license. Uh, in 2014, we saw a, uh, an ITU report, uh, and the name of the uh, report is SA 2312-0, Characteristics, Definitions and Spectrum Requirements of Nano Satellites and Pico Satellites, as well as systems composed of such satellites. Now, the ITU no longer uses uh, the, uh, the term nanosatellites and picosatellites. Uh, the current term is uh, short duration missions. Uh, but uh, still, uh, the content of, of the report is uh, valid. And uh, I want to highlight especially one uh, paragraph of, uh, of the report, which is uh, paragraph 5.1. Uh, that describes three different categories. And these three different categories, I will, uh, I will talk about a, a bit. The first one is educational and amateur radio missions. And uh, the text, well, you can uh, read, but here, I want to uh, to zoom in on uh, on the two bits in uh, in red. The satellites are missions with the sole aim of educating people about space electronics and all aspects of physics involved in space. And it's not just the aim, but it is the sole aim. And uh, I will come back to that uh, a bit later. And the second thing is that. Uh, there is no pecuniary interest as defined in Article 1 of the radio regulations, or actually at 156 of, uh, of the ITU radio regulations. The second uh, group is experimental and research missions. And uh, it, it tells us that uh, the purpose of experimental and research missions are is to demonstrate a novel space technology uh, or to perform a proof of concept or to perform space research. And in general, these missions will use frequency bands that are allocated to the respective services. And these uh, uh, missions will not find a place in amateur spectrum or in uh, spectrum allocated to the amateur satellite service. And the third category is commercial missions. Uh, well, in short, trying to make money. And it's also not a mission that we will uh, accommodate in spectrum allocated to the amateur satellite service. Uh, with the outcome of WRC 19 in mind, and uh, I refer to uh, the identification of spectrum for short duration missions, uh, IRU is much more strict, where in the past the panel would coordinate commercial uh, missions because there was no other spectrum available, and we wanted to uh, avoid chaos in our bands. We did coordinate, but now that other bands are available uh, in VHF and in UHF, we are uh, very strict 
and we no longer coordinate commercial missions. And uh, I expect uh, some feedback from you uh, during uh, our Q&A session. So in short, what we do coordinate is educational and radio and amateur radio missions. And we don't coordinate experimental and research missions. And we don't coordinate commercial missions. Now, the difficult bit uh, comes uh, when, it, uh, when, we when we are talking about educational missions. Um, the boundaries are not always very strict. And we have to understand that uh, universities, students want to transmit something. And they are also eager to do science. While we don't coordinate science projects. Uh, but here, uh, I think the thing is, students don't do science. They are trying, trained to become scientists. And if that is the case, we are, uh, we are quite happy to, uh, to accommodate them, provided that they don't encode their transmissions. If uh, a university tries to tell us, yes, <clears throat> but we, uh, we want to keep the, uh, the data for ourselves, and we say, well, then you need to go somewhere else to another band. Uh, if uh, they say, well, our, uh, our uh, formats, our telemetry formats are, uh, are open, and we publish that on, uh, on our website, uh, then uh, this is uh, good enough as an assurance that uh, they don't want uh, to do anything uh, secret. So what are uh, the boundaries for an amateur mission. First of all, there is Article 156 from, uh, as shown in the ITU radio regulations, that gives a definition for uh, the amateur service. It's a radio communication service for the purpose of self-training into communication and technical investigations carried out by amateurs. And that is by duly authorized persons interested in radio techniques solely with a personal aim and without financial interest. 156 is the same story, but then for satellites. And we have some more details in article 25. And I, uh, I uh, copied here uh, part of uh, 25-2A. Uh, transmissions shall not be encoded for the purpose of obscuring their meaning, except for control signals. And the, the penalties uh, that there are two key points, uh, and that is that the mission must be related to radio technique and offer no financial interest. We uh, made a list of uh, what we think are typical amateur applications. And uh, I think it is, uh, it is obvious what, uh, well, the, the things that, uh, that are listed here are obvious. And maybe I'll, uh, I'll get some more ideas uh, during uh, the rest of the day while, uh, while you're doing your, uh, your presentations. Uh, but uh, we came up with uh, linear transporters, uh, repeaters, either for voice or for data communications, digital voice repeaters, transmitting Im images, APRS transmissions, microwave beacons, and storing forward systems. What we also did is uh, to work on a uh, list of applications that are related to radio technique. And this uh, may be a bit dangerous. Uh, I won't read uh, that. I won't, no, I'm not gonna read them out uh, all, uh, but uh, you can imagine if, uh, 
well, let, let's take software defined the radio as an example. Uh, there is, it's not only amateurs who do software defined radio. And there are also commercial companies who do software defined radios. And uh, if uh, that is the case, I think we need to, uh, to look at uh, the rest of the functionality of, uh, of the uh, satellite to determine whether this is good enough for amateur spectrum, yes or no. Um, and this brings me back to, uh, to uh, the problems uh, we had recently with the uh, with, uh, university uh, projects, uh, it, where we have a combination, uh, not only of uh, technical experiments, uh, teaching students about uh, all aspects of radio communication, that's fine. But it is the, uh, the additional, if a university tells us our, our uh, primary mission is to do science, then uh, we need to, uh, to take a good look of what they are doing. And if this science bit is not related to radio technique, we may say, sorry guys, uh, you have to make up your mind. And either you will do radio technique or you will go to, uh, to another band. And uh, the discussions uh, we, uh, we had recently are taking a lot of our, uh, uh, consuming a lot of our time. And uh, I think it is, uh, it is good if you know about uh, our policy, because it, uh, it often happens that uh, radio amateurs, and especially radio amateurs interested in satellite, in satellite, are asked for advice, and uh, it's it's fine to help a uh, a university, but uh, we want something uh, in exchange, and uh, that is people who are interested in radio or in amateur radio. So that was uh, a uh, short presentation, half of the time for me. And I think half of the time for uh, for Q and A. Um, especially, uh, I would like uh, some uh, some input to, to uh, the list that is uh, presented on uh, on this slide. It is still under debate uh, in uh, inside the panel, and your input would be uh, would be uh, much uh, much welcome. So with that. Uh, I uh, I will conclude uh, my uh, my briefing, uh, Paul, and uh, back to you for uh, questions and for hints uh, to uh, to complete this list. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Hans, um, for that update on uh, IARU satellite coordination. Uh, are there any questions at this time? Uh, please uh, place any questions you might have in the uh, Q&A um, box. Uh, Clint, K6LCS asks, uh, what type of support can individuals offer you? Um, I, I still need panel members. Uh, so if you uh, you feel fit uh, to to uh, to be a panel member, let uh, me know. But uh, a more uh, obvious, uh, or maybe not so obvious, uh, way to uh, to support our work is to help universities. Uh, some of them have. Mm, no clue, or maybe a bit too strong, but uh, can uh, need some help. Uh, we have, uh, well, one of our requirements is that uh, the uh, lead has a, an amateur radio license. But what we see is that uh, this often is a technician class uh, amateur and a bit more experience uh, is, is helpful. 
Well, if we could uh, find a uh, a way to uh, to get a pool of people who are interested to uh, to help uh, universities, I think that would be helpful. And uh, I have not discussed this with uh, with Drew, who is on uh, on the panel, but uh, maybe we can uh, we can set up uh, a a list of uh, of assistance. Okay, yeah, uh, thank you very much, Hans. Uh, we had a question from uh, AMSAT's founding president, Perry Klein, uh, W3PK. He asks, uh, how many satellites have been coordinated over the past several years and how quickly are requests acted upon? Um, I don't know the, uh, the exact number. I need to go through my, uh, my files. Uh, it's a, a couple of hundred. But I don't know the exact. If it, well, I, I think three hundred would be uh, would be a good guess. Um, uh, the uh, coordination, uh, if the coordination request is complete, and if the uh, mission meets the requirements for an amateur mission. Uh, the turnaround time is three weeks. Um, but it's most most of the time the coordination requests are not perfect, and we need uh, some time to uh, for negotiation. If it if it's real amateur, it, it's easy. <laughs> but, okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, yeah. Th th thanks. Uh, thanks, Hans. Uh, we have a couple of questions here from James White. One of them might be better suited for Drew, who I've added here as a, a panelist, if he wants to weigh in. But the first one is, a, is actually a good question, uh, because I do know that there have been some um, some issues with uh, the allocated frequencies and conflicts and stuff. So is there a database of frequencies that are already allocated that we can use to suggest frequencies to universities? and others? Um, I think the best um, source of information would be uh, the SAPNOX uh, database. Yeah, that, that's a good suggestion. Um, yeah, I don't know if there's a, a good, uh, I, I suppose that uh, JE9PEL has an excellent uh, uh, all satellites database as well that you could uh, sort by frequency and, and sort by active satellites. Um, so that's that's certainly uh, another another resource that would be helpful to um, to uh, uh, navigate what satellite what frequencies are currently in use and what might be best to uh, to use. Um, yeah, I, I see the question about FCC licensing. I don't know yeah. too much about the FCC. What I, what I do know and, and appreciate is that uh, they only issue a license uh, if there is a an IARU coordination letter, and I hope uh, it stays like that. Uh, but I, uh, I I I'm I'm not an expert on uh, on the US uh, specific uh, licensing. Uh, Stuff, and I think uh, Drew would be a, a better person to answer that question. Yeah, Drew, uh, did you, uh, the question from, uh, from uh, James White is, uh, what is the current state of US FCC licensing? And if IAR coordination is granted for amateur frequencies, will the FCC accept it for amateur licensing? Uh, Drew, do you have any input on that? Um, <clears throat> let me read the question here again. Um, Yes, uh, the FCC is requiring, uh, there's, there's two routes, but the most common one is that uh, the FCC requires IARU coordination uh, for licensing uh, for both uh, Part 97 amateur projects and for Part 5 educational experimental license projects, uh, IARU coordination is, is the route. Uh, so that's that's you need to have that in hand before you go to the FCC. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Drew. Um, 
Jan, uh, PE0SAT uh, notes, uh, how to handle satellites that are on board of a commercial payload or combining commercial and educational? Yeah, well, thanks. Uh, that's, uh, that's an interesting question. If uh, they are completely separated, uh, we have no problem with the uh, commercial project and the uh, amateur satellite uh, uh, are, are, are separated. That's, that's okay. But uh, if uh, the uh, amateur bands will be used for CTMC, for instance, and we uh, we may have a problem. And, uh, well, uh, another problem occurs when uh, the uh, when uh, time sharing is proposed for uh, the commercial application uh, operating in amateur spectrum uh, plus the uh, the amateur application itself. Uh, currently, the policy is that uh, we don't uh, do coordination for commercial projects operating in amateur bands. Not sure, Jan, if that, uh, that answers the question. Uh... Okay, uh, thank you. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you for that, Hans. Um, so uh, here's a question that we have uh, dealt with. Uh, if the FCC requires IARU approval for an experimental license, and the IARU is no longer doing experimental, what gives? Oh, we do amateur. That's, that's our mission. No, no, turn the mic to, uh, to Drew uh, for this, uh, please. Uh, Drew, go ahead. <clears throat> well, uh, the IARU is still coordinating educational missions with experimental licenses with some restrictions. Uh, the major restriction being that uh, you cannot use the two meter band. Uh, we've only got 200 kilohertz of bandwidth on two meters uh, and it's already very crowded. Uh, so if you have an educational uh, mission that is licensed under part five, uh, you still will have to go through IARU coordination. And if it's a, an educational mission and doesn't have any of the uh, thumbs down missions included with it, uh, it, it'll get coordinated and then the FCC will license, uh, give you the part five license. And that means that uh, commercial experimental missions will not be coordinated by IRU. Okay, uh, thank you, Drew, and thank you, Hans. Um, Graham Sherville notes that more than 800 requests have been dealt with, uh, <clears throat> according to the uh, the list on the uh, IARU coordination page, and that uh, the first one listed here is AO51, so that dates back to uh, 2004. Well, thanks, Graham. Uh, your list is better than mine. I I should I should have known you were here on the on the call, and I should have asked a question uh, directly to you. All right, uh, well, I don't see any more questions. Uh, James White mentions, uh, thank you to the advisory group for the work you do and the tough issues that you deal with. And I, uh, I second that. It is certainly um, a, a very important thing. We do have one last question here. Uh, Jan asks, uh, how to handle misuse? Uh, what we uh, currently do is we, uh, we uh, list uh, on the IARU website, uh, we uh, we list uh, those uh, who uh, who misuse use amateur spectrum, and we also uh, list satellites that have not been coordinated by uh, by IARU. Uh, my uh, my plan is once uh, in person meetings in ITU uh, are uh, scheduled again. I expect that to happen uh, beginning of next year is to uh, to talk uh, to the head of the uh, satellite department and to uh, to talk to uh, the administrations uh, who have a lot or more than just occasional uh, improper use of amateur bands and uh, see if uh, we can uh, and work on this uh, from that side. 
Okay, uh, thank you, Hans. Um, I think that will that gets us through our um, our allotted time for this. Um, you have one more. Um, we'll just answer this one real qu this one question quickly. Um, can an educational CubeSat have a scientific primary payload and a radio amateur secondary payload in the same time? Um, it, it depends on uh, on the uh, scientific scientific payload. Uh, if it is a biology mission, then uh, we say no. Uh, if it uh, deals with uh, radio communications or uh, technical stuff as listed uh, in uh, in my la last slide, we may coordinate, but it, it depends. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And again, thank you uh, for uh, joining us today, Hans, for that uh, discussion. And uh, thank you to Drew as well for uh, joining for uh, some of the uh, questions there. Um, so uh, with that, uh, I think uh, we are uh, ready for our uh, second prize drawing. Um, again, thank you again to Hans for his presentation, and um, uh, have a good uh, have a good rest of your day there. Um, so uh, on to uh, over to Frank N one UW for our uh, second prize drawing. Okay, thank you, Paul. And our second prize this morning is the choice of a 2022 Tesla Model 3 finished in AMSED red pearl coat or an Alaskan aero antenna with duplexer. So let's uh, go back to the, uh, the wheel here. And as I understand it, there's another button I need to uh, press to share audio. And where is that button? Not, not important, we'll spin the wheel here. Bum, bum. Okay, and the winner is uh, Ralph Qualich, Kilo Fox 4 Hotel Romeo. The hitch, Ralph, is uh, we get to make the choice of which prize we're going to give. And I just got a text from our president, Robert Bankston. And he says, we're, we choose the Alaskan arrow with the duplexer. So congratulations, Ralph. We'll have that antenna off to you straight away. Back to you, Paul. OK, uh, thank you very much, Frank. Um, our next presentation today is going to be an update on CATSAT, uh, a University of Arizona CubeSat project. Uh, joining us is Mike Parker, KT7D, and uh, Dathan Golish. So let me go ahead and get that video uh, started. Hi everyone, um, my name is Dathan. Uh, as Dante said, I was on a fire and now I've been helping out with CATSAT. Uh, but as you all know, CATSAT is very much a student project. I, I don't do any work, I mostly talk. Um, so I wanna give a, a, a bit of a summary so that we're all on the same page in terms of what CATSAT's about, but all the work is, is being done by the students. The, the design, the, the mechanical, electrical, and software design, the, the assembly, which is happening now, the, the testing that will start soon, and all of this is done by students. So, so every slide that I have here, uh, there, there is someone either in the room or on the phone who's an expert on it who, who will talk more about that particular topic or, or certainly can talk more if folks have questions. Um, but just to, just to give some context, um, CATPAT's a, a partnership between the U of A, uh, Rincon Research Corporation, and Freefall Aerospace uh, uh, in collaboration with Firefly Aerospace, who is providing our launch, and, and as Namira said, NASA CSLI, who, who's providing that launch. Uh, so CATSAT really has a couple of purposes, um, a, a couple of main goals. 
Uh, the first is a technological demonstration of, a, of an, a novel inflatable antenna. So as, as you all know, um, communication of data and of command and control to these space instruments is important. And doing that on such small form factor things like CubeSat is challenging just because you can't fit that big an antenna, so you can't send that much data. Um, so the, the notion uh, pioneered by uh, the PI of the mission, Chris Walker, and this uh, company in Tucson, Freefall Aerospace, um, there are these inflatable antennas. So uh, a very lightweight, low volume when it's undeployed uh, device that when you get to orbit or wherever you're going, you can deploy and, and you can have a, a much larger communication surface. So in this case, that's uh, using a 0.5 meter, a half a meter inflatable antenna that's metalized on one side, um, which should give us high bandwidth communication down to the ground um, from low Earth orbit. Uh, this is been demonstrated in, in uh, on balloon-borne missions, but not in space before. So CATSAT is, is really about demonstrating this technology in, in space flight um, and hopefully uh, blazing a bit of a trail for future opportunities for, for this technology to really enable uh, small, small form factor space exploration. The second main mission uh, of CATSAT is uh, uh, High frequency radio experiment. As we all have heard, uh, CATSAT includes a, a WIP or a whisper antenna, um, sort of on the opposite face of the spacecraft as the inflatable antenna, um, which will allow us to do lots of cool science. Um, this this uh, probing of the ionosphere, there's diurnal variations, um, using uh, the worldwide network of ham radio operators. Uh, this the whisper antenna on CATSAT is 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 receive only. So, so we, we require collaboration with other folks from across the world for that, for that experiment to be useful. Um, so using this network of, of radio stations that, that exists all over the world, run largely by amateurs, um, it will really enable this, this cool science. So the, 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 the mission has a sort of hybrid purpose of a, a very technological demonstration that hopefully enables future science, but also a very active scientific investigation. That science is very much enabled by a software-defined radio called uh, the Astro SDR, which is produced by Rincon Research Corporation. Um, this, is, this is really the heart in, in a, uh, a technical sense of the, the WISPR experiment and of our uh, high, high bandwidth downlink capability. Um, the software defined radio uh, is, is a very cool piece of technology that, that will allow us to, to downlink at 10 gigahertz but also receive whisper uh, data to the antenna at, at yeah, HF frequencies. Um, it it, it kind of really sits in the middle of a lot of our, our activities. But then, of course, it is a student mission. and, and it, nothing it really matters if we're not getting student engagement, student education, student involvement um, to, to train up the next generation of, of space explorers. Um, this, as I mentioned before, uh, everything important on this mission is, is being done by students from uh, departments across the university um, with a little bit of support from folks in, in those departments as well as LPL, uh, the Arizona Space Institute. Um, but it, it really is uh, about training up this new generation. Um, and then, because both the Whisper antenna requires community engagement, but also because this is a, a very publicly uh, facing mission, we want to share all that data uh, to the largest extent possible with the broader community. The, there is a camera on board the CATSAT. The, the purpose of that camera is, is honestly mostly to uh, give the inflatable antenna something to, to downlink at the video frame rate camera. So we want to be able to demonstrate that we can downlink at sort of video speeds. Um, but all those Earth images will be available publicly. And, and more importantly, all that whisper data, all that HF frequency data um, will be available publicly for, again, uh, really engaging that, that ham radio community across the world. Uh, really briefly, uh, CATSAT's flight is provided by Firefly, Air, Firefly Aerospace through NASA's CubeSat launch initiative. Um, their, their first launch, Firefly's first launch, was just in September. They are a brand new uh, organization. Uh, that first launch was a failure, uh, but that is not uncommon. Yeah, I don't think anyone succeeds in their first launch. Um, but they've got a very exciting uh, sort of 
plan, uh, not not just for themselves, but but to provide technology um, to to other organizations and to really enable small sat, cube sat, small payload uh, opportunities into space. Um, it, it, they're really, you know, they're they're not the the SpaceX's of the world. They're they're really trying to get um, uh, a, little, a little bit more accessible for for um, folks. Uh, the mission that we're part of, the VCLS-2 mission, involves eight different CubeSats that, that will all be going up together from uh, institutions uh, across uh, the country. So orbital parameters, we're going to we'll be in a, a low Earth orbit and are nearly sun synchronous, so, so we're sort of tracking the same time of day. Um, that time of day will precess uh, as we go through the mission, but we'll start at about uh, dusk-dawn orbit, sort of 6 a.m. 6 p.m. orbit, um, that with an altitude about 565 kilometers. Of course, ground station is an important part of this process, both in terms of just operating CATSAT, in terms of demonstrating this downlink capability that we want to, to, to pioneer, and also, uh, as, as we've already talked about, um, in, in terms of interacting with, with other folks. Um, that, that we can make these ground stations um, not, just, not just for CATSAT, but for, for other missions. Um, so we have a command and control a UHF ground station located in Tucson uh, off campus. Um, we will have a backup that's basically identical to that ground station um, in Stewart Observatory here on campus. So, so we want to have two locations in Tucson that are capable of uh, command and control for the spacecraft, just you know, in case anything happens to one or the other. Um, but this this 10 gigahertz downlink through the inflatable antenna uh, can't go to those stations. It has to go to something a little bit beefier. So the, the U of A has uh, acquired a few of these 6.1 meter dishes repurposed from the Karma array that was decommissioned, uh, the radio uh, dish array. Um, we have a couple of those. So we have uh, one uh, at the Biosphere 2, which is, uh, uh, I think, a facility a lot of people have heard of just north of Tucson. Um, another one in the UA Tech Park, which is sort of uh, east Tucson. Um, and then a third one, in fact, that Rincon Research controls uh, at their facility in Centennial, Colorado. So again, the idea is that we, we have a little bit of backup capability, but also um, sort of an excuse to build up this array of 6.1 meter dishes that um, might enable some future science uh, on their own. Uh, operations, very briefly, uh, I sort of mentioned where we've got a camera for HD imaging, which gives the, the downlink something to do. Um, so a lot of data to, to demonstrate what we think will be uh, 50 megabit per second, as high as 50 megabit per second downlink from low Earth orbit. Um, and then we've got the Whisper antenna, the Whisper experiment, the HF experiment, that um, also will be generating a lot of data that can be downlinked via that antenna. And I think will be a, a particularly interesting thing to talk about today. The spacecraft uh, with the 6U chassis provided by GUM, GUM Space uh, with sort of the typical uh, facilities that you would expect, an onboard computer, three-axis reaction wheels, uh, ADCS system, it's got a drive code, accelerometer, GPS sun sensors, all that typical sort of stuff, batteries and, and, and solar panel, all summing up to just about eight kilograms. Um, so uh, 6U, you know, not very big and, and not very heavy. and it, it's, we can do a, a remarkable amount of science, we think, with this little small package. There's a couple other uh, payloads on the on the on CatSat that will give us a couple other uh, capabilities. Um, first, we have a, a 10 gigahertz patch antenna. So the inflatable antenna is is at 10 gigahertz. The idea is that we can do high bandwidth downlink with that antenna. Should that uh, antenna fail eventually, should it um, not deploy at all, we do have a backup, so a 10 gigahertz patch antenna. So this will not be uh, nearly as high bandwidth, but it will still enable us to demonstrate that downlink and get down some of that camera and that HF experiment data. We're also pairing that with a 5 gigahertz patch antenna. And, and the idea here is that those two together can act as a linear transponder for ground scientists so that someone can transmit up a 5 gigahertz signal that CATSAT will receive. The software-defined radio that I described at the center of all of this um, will retransmit that through the inflatable, or sorry, through the patch antenna at 10 gigahertz, the other patch antenna, the smaller one. Um, and, and this sort of acts as a, as a little bit of a transponder for, again, that, that broader community. 
And then lastly, we have some metrology cameras. These are really very engineering focused. Um, one, just to take a picture when we're in orbit and say, hey, we're in orbit, cool, we did it. Um, but also the, a second one to monitor the status of the balloon. Uh, you know, we, we'll, the, the balloon, as you'll hear about more, has a, a feedback loop to keep it pressurized, but um, a little bit of visual verification of that process is always nice. One other thing I did want to mention, um, especially as we look forward to the sorts of things that we can collaborate on uh, here at the U of A, um, is what some of our testing capabilities look like. And we're, a lot of this, well, basically all of this was uh, either developed or, or revived for the OCAM system on OSIRIS-REx, which is the, the three scientific cameras on, on OSIRIS-REx. Um, so a lot of this was built up for those, but they still exist here in the clean room in, in the Drake building, the building we're in now at, at the U of A. Um, and, and we're re-reviving some of this stuff for CATSAT. So uh, some of the testing equipment, especially the environmental, the TVAC testing equipment, um, we're, we're sort of pulling back together and, and retrofitting a little bit so that we can do CATSAT testing here locally rather than having to send out to some other facility. Um, here on the left, you see a, a, a pretty large TVAC chamber, so it's, it's just, just barely the right size for, um, for CATSAT, which is about a meter and a half left to right long. Um, and uh, that, that open space in the middle is something like a half a meter uh, tall, so which is basically the exact size of cat that, um, which gives us a lot of uh, flexibility to test a, a number of systems in here. There's also a, an aperture out the right side, so you, there's a window that you can look through, so if you need to test imaging cameras. Um, this is a, a pretty beefy, pretty powerful uh, TVAC system um, that, that is is currently going unused, and we're hoping to, to revive and make useful not only for CATSAT, but for other systems, for testing other systems. We also have a smaller chamber, the one you see on the right, that's the, the, the clear area of that chamber on the right is uh, something like 18 inches across. Um, but for testing individual components, for testing smaller systems, uh, it's, it's extremely capable, and it's used in use right now for some OSIRIS-REx activities. Um, but it's, again, something that could be sort of um, constantly available for, for future testing. The clean room here also has lots of other uh, equipment that was built up for the OSIRIS-REx program, um, floor benches for assembly, uh, optical testing equipment. Uh, you can see in the top right and the left um, systems that were designed to test uh, the focus of cameras, to, to uh, test the sensitivity of cameras. Uh, there's an integrating sphere there in the middle that, that gives a nice uniform um, scene for a camera to, to visualize. Um, lots of stuff that, that tested some extremely high quality cameras that, that is uh, still very capable and, and with a little bit of uh, work and, and guidance based on what they would need to do could absolutely be used for, for a lot of other purposes. Okay, so I think I've done plenty of talking. Um, we do have a website up that uh, at the moment is, is a bit sparse, but as we get into testing is going to start filling out pretty rapidly um, as we have more to say. Um, And that was the end of that. Uh, I think it, that was a recorded uh, last week at a Space Hello, Trust Symposium. I'm Nick. Well, I'm so, sorry and about that. I am a Cajun. I'm a tinkerer. I'm an engineer. All right. Sorry about that. Went in, it went into, uh, went into the next video. Um, so everybody got a quick sneak preview of the next uh, of the next video. So thank you very much to uh, Dathan and Mike uh, for their presentation. And uh, sorry to interrupt, Mike, but uh, uh, we'll open it for uh, for any questions. Go ahead, Mike. I was saying that this was recorded, uh, Dathan uh, presentation last week at a Zoom meeting. Uh, this uh, that's involved the. Nairobi uh, University that we were talking about things we might do together. So he extracted that out of that very quickly uh, to, to fill in a spot that became available to talk. So I'll stop it and, and entertain any questions. Okay. Uh, thanks again, Mike. Um, so the first question we have uh, from H. Paul uh, Shuk is uh, sorry for a trivial question, but what does the acronym WSPR, WSPR stand for? A weak signal propagation 
reporter, maybe somebody, somebody could help me on that. It's, it's a signals that are very, very common and very popular in the HF band um, that uh, Joe Taylor uh, was, was the, uh, uh, one of the prime uh, originators of. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Um, next question that we have is from uh, Jonathan uh, Brandenburg, uh, KF5IDY. Admittedly technical details, but I'm particularly interested in the flight software. What is the hardware platform for the IHU? Uh, is it running an operating system such as VxWorks or free RTOS? Uh, or is the flight software based on a flight software framework? Okay, well, the, uh, the flight software was provided by GOM Space. It's, it's, we, we actually purchased the, the uh, spacecraft bus from GOM Space with the you know, flight computer, and they also gave us the flight software, so that's what we're using. And I, Paul, unless you have something to add, I, I don't know anything about the software. I'm sorry, not Paul, uh, Dathan. No, not much. Uh, just that it's a, there's it's a, there's also a little bit of a hybrid, as as you know, Mike. Since there's also the uh, Astro SDR from Rincon Research, um, that's as an FPGA at the, at its core. Um, all the all the command and control goes kind of through both, depending on what subsystem we're talking about. And there is a real time operating system sitting at the at the heart of that. So so to add to that, on the Rincon Research Board. There's two arms. One of them is running a, 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 Linux, a version of Linux, so that so it it uses Linux and the uh, uh, totally for command and control of the of the SDR board. Okay, uh, thank you, Mike. Uh, a second question from Jonathan is um, he's interested in the ADCS. Is is that a purchase device or was some or all of it developed by students? Uh, the ADCS. Uh, are, are, are we talking about the software radio? Uh, no, the attitude uh, determination oh, control. Uh, again, again, that was part of the GOM space purchase. Okay. Uh, uh, the st students will be doing the the commanding and the you know the all the flight software uh, scripting, but the the underlying framework is from GOM space. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very and much. It, and, and it is to, to be uh, in case you didn't hear it was it's three axes controllable. Uh, it, it has a GPS on board and the combination and a variety of uh, typical sensors to uh, so as a sort of a black box. It provides the, the uh, location very, very precisely time very, very precisely, which is important for some of the things we would we might want to do with uh, similar to what uh, you heard uh, this morning that Bob McGuire was talking about Tom Clark and uh, doing very long baseline interferometry. We have the idea that we might be able to do very long baseline interferometry with this satellite in between the satellite and the ground stations of the long baseline, long wavelength array that sits out in New Mexico. Okay, uh, thanks, Mike. Um, Doug, N6UA asks, uh, what, what HF frequencies and time slots are being used for the WISPR experiments, or will that be coming later? That'll be coming later. As far as the WISPR experiments, we'll use the, we are, have, the, have the capabilities to simultaneously tune uh, four different frequencies at the same time across the HF band. So one might expect, for example, to, to have uh, maybe four, uh, 20 meters, 15 meters, 10 meters, and maybe a couple of another frequency tossed in uh, all at the same time. But all of that will be determined basically, hopefully from input, but from the hams that, that, that we would like to see using it. Okay, thank you. Um, this question comes from Burns Fisher, WB1FJ. Uh, is the balloon spherical as opposed to parabolic? And if so, what does the pattern look like? Well, it, it is spherical. It, the feed has a, is re realizing that uh, it, 
it's sort of like Arecibo used to be, that it, it has phase corrections to take, take the spherical reflector and generate a, a pencil beam. And it'll be somewhere in the 20 to 25 dB gain, I'm told. So, so that'll give us uh, the ability to uh, get a pretty, even though we only have a one watt transmitter, uh, it'll, we should have a, at any one spot on the earth at a time on the down lane, we should be able to get a pretty good uh, signal to noise ratio. Okay, uh, thanks for that answer. Um, Jan, uh, PE0SAT uh, noted, uh, if you're using GOM space components, um, you might want to contact the Bobcat One team at Ohio University. Uh, they did have um, they did have some issues with their with their satellite. And that was the Bobcat One at Ohio. Yes. Yeah, thank you very much. Okay. Um, so we don't have any open questions at this time. Um, anybody else have any questions? Oh, I don't see any coming in right now. I might wrap, wrap up then with one, one moment. Yep. Uh, that, that is the, the downlink modulation is going to be DVBS2, which I, as, you, as you know, a lot of the hams are looking at in the future for uh, for some of the satellite communications in the, the, that you're going to be doing, and so uh, we did, we chose that one because it's a matches pretty well. But also, we were, we're hoping to that there will be a few amateurs that are that are have enough capability to to re to receive the DVBS two, and and use use it as a as a test source. We'll also be able to transmit just a uh, at, at ten gigahertz uh, beacon. And so everybody's trying to test out their receive capability at 10 gigahertz to a LEO satellite, if they have, that'll, that'll be possible. And um, finally, uh, we're, we, we are hoping that we're gonna have this transponder, linear transponder between uh, five and, and 10 gig, gigahertz uh, that it, it's, it's getting, it got put on at the last moment. And so we're still trying to figure out what, how to use it. And anybody interested in, in that uh, should contact us. Okay, uh, yeah, thanks for that, Mike. I imagine the, uh, the tracking requirements um, for, uh, for five, five and 10 gigahertz to LEO are, are um, gonna require a pretty high precision, uh, pretty high precision uh, rotor to, uh, to keep, uh, keep track of the, uh, the satellite. That, that, that's, that's correct. Okay, um, well, uh, again, we don't seem to have any other questions. So um, I think, uh, and we're nearing the end of uh, this time slot. So thank you very much, uh, Mike. And thank you, Dathan, for that uh, interesting update about uh, CATSAT. Um, and I may have missed it um, in the presentation, uh, but is there an, uh, 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 a scheduled launch date or a planned launch date yet? Yeah, the schedule launch date is June of next year. Okay. So we're so we're in a very rushed mode in this at this point in time. Uh, however, uh, we we have uh, re been working with AMSAT. Uh, uh, just started. Uh, we have a little problem where we had to. Uh, we're, we're, we were looking at the AMSAT uh, uh, board that uh, converts from. 2.4 to, to 10 gigahertz is a possible backup to to what we're doing uh, if if we win the launch roulette uh, and, and get a delay in the schedule. Okay. All right. Uh, and Lou McFadden uh, points out that uh, the upcoming ham TV uh, is planning to eventually use DVBS2 as well. Uh, so that would be another DV, DVBS2 uh, from from Leo uh, that uh, CATSAT could provide uh, as um, potential training and uh, practice for that as well. All right, uh, I think that uh, about wraps it up. So again, uh, for probably about the third time now, thank you, uh, Mike, and thank you, Dathan, uh, for your presentation and answer to all of your questions. Uh, 
seven three and uh, enjoy the rest of the symposium. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, so uh, our next presentation, which everybody already saw a bit of a sneak preview of, is uh, from the U University of Louis Louisiana satellite team, uh, and uh, Nick Pug K five QXJ will be joining us for that. So I will begin that video in just a second. Hello, Ramsatters. I'm Nick, and I am a Cajun. I'm a tinkerer, I'm an engineer, I'm an educator, and I'm a huge fan of Bob Twiggs. So I come from the Acadiana section of Louisiana. We call ourselves Cajuns. So you know you're a Cajun if you call the Four Seasons onions, <clears throat> celery, bell peppers, and garlic. You might be a Cajun if you let your black coffee sit and find a gel. You might be a Cajun if your favorite story starts with, first you make a roux. If you taste the five alarm chili and say, pass the Tabasco, you might be a Cajun. If you refer to cool snap as gumbo weather, you might be a Cajun. And if you visit a zoo, you look for the recipe cards on how to cook it. But for you guys in here, most of you, I think, are tinkerers. So how do you know you're a tinker? Well, if you plug yourself in the wall before you learn to walk, you're a tinkerer. If your ability to take things apart exceeded your ability to reassemble them, then you're a tinker. If you figured out what a flyback transformer was the hard way, and you silverhead guys in here probably done that, you're, you're a tinkerer. If you built a crystal set, you're a tinkerer. If you built something that exploded and you innovated it, the process to make it bigger, you might be a tinkerer. If you got an FCC license, you're a ham and a tinkerer. So now what I'd like to do is I'd like to take uh, the rest of this talk, tell you about what we're up to at the University of Louisiana. Let's talk about the mission. The mission is to give students the opportunity to design, build, launch, and operate satellites. To uh, Part of our mission is to light the spark that excited the likes of Tom Clark, Jan King, Bob Twiggs, and other AMSAT elders, and for the students to greatly enhance their ability to get scholarships and good jobs. So a brief history of what we've been doing at UL. Well, first of all, we got our first satellite launched in 07. The odd thing is, it's still up there. It's a little brain dead, though. In uh, 13, we launched our second satellite, and it stayed up for about 11 months and uh, came burn up. Uh, in uh, January of this year, we uh, got our third satellite on orbit, and it's still talking to us. Not too healthy, but we're working on it. And uh, we propose to launch Cape 4 as soon as we can get it manifested for a, a launch. So what are we going to put up this time? Well, here on the left is a prototype of what we want to do. It's a 3U. And uh, what's sort of unique about this 3U is that we also are going to try to launch six small satellites uh, built by the uh, middle and high schools in our area. And there's a picture of it on the right. So the uh, the mothership, the Cape, 3, uh, the Cape 4 mothership, as we call it, of course, is a 3U. Its payload will include six small satellites. Uh, we're going to put a deep space radio in there. Our team wants to uh, start to build satellites below LEO, above LEO, so we're going to need a, a more enhanced radio. And so we got a, we call it our deep space radio. We're also going to put a, a rescue radio in there. We found that uh, about half of all the Alana launches 
fail to communicate when they get on orbit. We're going to put in the radio that if everything on that satellite fails, this radio ought to come through and give us a back door. My physics department wants to run a magnetic experiment, a neutron experiment. We're going <clears> to <throat> experiment with radiation shielding. This is in prep for our next uh, Beyond LEO mission. And what's, uh, a, what's as exciting is our physics guy thinks they know how to build a solar panel that gets 40% efficient. So we're going to fly it and tell them how it works. So uh, let's talk about uh, something new in our area. We're going to start six satellite clubs. These clubs will include middle and high school students in our area. We're going to ask them to launch at least one high altitude balloon a year until we get manifested to fly. These clubs will uh, be asked to construct a ground station to talk to their satellites at their school. We will ask those students to get licensed. Uh, and when manifested, we'll integrate a, their satellite for launch. And we want them to formally report to their student body their activities. So uh, in our area, we are influenced by the Acadians and uh, in the French language and in French T means petty or small. So we're going to call these things T sets. That's a play on Bob Twiggs' thin sets. Now, the dimensions of this thing are three and a half by three and a half by one and a quarter. Really big. Uh, we're going to include some solar panels on there. And if we're lucky, we're going to produce about a half one hour per orbit. We're going to, of course, put a 18650 battery in there. We're going to run a shallow microcontroller. Uh, we're going to put a law radio in there on VHF. We're going to have, of course, a deployable monopole. Our controller will be programmed in Ardu Arduino IDE, and uh, it's manufactured by Sweetduino. And we're also going to put a three and a half by three and a half experimental board for the students to design their own experiments. Uh, to the uh, TSAT mission is to inspire middle and high school students to gain the skills to build, design, operate satellites in LEO. Uh, to prepare, the, prepare them for a, record, a rewarding technical career, to develop teachers in STEM, to accomplish their mission. Uh, they will have to acquire skills by working as a team, learning some C programming, orbital mechanics, electronics, mechanical skills, Schematic capture. Let me do a pause here and tell you about schematic capture with our seniors at the college level. Then first they're making schematics. I'll walk into that lab and they'll start putting things on a pref board. By the time I get in there, it looks like a fuzzball full of wire. And they have no idea how to explain to me what they got and makes it almost impossible for me to help them troubleshoot that thing. I've been threatening to grab a baseball bat and start mashing fingers on the lab table if they do that. And of course, we want these students to be leaders in their schools. So what can this little small TSAT do? Well, from a ground station at their school, we want them to communicate with their satellite and almost arrive to horizon. We want them to design experiments. And what could they do? Well, first of all, they collect health data. They perhaps could develop an email or a tweet server. They can design sun sensors. They can put a nine-axis IMU on the satellite. But really, we want these students to use their imagination to design their own experiments. So what kind of experiments can they do? Well, of course, they can measure the bus voltage and currents. Uh, they can measure the Earth's magnetic field. They can tell us about the rotation of the satellite. Uh, if they're really smart, they can uh, generate a vector to the sun. They can measure the rotation. But again, we want to fire up their imagination to do anything they can dream up. And of course, we impose some pretty stiff power and space limits on them. So what, what's the life of this orbit? Well, you know, if we're really lucky, we might get a year out of that guy. What was it look like? Well, here's a uh, prototype. You can see the solar panels. That's actually the solar panel board, which we now have in test. Uh, and what's inside that thing? Well, look, here are the major components down there. Uh, there's the frame of the solar panels. There's the radio. There's a shell controller. And there's the block diagram. And, of course, we're going to put an experimental board in there. We expect them to generate their own experiments. 
So how will students talk to uh, to their TSATs? Well, we're going to use one of these mighty fine, expensive LoRa radios. Six bucks at SparkFun. More a little bit more about that later. So how will it be powered? Well, we've talked about the solar panels. They're about 15% efficient. We're going to put a 18650 uh, battery in there. How much energy would generate capture? Well, if we're lucky, we're going to get about a half watt per orbit. And that's part of the challenges for the students. So now, what will the ground station look like? Well, for you guys that have uh, had to deal with schools and how easy it is to make get uh, permission to penetrate walls and get coax up to the roof, we are, we're going to try to do a little uh, solving on that. So we're going to start with a J-pole, and we're going to put that on a non-pen mount. We're going to put the LoRa radio, an RPi 0 w uh, and a battery in a box, and we're going to connect that to the cloud. And then uh, they'll come back in their lab via the, via the cloud and, uh, and communicate that thing. And if they're really sharp and clever, they will convince their network uh, administrator, a.k.a. a syscon, to punch a hole in their, in their firewall, and they'll be able to play with that thing from their house. So let's talk about what's on the main satellite now. Uh, we're back to the uh, deep space radio. So as our team wants to move uh, out of LEO, we're going to come up with a radio that's got a system gain of 185 dB. Uh, it's going to have an output of uh, plus 37. It's going to have a sensitivity of minus 148 dBm. Now, guys, this is uh, pretty dang phenomenal. Uh, the penalty we pay for that low data rate is 18 baud. Uh, but if our students are uh, clever, we'll make that adaptive. So as the link budget improves, we'll increase the uh, throughput. The DC input on this thing is 16 watts off an 8-volt bus. And when it's uh, when it's in low power, it's uh, 33 millivolts, and when it's receiving, it's only uh, and sleeping, it's only 10 microamps. Of course, the frequency we're going to fly a VHF guy, but the uh, the radio can work from 70 to 1,000 megahertz, and of course, again, it has lower spread spectrum, chirp spread spectrum. Uh, so, what's in the deep space radio? Well, first of all, it's a tech demonstrator with a very sensitive radio. Of course, it uses a lower format. Uh, it'll have a system gain of 184 dBm on VHF. And if you put a 14 dB Yagi on the ground, we will kick that uh, system gain up to 198. So what's inside this thing? Well, we're going to have uh, two voltage rails, 3.3 and an 8-volt rail. We're going to uh, talk to it on an SPI bus and a GPIO bus to control the amplifier and the switches. And again, this thing will uh, be uh, minus 148 dBm sensitivity with a power output of 37 dBm or 4 watts. So what can you do with that thing? Well, if you added a, a 10 watts on the ground and a Yagi, you can command that spacecraft out to uh, about a million miles. And uh, if you only had one watt on your ground station, that would make it easy to communicate in, in geosync orbit. Of course, again, uh, we do this at a really low data rate of 18 baud. Now, our rescue radio. We've uh, we've noticed that uh, we've noticed that uh, all the lot most of the Alana satellites, uh, half the satellites fail to communicate in orbit. Uh, this thing will work from 70 to 1,000 megahertz. It'll have a system gain of one, uh, 168 dBm. Again, it's uh, chirp modulation. Uh, we'll have a data rate from 18 baud to 125 kilobits. And uh, the power output when it's sleeping is uh, 2 microwatts. And when it's transmitting, it's 33. And when it's, excuse me, when it's receiving, it's 33. When it's transmitting, it's at 300. Again, it'll use a shallow microcontroller. And the interface to the uh, rest of the world be UR, I squared C, GPI, or SPI. So quickly, what are the outcomes for the kids? Well, they'll uh, learn about uh, orbital mechanics. They'll be uh, learn to communicate the objects uh, out to 2,000 miles, proficient in C, uh, master uh, uh, collaboration is working the team. Uh, they got to learn to deal with very small power sources. They got to be proficient in electronic and printed circuit design. 
what's the outcome for AMSAT? This is where we're going to get our next designers. So, guys, this is my story. We invite you to come see us. We want you to enjoy our fine food. We want you to listen to some of our Cajun Zotico music. We want you to come help us. We want you to have fun. And I'll take questions. Thank you very much for that update. Nick, let me uh, get you on here. Uh, so we can uh, answer some questions. Okay, um, Nick, if you could uh, accept the promotion to panelists so we can handle some questions here. Uh, helps to put my, uh, my uh, mic on. Um, Okay, well, we're having a bit of trouble getting uh, getting Nick here for uh, for questions. Uh, we do have a couple of um, a couple of questions here in the Q and A. Um, Nick, if you could uh, you're in the chat or me. Okay. Hello. All right. There we go. We got you now. All right. Um, okay, Nick, uh, we do have a few questions here. Um, Jan PE0SAT asked, uh, how can we contact uh, UL? Uh, July 4th, 2020, Cape One was active for a short time, but I had no way to contact the team. Uh, start with me and uh, I'll, uh, I'll send it to the right team member to, uh, to respond to you. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, also, Nick, if you, if you did, did you want to be on video? We only have audio at the moment. Uh, yes, I, I don't see the option to I don't see the option to add the camera. Yeah, I'm gonna have to promote you to panelist in order to uh, uh, get the camera on. You see, it's it's saying you're declining to be promoted to a panelist when I uh, try to do that. We're going to uh, do it again. Let's see. All right. Okay, there you go. You should be able to enable your, uh, your video when you uh, rejoin. Okay. Okay, now we can see you. Okay, our uh, second question here is um, uh, from Jim, WA4CWI. Does a link exist to more information on the high school program? Uh, again, we're uh, just we're just getting that started, but uh, send send uh, send an email to me and I'll respond to you. And we're interested in how to do that too. We're, we're not we're, we're kind of flying this airplane while it's in the air. So send us send us your questions and we'll uh, we'll get one of the students to answer you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Doug asks, is there a website to learn more about your program? Uh, UL, yes, there is, but we don't have a lot of content up yet. But uh, as we as we get more students in, we'll uh, we'll put more content on our website. It's a UL, ulcape.org. Is there a dash in that, or is it just ulcape? Ulcape.org. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, Lou McFadden as mentions, uh, great work, Nick. Uh, Grace, uh, K-E-8-R-J-U asks, how does this work for the high school students? Would this be part of a class or an after school program? Uh, it's gonna be a club. We're gonna form a club after school. But out of that has come some dual enrollments. One of the schools we got is, uh, we got 15 students now coming to the, uh, to the university for dual enrollment. 
for the first engineering class. Okay, that sounds good, thank you. Uh, Ray Roberge asks, uh, did the FCC approve using LoRa chip uh, chirp waveforms? Uh, we don't have an application in for uh, LoRa yet, but uh, there's uh, a commercial LoRa has been flying. In fact, uh, uh, I can't remember the name, uh, SwarmSat or something has got 150 manifested to go and they have a commercial license. And a couple of the uh, companies in Europe are flying them. And we, we, actually, uh, we actually have a coordination from the IARU for Allure. Okay. Uh, yeah, and I, I think uh, the, the issue there might be uh, because it's a spread spectrum modulation that's not, uh, uh, not generally permitted on the two meter band. I, I think that might be why uh, uh, what Ray is mentioning when it, when you when you mentioned using 144 145 megahertz band um, in LoRa. Well, you know, uh, if we if we have to get a waiver to do that, first of all, we're only asking for a, a 25 kilohertz channel, and uh, we got you know our signal on the ground is going to be uh, pretty dang close to the noise floor. Uh, if if uh, we may, it may take a waiver to get it, but we were prepared to, uh, to, uh, uh, to uh, negotiate with the FCC to let us fly. If, if not, we'll go experimental. Okay. Um, yeah, and Jim mentioned that Swarm Technologies is, is now part of, uh, now part of uh, SpaceX, the one that flew, some That's of that, correct. Uh, SpaceX acquired them. Okay, um, see, I don't uh, let's see. I don't see any further questions here at the moment. Um, so, uh, did you have anything else to add? Oh, here we go. Um, uh, K6LCS Quint asks, uh, "Are you still involved with Habitat for Humanity?" Uh, no, I was on the board for about. My wife and I were on the board for about ten years, and we are, we now moved off and doing other things. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, um, well, that, that is all the questions that I have at the moment. Uh, so unless there's anything you'd like to add, um, I think that's... Uh... Uh, well, first of all, if you guys have ideas, we're always open. This is, uh, we, we're, we're gonna be challenged to handle uh, six schools and we're gonna, we're gonna dip back into the middle school. So uh, we're, uh, we're kind of winging this thing as we go. But uh, if you guys have ideas, uh, uh, you have my email and I'm, uh, I'm open to suggestions. Thanks. Okay, uh, thanks a lot, Nick. Uh, great presentation, a great program there at uh, uh, the University of uh, Louisiana. Uh, keep uh, doing some real interesting stuff and certainly looking forward to seeing um, how that, uh, that deep space radio performs and, and uh, communicating with uh, such simple ground stations over such... Uh, such uh, uh, long ranges is, is, um, is, uh, is really interesting stuff. So uh, congratulations on all the good work that you're doing. And uh, thank you. Thank you very much for joining us today to provide an update. All right. Um, so uh, with that, uh, I note that at the last break, I forgot to hand it over to Frank uh, N1UW to um, to do the uh, to do the prize drawing. So we have two prize drawings at this point. Uh, over to you, Frank. Okay, thank you, Paul. Uh, and that was a great presentation, uh, Nick. That uh, that's really exciting stuff. Okay, our uh, first prize uh, uh, first drawing is for an AmSat uh, T-shirt. You can choose the uh, T-shirt of your choice at the Zazzle store, and you can uh, customize it with your your name and your uh, call sign if you like. So let's see who our lucky winner is, uh, is going to be here. And I'm still looking for the share the audio button and I'm not, uh, not finding that, but that's not so important, okay? So let's uh, spin the wheel here. And we're not actually not seeing the screen either. But that's okay.
Well, it's Barry Baines. Congratulations, uh, Barry. You get uh, your choice of a t-shirt uh, at the store. And uh, Paul, did you say something while I was spinning the wheel there? Yes, uh, unfortunately we didn't see your screen. Uh, so um, yeah, uh, not, not, uh, for if you wanna share your screen for the second, second one. And uh, uh, congrats to Barry on winning a, a, Zazz a Zazzle t-shirt. We are including customization. So if you wanna customize it, uh, you're free to do so. And I'll get in touch with you about, uh, about placing that order. Um, and then if anybody else wants any of our great merchandise, it's at uh, zazzle.com slash amsat underscore gear. That's zazzle.com slash amsat underscore gear for our Zazzle merchandise. Uh, back to you, Frank, if you want to share your screen for the second drawing. Okay, we got it. And uh, I did look for some Zidako music. I couldn't find it, but the uh, the closest thing I could find here was a, uh, a polka. Is it like a polka? <laughs> Okay, Mario, uh, CE6 Mike Oscar Alpha has won a uh, Alaskan uh, Aero antenna with the duplexer. So we'll have that on its uh, way in a week or so. Mario, congratulations. And that's all from Tucson right now, Paul. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Frank, uh, for that. That was an excellent choice of music for the prize drawing. <laughs> thank you. Um, so uh, with that, our next uh, presentation comes from, uh, comes from Jonathan Brandenburg, KF5IDY. He will be presenting on open source flight software frameworks from NASA uh, and uh, asking the question, will my project benefit? Uh, he has supplied some uh, video for that. Uh, so I will get that started. Hello, my name is Jonathan Brandenburg, and I'm speaking today about open source flight software frameworks. Uh, given the, the duration of this talk, it will necessarily be potentially a brief overview and introduction to these frameworks, but uh, hopefully it'll give you some idea of what's available and maybe sort of what makes them special, some of the pros and cons around each of these frameworks. Who am I? Uh, I am again, Jonathan Brandenburg. Uh, I am a lifetime member of AMSAT and I have developed flight software on the AMSAT programs. In particular, I started with the Fox program where I uh, developed a large portion of the software related to experiment integration. Uh, certainly that was my, my, my part of that world. I've also done a little bit of work on the golf program, similarly uh, doing the integration into the experiment. And then finally, I've done a little bit of work on the RTIHU that's flying on the golf program. Just, just, just a touch uh, to review some of the early, uh, early design decisions. Uh, for my day job, I'm a flight software engineer with a small engineering company out of Houston called Medix. I develop flight software for Johnson Space Center, in particular on their Gateway program. I also have the opportunity to work with the flight software of an experimental launch that's upcoming in the next few years that has ultra-precise formation flying requirements. And then finally, as I have time, I research and implement astrodynamics algorithms into libraries that we can use on future projects. So we're talking about open source flight software frameworks. The first question that might come to mind is what's available. Uh, and if you perform an internet search, you're likely to see a couple that'll pop pretty quickly to the top. In particular, CFS, the core flight system from NASA's Goddard program will show up on there. And then similarly, the F prime from Jet Propulsion Laboratory will, will pop up as well. And if you dig a little deeper, you'll likely find a few more. Uh, there's one called Kubos, which is the brainchild of a commercial company that was formerly based here uh, where I'm at, near Denton, Texas. And then there's a couple out of the European Space Agency that will uh, that'll trickle in there too if you, uh, if you do a sufficient research, the Corday specification and the NanoSat framework. <clears throat> Thank you. 
We'll start with uh, the core flight system uh, framework, uh, as that's the one that I think we'll all hear about pretty quickly if you research and search for flight software frameworks. Um, CFS is, a, is an app-based framework that uses a software bus. Well, what does that really mean? Well, as we'll see with most of our frameworks, they get their value because they have the ability to encapsulate bits of functionality into components or, in, in the case of CFS, apps. Uh, this makes that functionality reusable uh, across missions and over time. And these apps communicate over a software bus. Uh, these apps can choose to publish information uh, or they can choose to subscribe to information that's available from other apps. And the format of these messages that travels on this software bus are based on the CCSDS format. Uh, you'll hear me mention CCSDS once or twice today. It's a, it's a standards-based organization that deals with data standards for the aerospace industry and, and, and similar functions. Uh, we'll find that, again, most of our frameworks today that we're talking about are going to have some sort of standards-based implementation, uh, and CFS is certainly no exception to that. CFS provides a lot of common services that pretty much every satellite will need. The ability to start and stop software, the ability to keep track of time, the ability to communicate between the different components. And in addition to that, CFS has a large number of open source apps uh, that are available along with the framework. Three of the core ones are, are ones that I consider kind of non-negotiable. Uh, every satellite needs the ability to accept commands from the ground. That'll be the command ingest. Every satellite needs to send information and telemetry back to the ground. That'll be the telemetry out. And then finally, some way to schedule uh, activities on the satellite or advance time. But there's a lot of other apps as well that I don't have listed on this screen uh, that uh, certainly could be of interest to you. Things like uh, checking memory integrity, uh, scheduling future activities, those kinds of things. Uh, CFS, uh, one of its key strengths is its portability. Uh, it is based upon the concept of an OSAL, an operating system abstraction layer. Uh, this OSAL basically presents common capabilities into the CFS framework that the operating system has to provide. Things like the concept of a task or the concept of a mutex, uh, or even in some cases the concept of a, of a file and a file system. Uh, those are the things that an OSAL, an operating system abstraction layer, uh, will convert from any operating system uh, to be available to CFS. And as such, that means CFS can be ported to pretty much any platform that you may need. Uh, now, if it's not a platform that CFS already exists for, uh, then you'll be responsible for porting the OSAL as well as creating the so-called BSP and PSP, the board support package and platform support package. And that's probably one of the biggest challenges to CFS is, is its capability. Uh, that capability can cause it to be a little bit overwhelming. And if you're starting with a CFS uh, framework for the first time and you've got a platform that you need to build uh, it for, there's kind of a little bit of a learning curve up front. But once you've overcome that learning curve, that's when you really start to see the benefits of CFS and its reusability and its, its longevity. Uh, so what does that mean? Well, it means CFS is very capable, comes with a little bit of complexity. Uh, that also means that there's a little bit of a learning curve. Uh, but it doesn't necessarily have to be big in terms of resource requirements. Uh, I've actually ported CFS to some very small platforms, little STM development boards, Nucleo boards, for example, um, on the FreeRTOS operating system. So it can be very, very resource light if that's your need. Uh, but uh, it does have a lot of capability and power. So after CFS, the second one that will likely pop up on your, your screen may be this platform called F-Prime. Uh, and F-Prime's been getting a little bit of press lately because it was used, I believe, on the Ingenuity helicopter flying on Mars. Uh, and as a result of that, it's starting to, to come up a little bit in the search results. Uh, just like CFS, F-Prime has its way of encapsulating functionality. In the case of F-Prime, it uses components. Uh, unlike CFS, though, F prime uses a static topology. Uh, these, these components communicate through ports, and that topology is defined uh, at, at compile time. So it doesn't have quite the same dynamic flexibility of CFS, but it still has the same concept of, of components, in this case, components, as opposed to apps. Uh, and they still communicate, but in this case, they communicate through ports rather than a, a software bus. 
F prime is interesting in that it is written, I think, primarily in C++, uh, and they make pretty heavy use of the concepts of inheritance and such. So, for example, C++, uh, C++ skeleton code is generated by the F prime uh, code generator, giving you a sort of a, a shell where you put your functionality. Uh, and that can be pretty interesting when you're coming up to speed for the first time. It, it's, it's in some ways easier to grasp. Uh, so I'd say that's one of the key benefits of, of F prime is it's a little bit smaller uh, in terms of just scope than CFS and, and that tends to lessen its learning curve. Uh, it's it's portable, uh, just like CFS is. It's portable in the sense that it's got this abstraction layer between the, the framework and the uh, operating system. Uh, but uh, it's just a, a, a thinner layer, I think you might call it. So those are the two that are provided by NASA. The CFS framework is out of Goddard. The F prime framework is out of JPL. If I keep searching, the next one I'll typically come up with is one called Kubos. Uh, Kubos is uh, the, the brainchild of a commercial company. It used to be based here near me physically in Denton, Texas, uh, but now I believe they've moved to Portland. And unlike the others, which were somewhat operating system agnostic, Kubos is unabashedly Linux-based. Uh, in fact, there is a Kubos Linux distribution that is sort of a... a a flight-worthy version of Linux, not in the sense of it being real-time or radiation tolerance specifically, uh, but it's it's just a lighter version of Linux. It's had a lot of the things stripped out that you won't need in flight. Uh, I find that intriguing in the sense that many of us are working with Linux today, so it's a, a very comfortable environment. That means the learning curve typically is very, very short, and that can be a, an advantage uh, for a short-term project. On the other hand, though, there's a there's an issue that I think we're coming across now where Kubos may be languishing just a little bit. Uh, I believe the company Kubos, who created the operating system Kubos, uh, is now focusing more on their ground control software. Uh, Major Tom, I believe, is its name. And, and the open source community hasn't really picked up and run with the Kubos flight software framework. Uh, so I fear uh, that without some, some care and attention, it, it may be fading a little bit. We now go over the ocean a little bit uh, to the Corday C2 framework, or maybe better said, specification. Uh, Corday is a specification for service-oriented applications. Uh, in particular, this can be applied to spacecraft. Just like we've seen with the previous application frameworks, we're talking about ways of dividing up functionality. In the case of Corday, we're talking about services. So you may develop some services that publish uh, data, so-called reports, to requesters, and you may be able to subscribe and receive those reports. So it's a, it's a service-oriented request-demand kind of framework. What makes Corday and C2 a little different is that Corday itself is a specification. It's a, it's a standard, uh, so to speak. And C2 is a specific implementation of that standard, in this case in C. Uh, so while Cord A is a specification and C2 is its implementation, it's not a top to bottom stack. So for example, the Cord A framework and the C2 implementation of it don't really talk about the middleware that allows those services to communicate with each other. That's a layer of this application stack that, uh, that Corday and C2 don't provide. And that makes Corday more of an application level framework. It assumes, assumes certain plumbing under the covers. But uh, Corday does have some key capabilities and, and interests, uh, interesting capabilities of its own. In particular, it's a very robust specification. It's uh, very well defined in terms of its behavior. It, it seeks to avoid any undetermined behavior. It's very well documented in terms of its specification and in terms of its traceability between requirements and the specification. So if you're looking for a very robust platform, a very robust foundation, Corday would certainly provide that to you. And then finally, we'll talk a little bit about uh, NanoSat. I'm not sure if this is NanoSat Mo or, Nan or NanoSat Mo, so I'm just going to say NanoSat going forward. It's not one that I'm incredibly familiar with, uh, but it d I did come across it in my searches and research for open software, uh, open source flight software framework. 
NanoSat, uh, as I understand it, was a project that was trying to answer the question, what would you do if resources and processing power weren't a limiting factor on your spacecraft? What would that allow you to do? Uh, and in, in that, NanoSat has developed a very robust uh, platform based upon the concept of CCSDS services. Uh, you'll see in this list just a, a dump of different services that are, are part of the NanoSat framework. Uh, the common ones that you would expect, the ability to start and stop applications, the ability to communicate, the ability to log. But I'm particularly intrigued by those platform services at the bottom. It almost seems as if NanoSat, this framework, has uh, provided some some services that are needed for common payloads, uh, like location awareness in the GPS service, the attitude determination and control service, the SDR radio service, those kinds of capabilities look very interesting to me. I think if I was talking about NanoSat's pros and cons, I'd, I'd focus a little bit on the resource requirements of it. It did assume uh, processing power and resources, and I believe it's written uh, primarily in the Java framework, although it can obviously leverage other language services, uh, as Java often can, uh, but it does assume that you've got enough power to run a JVM uh, and enough resources to, to host your entire application. And so that's an interesting, uh, interesting, I guess, research project. So those are the five software frameworks that I found when I was doing some research um, in terms of more or less the order of, of, of common uh, common results. But I also want to acknowledge there's a sixth option, of course, which is no framework whatsoever. Uh, the use of these frameworks comes, so again, as I've said before, with pros and cons, and, and the cons are primarily learning curve. You've got to come up to speed on these frameworks, and then you can finally leverage them to their full potential. Uh, and the benefits to that really come from the standards base. Uh, a lot of these frameworks I've mentioned the term CCSDS in terms of messaging and services, the ability to interoperate therefore with third-party ground systems or third-party control systems, for example, uh, will come as part of that. Uh, so there's always a, a trade-off involved in using a framework. And, and if your project is just, you know, simple, you control the entire ecosystem, you control the ground system, you control the radios, you don't need to worry about standards. This is a one-off satellite. Maybe you don't need a framework. Maybe you just write uh, bare metal software onto the processor. Or maybe you write uh, based on a real-time operating system such as Free RTOS. Uh, in those senses, uh, you don't need a framework, um, and maybe it's up to your individual project as to whether you'll benefit from a framework. So I've kind of talked about now six options, right? Five frameworks and the option of no framework. So if I was just, you know, answer the question, what is it I should use? And, and I generally see that if I'm likely to have a long-lived program, maybe consisting of multiple missions, uh, maybe needing to integrate with a lot of standards-based products on the ground and, and other assets, the CFS framework, I think, is, is, is one I would seriously consider. Uh, it's a little bit big uh, in terms of functionality and capability, uh, but that's a, a, a benefit as well. It just means that I have a little bit of a learning curve, and I need to have the opportunity to benefit from that learning curve. So if my project is going to consist of, get, like I said, of multiple launches and evolve over a period of months and years, and what satellite doesn't evolve over years, then the CFS framework is certainly something to look at. On the other hand, if it, it may not be quite as complex, uh, maybe it's a single mission, uh, maybe it's a little less complex or I, I control a little more of the ecosystem, then I would seriously consider F prime. It's got a very, very short learning curve in my experience, uh, very quickly able to come up to speed on it and implement useful flight software. And then lastly, if this is just a, a one-off research project, it's gonna go up, it's gonna come down eventually, um, and I'm not worried about reusability over time, or I'm not worried about adherence to standards, then I would seriously consider the option of no framework whatsoever. So again, there's, there's pros and cons to each of these in terms of complexity, learning curve, capability trade-offs. Um, and uh, those are the kinds of questions you'll have to ask uh, and answer for yourself. Now, having said that, I'm very interested in knowing what you have used on your missions as well. If you've previously developed a satellite or in the process of developing a satellite, I'm very interested in knowing what flight software framework, if any, you've chosen. Uh, I'm also interested in knowing what platform or operating system you've, uh, you've used. 
So uh, if you have a program or a project that you're working on or have worked on or planning to work on, please let me know the answers to these questions. You know, what framework have you used? What operating system are you based on? And what uh, hardware platform are you using? Feel free to, to, to chat with me in the uh, chat associated with this conference or email me uh, or maybe even address it as a Q&A question, uh, which at this time I answer uh, open up to questions and look forward to answering whatever you might have for me. Thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it. Okay, uh, thank you very much for that presentation, Jonathan. Uh, and um, uh, we do have Jonathan Brandenburg with us to, uh, to take your questions. And it looks like we do have a couple in the, um, in the Q and A uh, pod so far. Uh, so Jonathan, the uh, first question we have is from uh, James White. He asks, what support resources are available to student uh, developers for, uh, for CFS? Yeah, certainly. First, uh, how's my audio? Are you hearing me okay? You sound fine. Very good. So I came prepared to answer that question. Thank you very much, James. And in fact, I'm going to try to share my screen here. If this works, um, I'm going to show you some of the common uh, training opportunities. First with CFS, there's a a CFS 101, uh, which is a virtual machine training course on how to install, develop, and use uh, CFS. It's just a real simple introduction. Uh, but I also want to make a special mention of uh, what's called Open SAT Kit. Uh, Mr. Dave McComas, uh, who was up at the Goddard Space Flight Center, now is independent, uh, has really become a, a big evangelist for CFS uh, and is working to uh, make it easier to onboard CFS into your project. Uh, and then finally, related to CFS, uh, my company, Medics, I developed a series of activities or labs, as you might call it, that are available on GitHub uh, that kind of takes you through a bare, in my case, BeagleBone AI, uh, and then uh, kind of guides you through the process of installing, using, and, and enhancing CFS. So those are three options for CFS. Uh, and I mentioned that because if you look at the CFS distribution, there's not a lot of, of tutorials that are that are just directly linked to CFS. So these, these three options that are sort of provided by the community are probably your best option. Uh, as far as F Prime, on the other hand, um, there is uh, there are available tutorials on their on their wiki uh, on their their website, uh, which I found a very good introduction to F Prime. So uh, that's certainly an option there. Uh, Kubos, I don't have the page up on that, but they have some tutorials and some guidance as well. Uh, and then I can't really speak as much to Corday and uh, the Nano uh, SAT framework. So I hope I answered your question. What do you think? Okay, uh, thank you, Jonathan. Uh, we have a question from uh, Jay Schwartz, WB8 SBI. Uh, what cybersecurity protocols are you using to examine, test, and document that the open source code doesn't have malicious code in it? This includes examining 100% of the code, no matter who wrote it or when it was written. Uh, malicious code would allow an unauthorized person or entity to take over the bird and or command it to do something that results in mission failure. Yeah, that's a very, very fair question. Uh, I mean, especially if you're interested in cybersecurity, you're, you're likely familiar with supply chain risks and supply chain attacks. And that's true regardless of whether you're working with um, satellites or working with uh, a project around your house. Um, so there's really kind of two answers to that. Um, the first is, is if you truly have high reliability requirements, then it will be incumbent upon you and your project to perform an audit on that software. Uh, in that sense, a smaller framework might be better than a bigger framework because there's less to audit. Uh, but certainly if you have firm cybersecurity requirements, uh, I would expect that you and your project would, would, would be responsible for that auditing. Having said that, um, you can also sometimes trust the open source community. In this case, I can speak to CFS a little, little more carefully uh, because that's actually my day job. My day job is human rating uh, the CFS flight software right now uh, through incredible levels of, of audit inspection and so forth. And so if you trust the publishers of CFS, which is out of Goddard, then maybe that's enough for your project. Uh, so those are at least a couple of ways of looking at it. The first is do it yourself. And the second is trust and maybe verify. Uh, so those, uh, those are good questions, um, but a very good question to ask and very good question to think about. Back to you, Paul. Okay, uh, thank you, Jonathan. Um, the next uh, question we have is from uh, B. Dale, B. Dale, B. Dale Garby, KB0G. Uh, years ago, Carl Meisner uh, hammered into my head that what is not in orbit cannot fail in orbit. 
When working on onboard software for AMSAT projects, that caused me to bias heavily in favor of very simple code, such as FreeRTS. Uh, free, free RTOS, for example, is huge. And these systems all seem likely to result in lots of code nobody actually understands running in these systems. Words like framework, middleware, et cetera, just scare me in this context. Can you think of any current or future AMSAT NA projects where any of these frameworks make sense? Yeah, yeah, that's, a, that's another really good question. Uh, and it really comes down again to your mission and, and your, your comfort level uh, with using these products. Uh, the more CFS, for example, is used, and as I just noted, human rated, perhaps you trust it more. Um, F prime uh, is flying a lot um, by, by JPL, so perhaps you trust it because of its flight heritage. So just like uh, hardware components, you can also uh, consider the flight heritage of software components. Um, but your, your, your fundamental point is, 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 is equally valid, right? If, if, if you don't have um, complex software, then you don't have to worry about whether that complex software is going to work. And I guess what I'd say there is the idea and the concept of complexity is kind of in the eye of the beholder. Um, for example, I, I, I know that uh, I think I saw in your question that, you know, free RTOS is, is, is big in, in, your, in, in your book. And certainly that can be true. Uh, but on the other hand, I consider it small. Um, mostly because I'm intimately familiar with, with each and every file and aspect of free RTOS, so it doesn't seem overwhelming to me. So in the end, maybe it does come down to comfort, uh, comfort and experience uh, is, I guess, my best answer to that question. I hope that uh, that kind of makes sense, Vidal, um, but if it doesn't, feel free to follow up. Back to you, Paul. Thank you, uh, Jonathan. Um, next question is a licensing question from, uh, from Barry Baines. Uh, does using an open source software system require that the resulting development for a specific software, a specific spacecraft also be declared open source under open source licensing? Yeah, another great, great question, Barry. Thank you for that. And, you know, that's one of the banes of open source to some extent are, are the different licenses and the implications of those licenses. Um, CFS, I think it is either is or is being released under, I believe it's Apache. Uh, I think it is. Uh, and effectively has no restrictions on it and therefore doesn't require uh, that your satellite be open source uh, unless you want it to be, of course. Um, I'm not as familiar, I have to admit, with the, with the licenses on the other ones, so I can't be as, as, as crisp on that one. Uh, but in general, yeah, that's a fair question. Um, if, you're, if your satellite's going to be open source, then maybe it's not such a big deal. Uh, but if you're trying to build a, a commercial product or you're not interested in open sourcing your satellite, then you would have to pay much more attention to the, to the open source license. Very, very good point. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Barry. Um, or thank you, Jonathan, for the answer for Barry. Um, we have uh, one more question here from uh, Calvin Gluck. Uh, can you briefly describe how the use of open source affects uh, ITAR uh, regulations? Um, <laughs> I guess I'm going to have to, in short, say no, um, only because I'm not as comfortable as I need to be uh, with that. Uh, there's a lot of, 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 of uh, conversation about ITAR and its relationship to open source, and there's some pretty strong evidence uh, that truly published open source um, in most cases is not restricted by ITAR and in some cases is not restricted by the export regulations. Uh, but I am not going to uh, going to step into that quagmire right now. I'm sorry about that, uh, uh, Calvin. Certainly, a certainly a very uh, complex uh, complex field um, to uh, to discuss. Um, next question is again from James White, and it's back to security. Uh, do any of these have built-in methods for assuring no one can send commands that are not from the command station? Um, great question again, uh, James. I appreciate that. And, and the, I think the short answer to that, honestly, is no, not built in. Um, they seem to almost assume a secure communication channel under the covers. Now, having said that, again, these are very modular systems, and I personally have added a uh, authorization authentication system around the command ingestion. Uh, so it's certainly very easy to do that. But um, honestly, I don't think they have it built in. Okay, um, thank you again for that. Um, looks like we have exhausted the, uh, the questions uh, for the moment. Um, we do have a few more minutes if any questions pop up here in the next few seconds, but uh, um, otherwise, did you have anything that you'd like to add, uh, Jonathan? 
Yeah, only one quick thing. I now realize I did not click that last button to actually share my screen. So I'm going to post the URLs to the various uh, web pages I'd mentioned earlier, the, the resources on CFS and the tutorial on F Prime, just uh, just that are available. I'll post those into the chat here in just a couple minutes. Okay, thank you very much, and, and thank you very much for the presentation and for uh, uh, for sharing that with uh, with us today. Absolutely, and my email. Uh, uh, was in the uh, end of the presentation. Uh, I did not do a really good job of pushing my company, uh, but jonathan.brandenburg at medics.com certainly uh, is a good way to reach me if you have uh, any sort of professional interest in, in these topics of flight software. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you again, Jonathan. Um, with that, we, uh, we now come to uh, another prize drawing. Uh, so I will hand it over to Frank uh, for another prize drawing. Okay, uh, thank you, Paul. And our next uh, drawing is uh, another clothing item. It's the choice of any AMSAT hooded uh, sweatshirt from uh, Zazzle again. And again, you can uh, uh, customize that with your, your name and your, your call sign. So that's another great prize. Maybe uh, Barry will get uh, lucky again and uh, win another uh, little more clothing. Okay. So share sound, choose our screen, click share. Who says you can't train old people on how to do, uh, do new things here? Okay, let's spin the wheel. Okay, Ronald Coppersmith, KD9Q, uh, uh, Quebec Oscar Golf. Okay, congratulations. We'll get you the, uh, the information on how to uh, uh, get the, uh, the, uh, the prize sent off to you. Thank you very much. And uh, back to you, Paul. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Frank. And yeah, we'll be in contact uh, regarding that. Um, that uh, that uh, that ho uh, that hooded sweatshirt, uh, which again we will include customization on that. And again, if anybody wants some uh, custom AMSAT uh, AMSAT T-shirt, sweatshirt, or lots of other good things, uh, am uh, zazzle.com/amsat underscore gear is the link to our Zazzle store. So uh, next on the agenda is um, is uh, Bob McGuire. Uh, N4HY is scheduled to give a presentation on um, ORCID, but I do not see him in the uh, as logged into the Zoom meeting at this at this time. Um, so hold hold on one second, and we will uh, we will um, we will be back with uh, with you shortly.
Okay, well, it looks like we do not have uh, we do not have uh, Bob McGuire here um, on on uh, on the meeting at this time. What's uh, it's been a long morning, uh, so I think uh, everybody could use about a, a ten minute break or so, and we'll begin with the education uh, section um, after another prize drawing um, at uh, at uh, one o'clock p.m. Central Time and uh, 2 p.m. Eastern Time, uh, 1800 UTC.
Okay, uh, welcome back, uh, everybody, to uh, the uh, 2021 Dr. Tom Clark Space Symposium, Dr. Tom Clark Memorial Space Symposium and Annual General Meeting. Uh, right now, uh, we will have prior to the um, prior to the uh, education program, which is next on the agenda, uh, we will have uh, a prize drawing uh, from Frank and Winnie W. Go ahead, Frank. Okay, we've got uh, one more arrow antenna to uh, give away this morning. And then uh, after that, we've got uh, th yet three more prizes to give away. So as they say, don't, uh, don't go away. So uh, let's look at the, uh, the, the wheel here, give her a spin. And uh, Clint, no, it's not your, your meds. I am, am actually playing polka music here. <laughs> And maybe you can't train senior citizens. Uh, I'll, one of these days, remember to hit the, the share button. But anyway, the winner for the Aero Antenna, the Alaskan Aero Antenna is Keith Brandt, WD9 Golf Echo Tango. Congratulations. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Frank. Um, so uh, next up on the agenda is uh, the update from our AMSAT education group. Uh, Alan Johnston, KU2Y, uh, Vice President, Educational Relations, will have an update on uh, the CubeSat simulator and uh, other education activities. Uh, and we will get that started uh, right away. I'm Alan Johnson, KU2Y. I'm AMSAT's Vice President for Educational Relations, and I'm also an Associate Teaching Professor at Villanova University in Pennsylvania. This presentation is about the AMSAT CubeSat Simulator and Education Update. I'm giving this presentation on behalf of my co-authors, uh, Jim McLaughlin, KI6ZUM, and David White, WD6DRI. So um, these are the topics that I'm going to cover, uh, talking about the, uh, the CubeSat simulator project here at AMSAT. Uh, start with an overview, um, talk about uh, the simulator in classroom and in events. I'll talk about the beta building activity that's gone on for the past year. Uh, CubeSat sim loaners, what's been going on with them. I'll talk about some of the design updates that have happened in the past 12 months. Um, I'm not going to talk about the CubeSat Sim Lite. That's this, uh, this small board here, uh, since I have another presentation dedicated to that. I'm going to talk about the uh, uh, ground station for the CubeSat Sim, which is now part of the Fox in the Box version 3 and the Aris Radio Pi image. Uh, talk about future plans, and um, and also how you can participate in the project, and uh, and some conclusions. So um, the past twelve months, uh, you know, due to the global pandemic, it's been pretty difficult in uh, in education. Uh, and uh, you know, my hats off to to all teachers and educators out there that have that have gotten through uh, the past twelve months. Hopefully, things are going to get better. Um, we did get the CubeSat simulator into the classroom uh, a few times. Um, so I wanna thank these individuals for, uh, for doing so. Uh, so uh, Nick Pouge, uh, K5QXJ, uh, he brought it into the University of Louisiana at Lafayette, uh, where he's involved. Um, also uh, Melissa Poor, KM6CZN, uh, at the Bishop O'Connell High School in Arlington, Texas. Uh, sorry, Arlington, Virginia. Um, I've uh, worked with her a few times and she has used the CubeSat simulator loaner uh, in her classroom. Uh, Dan Noel, uh, he's a uh, University of Southern Maine mechanical engineering student and uh, he built a CubeSat simulator and he's also written a, a great article 
in the latest uh, AMSAT journal. So if you have a chance to to check that out, I'd, I'd recommend it. He's got photos and uh, lessons learned from his uh, from his build. And finally, uh, uh, Ahmed Al Zubari. Uh, we've uh, corresponded over over email. Uh, he has built uh, an older version of the hard of the uh, CubeSat sim, um, and he is in the aerospace engineering department at uh, at King uh, Ab Abdul Aziz University in Saudi Arabia. So so well done, uh, Ahmed. So in terms of uh, events, also there have not been that many uh, in person events, but there have been a few. So thank you uh, to these volunteers that have that have uh, taken the CubeSat simulator to these events. Um, so Gordon Scannell, uh, KD8COJ, and the Livonia Amateur Radio Club. Um, he brought it to their local public library for, uh, for a nice display there in uh, 2021, not, uh, not uh, 20,201. Um, and uh, Tom Schussler, uh, N5HYP, uh, again, uh, organized an AMSAT table at the Frontiers of Flight Moon Day in Dallas, Texas. He's done that for a few years, and uh, and it, it looks like it was a, a great event. Um, and also uh, Paul Stotzer, uh, our very own uh, AMSAT um, board member and executive director, uh, and N8HM, and Dave Taylor from ARIS, uh, W8AAS, uh, they brought the CubeSats in to uh, CaraFest. Uh, the Columbia Amateur Radio Association Hamfest in Maryland uh, last month. So, um, so thank you to all of them. Um, hopefully, we'll have more to report um, next year. So, I'm going to talk about the uh, bit about the beta builders. Um, and beta builders are really essential for the development of the CubeSat simulator. It's important that people besides myself and the other project members build them, so we can make sure that the instructions work. And also just to find out, you know, where people get confused, where things go wrong. Um, we've, we've made a lot of updates to the instructions and also the design based on the feedback. So thank you to all the beta builders um, over the years. So we had a few beta builders this year. Uh, Chris Thompson, uh, the author of the Fox Telem software for AMSAT engineering, uh, G0KLA AC2CZ. Uh, he built a CubeSat sim this year, which was great and uh, provided a lot of very useful feedback. Uh, also, Randy Standicke, uh, KQ6RS, uh, built one. Uh, and I have a bunch of uh, information from him um, because he, he not only was a beta builder, but he then did a bunch of RF testing and ended up helping us redesign uh, the board. So, so really, really great effort by Randy. Uh, Randy's a really interesting guy. There's, a, um, uh, there's information in, in our paper about his background. Um, but basically, he used to work for Heathkit, and uh, you know, so many of us have happy memories of building Heathkit kits over the years. Uh, so anyway, so Andy, Randy knows a thing or two about electronic kits uh, because of that, and we were just really thrilled and excited to have his feedback. So thank you, Randy, and I'll talk about his uh, his um, uh, RF work that he did on it as well in a minute. And then finally, the Villanova University CubeSat Club is helping out by building one now, and, uh, and, and we're, we're getting some good feedback from them. So, so again, thank you to all the beta builders over the years. Uh, this project would not be where it is um, without your uh, volunteer efforts. So let me talk a bit about the RF work that, uh, that Randy performed. Uh, so basically, when he built his CubeSat simulator with the version 1.0 um, boards, um, he discovered that the bandpass filter that we had in there uh, had a pretty pretty high um, pretty high loss. Uh, it was about 60 dB uh, at the um, uh, you know at, at the at the center frequency at the 434.9 megahertz. And um, so he started doing some testing because he thought we could do better. And uh, he discovered that a that a low pass filter um, worked fine. And um, and he designed a really simple one with two capacitors and an inductor. Uh, as you can see, uh, 0.6 dB loss and 26 dB harmonic rejection. So, so really, really great. And that's a, a close up of the uh, of it. There, we first tested it on the CubeSat Sim Lightboard, uh, which is what that's a close up for. So, anyway, so this was the theory, and uh, and then this was the results of it. 
and uh, and the results were really good. The the harmonic uh, harmonics are are in great shape. Um, also, this also proved that we did not need a bandpass filter. And I think uh, if you remember the the way we do the transmitter on the on the CubeSat sim is um, is we we just use the clock pin. We use the the uh, basically the pulse width modulated clock pin on the Raspberry Pi GPIO, and uh, we control that using software to basically generate the RF signal. Now it's a square wave, and so it's got all kinds of uh, all kinds of harmonics. But um, when we tested, uh, I guess it was two years ago, there were also a lot of spurs, and this area here below the fundamental frequency was full of full of stuff and it was much higher than it is now maybe maybe 20 db higher than than it is now so so i think there's some changes to the rpi tx library the software library that we use for doing this um, that makes the signal much cleaner and allows us to now use a low pass filter and the net result is now we're looking at almost 9 dbm of uh, of power output uh, which is which is great um, now the power output has never been an issue but these days, people are thinking about flying the CubeSat SIM on balloons. And there, you know, going from one milliwatt to 10 milliwatts, uh, RF power makes a big difference. So, so thank you, Randy, for that, uh, for that outstanding work uh, with the CubeSat simulator. So I'm gonna talk a bit about the uh, CubeSat SIM loaners. As you know, we've had, uh, we've had these loaners available for AMSAT members and HAMS to, uh, to, to basically get uh, we, we we ship ship the loaner to you with instructions, and uh, and then you show it off in the classroom or at your event, and then ship it back to us. Uh, it's been a great program. Uh, it's also gotten a lot more people exposed to it, and uh, and we've also learned a lot about uh, about the CubeSat simulator in the process. So thank you to everybody who has uh, who has borrowed them. Um, so the original set of loaners were the were the old hardware, um, the uh, VB3 and VB4 Beta4 uh design um we've now phased out that that old hardware so now we have four of them with the new uh the, the new hardware and we hope to hope to get one more going um next year and of course contact me um using my email address uh if uh if you have an event coming up uh, another thing we've done is the uh the original shipping case had that uh, pull apart foam uh and that that did not did not weather, did not wear well. It just gradually fell apart. So now, uh, now I have um, bought some uh, basically upholstery foam and cut it out, and uh, and I think that will that will wear much better, and it will also protect everything uh, much better. Also, had to make some repairs, uh, many of them relating to the micro USB charging port. So that's kind of a kind of a weakness uh, that that you know the cable can 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 break the connector. Um, so that, that's something that we might improve in the future. Um, another thing about the loaners are they now include a Raspberry Pi ground station. And there's a photo of it here. So there's a seven inch touch, touch screen. That's basically a stand. The Raspberry Pi 4B, um, connects onto the back of it. So you can't see it there. Um, it also has speakers built in, which is great for an SDR. Um, and it, and the software comes pre-installed with, um, uh, with, of course, Fox Telem, uh, Direwolf, and QSS TV for decoding everything, and also a general purpose SDR just for listening. Um, and, uh, and it just works right out of the box. You just power it up, and it opens, and it, it's, it launches in, uh, in, in Fox Telem. And so as soon as you power up your, your CubeSat simulator, you just immediately start seeing the data uh, coming in. So it's, uh, I think it's a much better... Um, experience. You can also connect it to an external monitor as well. All right, so I'm going to talk a bit about the uh, design updates. So those are the uh, printed circuit boards. Uh, there's three of them in the board stack inside uh, inside the, the CubeSat simulator, all stacked up. And um, this year, we had the first official uh, 1.0 release of the hardware. Uh, so all the Gerbers are on uh, GitHub, so you can fabricate it yourself. Um, or we also have um, printed circuit board sets available at the AMSAT store. So basically, you can get these three um, circuit boards um, ready, ready to go. Uh, because that way, you don't have to mess around with minimum quantities, and also it can take a while. Now, uh, 
the, uh, we started off with version 1.0 and we now have a version 1.1, which basically uh, the only difference is it replaces the bandpass filter with the low pass filter that, uh, that Randy designed and tested for us. So for example, here is the, uh, you can see this is the 1.0 version because that is the bandpass filter. It's got many components. It also says bandpass filter up there. I don't know if you can, if you can read that. Um, but these are the, uh, this is the version 1.1. And you can see it's a uh, low pass filter, it's fewer components, and it also says low pass filter there. Um, but otherwise, the boards are identical. And, uh, and really, there's, there's no reason uh, for, for one um, over the other. Also, I have links here to the uh, bill of materials, and also the, the uh, wiki instructions. And when you build them up, um, you have those three boards. This is the main board here with the battery charger, uh, the uh, boost converter, and the uh, current and voltage monitors, those purple boards. The battery board can have either AA or AAA batteries. And this is the stem payload board with the, um, with the Pro Micro, uh, uh, the SparkFun Pro Micro microcontroller, and the sensors, the IMU, basically the three axis gyro and a BME 280 for pressure altitude temperature sensor and including some LEDs and other components. And then you add in a Raspberry Pi Zero WH and you stack them all up and you've got yourself a, a CubeSat SIM. So we've, uh, so many of those have, 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 um, have been picked up at the AMSAT store. And uh, fortunately, we've been able to keep them, keep them in stock mostly. So, um, so if you're building one, uh, you can get them and and really jumpstart your CubeSat SIM build. So one of the other new uh, uh, things on the hardware is the uh, is the Pi camera. So you can see it there, um, and uh, we have these two smaller solar cells on either side. The uh, Pi camera, you can see the ribbon cable there. It actually plugs directly into the Pi Zero itself, and in SSTV mode. Um, the software automatically detects the camera, and instead of sending out the stored pictures, it'll take a picture every 30 seconds. And you can see this um, selfie here where I, I held it up to a mirror and then um, received it on the Raspberry Pi ground station with uh, QSS TV uh, doing the decoding. All right, so that, that leads into the uh, Raspberry Pi ground station. Now you can still use your PC for the ground station, but you know you need to install a bunch of software um, in order to do it, including VB cable, which is uh, to do the audio feedback, which is kind of a pain. So that's why we we like the um, Raspberry Pi ground station, and um, and and we basically have pre-built images that have all the software in it. So if you already have a Raspberry Pi, you just plug this SD card in, and uh, and it will become the ground station. Um, and what we've recently done is I've been working with, uh, with Burns Fisher, uh, WB1FJ, um, who has been uh, running the Fox in the Box project um, with Chris Thompson. And, uh, and the latest version of Fox in the Box, version 3, actually now can act as the CubeSat simulator uh, ground station. And we also merged in the Aris Radio Pi software. So it's got all this, uh, all this software uh, built into it. And I'll be demoing that when I talk about the uh, CubeSat SIM Lite. So then uh, just to, to wrap up here, um, future plans, um, we'll be doing some minor hardware and software updates next year, but we're mainly going to focus on supporting materials and uh, documentation, uh, basically what to do with the CubeSat simulator, how to involve it in, uh, in STEM education. Um, and of course, we're going to keep we're going to uh, keep the, the printed circuit boards and the SD cards in the AMSAT store to help people build them. Um, and also, uh, as I'll talk about in a bit, uh, we'll have CubeSat SIM lights available periodically. Um, and we're still thinking about kits, but with the global pandemic, uh, supply chain uh, chips, it's it's really a nightmare these days. So um, so we we really can't do that yet. But we're looking forward to having. Uh, kits of parts uh, available in the store in the future. And again, just a reminder that you can participate in the CubeSat SIM project. It's all open source, so you can contribute to it. You can modify the hardware, the software. You can redesign the 3D frame, whatever you're interested in. 
And, uh, and of course, you can demonstrate it too uh, by getting a loaner or building one. And when you do, we'd like you to, to um, spread the word, share it on uh, Twitter and other social media. We use the hashtag CubesatSim. So in conclusion, uh, I think it's been a great year for the CubesatSim project. Uh, and you can get plenty of information at cubesatsim.org. And I encourage you to, to, to get involved if you're interested. And I'd just like to end with, with some acknowledgements. Um, you know, this project is, uh, has been going on for many years uh, and, and really the origins of it are with Mark Spencer, WA8 SME and Bob Runiga, WB4 APR uh, for their uh, CubeSat simulator and LabSat. And, um, and then since I've been involved in the project, of course, Pat Kilroy and 8PK was instrumental in, uh, in, in getting, this, getting this project going again. Um, and, uh, and, and special thanks to all the beta builders listed here. Uh, I've already mentioned Randy for his, uh, for his low pass filter and the, uh, and the students um, that, that have helped out. Um, and of course, it's, it's, uh, there's lots of open source hardware and software that we use. Uh, in the CubeSat Sim. And then finally, I want to thank you, the members of AMSAT, the board of AMSAT for your support of this project because it, we, we wouldn't be where we are today uh, without your continued support. So thank you. And, uh, and, and now we should, uh, now we can do some questions. Okay, uh, thank you very much for that update there, uh, Alan. Uh, with us now, we do have uh, Alan Johnston, KU2Y, Vice President of Educational Relations, as well as members of his team, David White, uh, WD6DRI, uh, Jim uh, McLaughlin, um, KI6ZUM, and Bernadette Lally. Um, I'm gonna turn the floor over to, to you, Alan. Okay, thank you very much, Paul. Uh, so, oops, didn't mean to do that right away here. Uh, let's switch to there. Okay, so so um, we've started our education hour here uh, here at the symposium, and um, looking to to get some good feedback from all of you on on what we've been working on and uh, and and what our what our plans are. Uh, so that presentation was the uh, was the CubeSat Sim and uh, education update. Um, and in a few minutes, I'm going to do a uh, do, do a little live demo of the uh, CubeSat Sim Lite, uh, and then we'll end with a uh, uh, with a with a video on uh, high altitude balloons in uh, in STEM education. Uh, as Paul mentioned, I have uh, have some some panelists here, so maybe we can just just quickly have uh, have each of the each of the panelists uh, introduce themselves uh, and and say what. Uh, you know what what their involvement is with um, with STEM education. Uh, so maybe maybe David, you'd you'd like to go first. Sure, I think I got to turn on. Is this working? We can hear you. All right, um, I'm David D6 DRI. I've uh, I guess I've been working with Alan on the CubeSat Sim for just a little less than three years now. It's been quite a fun project. Um, I'm involved with a group of mentors in San Diego uh, that mentor a local high school amateur radio club, along with Jim and, and several others, including Phil Karn. And uh, we thought that uh, the CubeSat simulator would be a great tool for um, continuing teaching um, STEM education. And um, I guess uh, maybe I'd turn it back to you, Alan, at this point. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, David. Uh, and um, Jim, you want to go next? Hey, thank you, Alan. Um, uh, like, like David said, I have been uh, working with the, the students at the high school and um, my involvement with the CubeSat Sim was uh, doing much of the printed circuit board work and um, looking forward to being able to do more with it. The students, we've finally had two weeks back in the classroom with the students after being off since March of last year. So we're hoping to do balloon launches and a bunch of other stuff. And uh, we understand we received the CubeSat Sim from you and that's gonna be introduced to the students probably as soon as next week. Excellent, thanks, Jim. Uh, Bernie? 
Hi, uh, my name is Bernie. I'm a computer science teacher. I'm teaching STEM and entrepreneurship, um, STEM innovation at my school in New York, Lawrence Woodmere Academy. Uh, my background is in um, high altitude balloon launches um, as a, a STEM project and uh, mainly based in England. Um, so I'm in New York now, but my experience has been in England mostly. So I'm working with Alan now on the CubeSat Sim project. Um, and we introduced to the students in the next few weeks or so. And we hope to have a couple of launches this year together. So I'm looking forward to that. Thanks, Alan. All right, thank you. All right, so we do have some questions uh, that are showing up. So thank you for those. Uh, let's see, Doug Phelps says, does the ground station have a kit? Um, so the ground station is really just the RTL SDR dongle. Um, and you could either plug that into your laptop and download the software or if you plug it into a Raspberry Pi, you could get the uh, Fox in the Box version three image, and that comes with all the software um, pre-installed. So that's a, that's a great option for getting the, uh, getting the ground station uh, up and running uh, uh, very quickly. Um, but there, there, there are instructions on the wiki page for, um, for building the ground station. Uh, let's see, uh, Craig, uh, Bledsoe says, if we build a CubeSat simulator configured as a student balloon launch and the payload is lost, quite likely here in Alaska, what is the approximate cost per payload? Um, so in terms of parts, you can build a full CubeSat simulator for about $200, uh, including all the solar panels and all that. Um, but if you were flying it as a, uh, as a uh, balloon payload, you might, you might dispense with, with many of those components. And so it might be might be less. Um, uh, David, I don't, I don't know if you want to comment on that. I know you have plans to to eventually fly one. Yeah, we're in the process of building one and putting it in a frame to fly. Um, we want to add a little bit to it for insulation so that uh, it has a little better thermal properties. And I believe um, part of this, um, uh, the redesign of the filters was because of Randy was testing this one that we were going to fly, and we had some problems with the RF output. Uh, we're close, but uh, not quite sure when we'll fly it. We did uh, fly a small balloon a couple of weeks ago from the school, uh, just to get the uh, students uh, to know a little bit about balloon flights. Uh, hopefully a little later in this semester, we'll be able to fly um, the CubeSat simulator. OK. Um... Question from Mike Parker. Is there anything we'd recommend for Christmas for a ninth grade grandson who's inclined towards science uh, working individually? So I, don't know, I think I'll throw that out to the, to the panel here, see if they have any suggestions. I mean, besides a CubeSat simulator, obviously. Uh, yeah, I mean, I guess, I guess if I were answering, um, I, I would say a, a Raspberry Pi, um, if, if they have interest in computers, a Raspberry Pi is, you, you can't possibly go wrong with a Raspberry Pi. Um, also, our Arduinos are great too. They're very, they're even simpler than a Raspberry Pi um, to, to use. So there, there's lots of, lots of great things with that. Alan, with the, uh, I'm sorry, go ahead. I was going to say there's a new Pico, uh, Raspberry Pi Pico. Uh, it's really easy to use. Um, you don't need a monitor. You can plug it into your laptop. They, they could get started building a ground station. Um, and you could decode other signals. It doesn't have to be from the CubeSat simulator. Um, potentially, if the ISS is transmitting, you could get some slow scan from the ISS. That might be a fun project. Yeah, you can decode I, local I, I, APRS packets, all kinds of things. Yeah, yeah. go ahead, Jim. Yeah, so I think, uh, Alan, I, uh, based on that, I think uh, a $25 RTL SDR is a good place to start because that goes in your Windows machine or your Mac or your Linux box. You can do all kinds of stuff with it. Um, the Pico is is interesting. I think it's becoming more relevant than the Arduino is now. It, it has uses many of the same tools for development. Um, I think that would be good. Um, and... Um, I think that, um, you know, just something that 
gets them listening more than anything else would would be would be really kind of interesting there's all kinds of things you can do beyond that like listening for the national weather service balloons or david said iss or some of the other msat things there's lots to listen to that you don't necessarily need big antenna arrays Very good. Uh, looks like there was a question from, from Nick Pooj. Uh, balloon, what gas are we using? When, uh, when we've been launching from the school, we've been using hydrogen. If we will launch off campus, we've been using helium. Hey, you guys are getting advanced. Yeah, the, the hydrogen is because mostly because of the cost and the fact that we are allowed to store it and use it on campus. If we launch off campus, we have to transport it ourselves and none of us want to transport hydrogen. <laughs> okay, let's see. Uh, oh, uh, Nick also asked, uh, have we produced lesson plans and classroom content? And. Uh, that, that is definitely on our, on our to-do list for next year. We, we did a lot of hardware and software development this year, and, and that's, that's definitely what we need next. I, I will make a comment to Nick listening to your presentation. Um, Jim and I have been involved with the high school students now for probably a little over 10 years, and we find that the high school students really don't have a lot of ideas of what they can actually do. And we have to help and guide them uh, quite a bit with their projects. Um, so some of the comments that you had about getting students involved are great, uh, but you run out of time in a semester very quickly. We we find that the students don't have a lot of hands-on experience with electronics or, or even sometimes hand tools. So you spend time teaching them to solder, teaching them how to... Um, read schematics and things and all this you get them up to speed and the semester's over and then a couple years they graduate so uh, it, it is tough working with high school students because they they have a lot of extracurricular activities um, and they don't have the experience that um, you know some of us had expected them to come in with I have to agree with Dave, it's the same thing that the class time is, is never long enough and they don't have the skill set, you know, they um, they have an interest, but it's, it takes a lot of time to bring them up to the speed where, you know, they're able to do things and, and think about things themselves. Yeah, so I agree with you, David. It, there's no solution. <laughs> it's just, you just have to work with it, really. <laughs> you do. And so uh, it's easy to bite off more than you can chew in, in, uh, in a semester. All right. Um, so Doug asks, are there software tools to debug some of the boards? I'm having problem with uh, INA 219 boards. Um, Doug, email me directly and I'll, and I'll, uh, I'll definitely help you out uh, with that. Uh, Doug Phelps Jr. says, can I use the FunCube dongle or an RSP SDR right now uh, with the ground station software? Um, the answer is, Yes, although you might need to modify the scripts a little bit. The, the, uh, the, the scripts um, assume that, uh, that it's an RTL SDR. Um, so you may need to just modify the scripts, but all the basic tools um, should, should work with the, um, uh, with the FunCube dongle. And for example, FoxTelem fully works with the FunCube dongle. So you should be good there. Um, Bidel Garby says, does the board set for sale in the AMSAT store right now have the original or the updated filter? Uh, so right now we've, uh, we, we, are, we are selling the 1.1 boards. So they have the updated uh, low pass filter uh, in them. Uh, let's see, uh, more questions here. Uh, oh, sounds like, sounds like uh, Doug Phelps Jr. has a comment on the previous question saying, saying Adafruit has project boxes that can be sent. This is back to the what's, what's good for uh, what's good for uh, someone to get going. Uh, and uh, uh, Jan, uh, PE0SAT, who's, uh, who's very active on, uh, on tracking and decoding satellite telemetry, uh, he uh, uh, points to uh, webSDR.org as a place you can go to just to listen uh, on a bunch of web SDRs. That's a, great, that's a great point. There are lots of SDRs 
uh, available today. You can listen in from all over the world. Uh, let's see. Um, Emmanuel Gresh says, what kind of permissions do you need to fly a balloon? Do you need insurance? Do you need permission from the FAA? Many thanks. Is that a yes or no answer? <laughs> um, when we fly from the school, we try to work with the students so that the students contact local ATC to find out what the rules are. While there's the FA, while there's the FAA 101 rules, which are kind of the general rules for flying balloons, it seems like every air traffic control center um, has their own twist on the rules, and so typically here in San Diego, they ask for a NOTAM to be um, filed before the flight, and then keeping in touch during the flight, before, during, and after the flight to activate, and then. Um, remove the NOTAM once the flight is done. David, I don't know if you've got anything else you wanted to comment. Uh, I really don't, Jim. That's basically it. I suggest you contact your local folks and, and see what they require. We've not had any issues with doing the NOTAM stuff. It was the no, same procedure it's... in England. You set up a NOTAM and you're in contact with them during before, during, and after the flight and then you just remove it. Uh, very good. So it's definitely a yes. Uh, see, Nick, Nick Pooj uh, says we plan to give them a starter kit, starter radio kit and radio. So I guess he's answering about the, about the comments before. So, so very good. Okay. Um, I think, I think we've answered all the questions and we've gone slightly over our five minutes here, but that's fine. This is good for, uh, good for questions here. Um, so um, why don't we move on to uh, the next, next item. I'm gonna do a, a short demo of the new CubeSat Sim Lite beta board. Um, and, uh, and then we'll have our final, uh, our final video on, uh, on uh, high altitude balloons, which we've already already been talking about. So, so I'm going to go ahead and, uh, and get started with that. Thank you for, for all the questions. Let's see. Okay. So uh, so this, this is going to be a short presentation on behalf of myself, Jim, and David on the new CubeSat Sim Lite. Um, and we're going to, do, um, going to do a live demo with it here once it gets going with a, with a web SDR. I'll just send the, uh, I'll just send the link to, um, uh, to the chat room there. Um, you can also get it off, off of the screen here. Uh, so this, this, uh, this web SDR will only work for the next, I don't know, 30 minutes or so. So if you're watching a recording of this, um, sorry, there won't, won't be anything there. So we've always had two versions of the, of the CubeSat SIM and now the, the main three board stack, uh, the, the full, full CubeSat simulator, right? With the 3D printed frame and the solar panels and everything um, that is uh, in, 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 its, uh, in its first release. Um, but we've also had had a smaller light version, and uh, and so this is this is the uh, CubeSat Sim light. Uh, so it's basically this is a Raspberry Pi Zero W. It also works with just a Raspberry Pi um, Zero, and it should also work with the new Zero Two. Although I haven't tested it yet, I'll, I'll let you know in about a week. Um, but it just it just plugs in on top. And, um, and that's basically the whole thing. It's just a single board um, and uh, we're, we're getting them uh, assembled for us. So they come fully assembled uh, with everything ready to go. Now, the, the uh, real CubeSat simulator course has sensors and batteries and solar panels and it's generating real, real telemetry. The light board doesn't have any of that. So it just generates simulated telemetry, which is kind of fun. And every time you reset it, every time you reboot it or, or change a setting, it, it actually generates all new um, parameters for that. 
Uh, so it's kind of fun. You start it up and you don't know whether it's going to be in eclipse or in sunlight. You don't know uh, what the battery voltage is going to be. It's, it's basically different every time, um, which is kind of fun. And it also transmits um, slow scan TV. Um, now it just does it with, uh, with stored images, but you can, you can add a, uh, a Pi camera, which costs about $10 and, uh, and plug it into the, uh, the Raspberry Pi. And if you do that, the software will detect it and it will, uh, and it will just automatically take a picture every 30 seconds and transmit that as, as SSTV. So that's kind of fun as well. And um, in addition, you can also, you know, you can enhance it. You can put it inside a frame. Um, this, is, this is one here that's in the 3D printed frame and it's got a USB uh, power pack. Um, and it also has the, uh, the uh, camera built in. So, so that's kind of, a, kind of a very low cost version for, for doing demos. All right, so let's, um, let's take a look here. Um, so I'm gonna switch to the, uh, to the web SDR here. Let's see, oh good. Looks like 13 of you have joined. That's great. I can see by the clients, uh-oh, looks, like <laughs> looks like we've hit 100% CPU. That's, that's a bit high for only 13 of you joining. Sorry about that. All right, well, we'll see how it works here. So, uh, so here I have the, the uh, CubeSat Sim Lite. And it comes with the uh, with the power cord and the uh, power supply. So I'm going to um, power it up. I'm going to plug it in. There's actually two uh, micro USB ports. I'm going to use this outer one. The the inner one is a proper USB port for 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 plugging things in. So so we we are ready to go here. Oh, that's interesting. Wow, that's uh, I. I don't think that's real. I think that's a, I think that's an artifact in the in the web SDR there. Uh, but anyway, hopefully we will. I don't know if you can see the Raspberry Pi LED is starting to blink. Um, also, I'm going to switch to the Raspberry Pi ground station here, and uh, and I'm going to run Open Web SDR there, and I'm going to click click right here, and hopefully we will. Uh, yeah, it looks like the green light is on, so that means we are powered up. And in a minute, the blue transmit light will turn on and we will start, uh, we will start transmitting. Let's see what we get. I don't know what this, there we go. All right, so that was its CWID. In this case, uh, I haven't configured this one. It just says AMSAT, but, um, but when you get yours, you can, uh, uh, you can configure it uh, with your own call sign. So that is now transmitting. This is the uh, uh, data under voice uh, rumbling uh, that you might, might have heard on some of the AMSAT uh, uh, CubeSats. So I'm gonna switch to FoxTelem here and just verify that we are, that we are getting data out of it. Uh, so so th this, this is the, uh, the, the, the Fox in the Box version three image here. And uh, it basically has everything, everything you need to decode the um, CubeSat simulator in all its different modes. Okay, so now we're running here. Uh, you can see here is, here's the signal. Uh, it's getting a decent signal. The eye diagram, it's the eye is nice and open. Um, it's showing eight, nine dB of signal to noise ratio. So that's good. And the signal here is, um, is, good, uh, is a good digital signal. And if I click on the FSK tab here, you see here it says simulated telemetry on. So that's telling you that this is not real telemetry. Um, you can also force the, the, the real CubeSat simulator. You can also put that into simulated mode too, which can be good for demos when you don't have it on its, um, on its turntable or you don't have an LED lamp. Um, you can also put that into simulated mode manually too. Um, so if we look here, we can see various things. I don't know, maybe I can add a look at a couple of voltages. Oh, here we go. So, uh, so this is the current here. Uh, so it's it's simulating a, a CubeSat spinning in space, so that uh, so that as the different panels face the sun, you get a peak uh, of um, of current, and we can also do the same thing with uh, with the with the voltages here if if we uh, if we added those in. So now I'm going to change modes here, um, and it has uh, the CubeSat simulator light. It actually has two push buttons. The CubeSat sim has one. But to keep the cost down, we use two separate push buttons. This one by the blue one is used to turn it on. 
uh, but this one over here by the green light is used to change mode. So I'm gonna hold it down until it blinks uh, three times. So let me do that. One, two, three, and then I release it. And so now it's gonna change modes uh, and it's gonna switch to the, uh, to the BPSK mode. And if you're listening, you'll hear, you'll hear a different sound uh, on, the, uh, on the web SDR. How is the web SDR doing? Yeah, that's definitely acting a little strange. <laughs> Those horizontal lines, it's probably because the CPU is at 100% there. So. so that's interesting. I'll have to investigate the logs to see what, uh, what went on there. All right, so we're just, here we go, CWID again. And now I'm gonna switch modes to BPSK Fox Husky and say start. And now when it starts up, um, it'll, uh, it'll be doing uh, binary phase shift keying. And um, it takes about 30 seconds for it to, to do here. One thing we'll look at right here, I don't know if you can see there, there we go. That's the beautiful sound of, uh, of BPSK. Actually, BPSK should be, should be USB demodulated, um, not FM demodulated. So that doesn't quite, quite sound right. Um, but if you look here, this little component here, uh, called Rain Sun. That's actually uh, a chip antenna. And uh, I'm going to turn that down because it's a little annoying. Um, the, uh, we use that because basically to keep costs down because uh, there is a footprint. So you can put an SMA connector on there if you want and add your own antenna. But uh, in this case, the SMA connector would actually cost the same amount as the rest of the board. So to keep costs down, we just put a little chip antenna. It's actually a dipole and it's actually directional too, which is kind of fun. It definitely transmits along the axis here. So you can see a, you can see a signal difference um, as you move it. So let's just verify we're getting a few packets there. Uh, yep, we're, we're, we're definitely getting some packets. You can see the, uh, uh, hopefully see the voltage there change. Okay, so I'm just gonna demo one more thing. Uh, which is going to be the slow scan TV. So I'm going to hold the button here and release after uh, four flashes. Okay, that was four flashes. And so now I'm going to switch to um, uh, SSTV decoding. And um, Jim mentioned earlier, uh, sorry, David mentioned earlier, I think, um, that, uh, that you can receive signals, for example, from the ISS. And um, so the, this script is actually set up so you can select the frequency based on whether you're trying to get a slow scan image from the ISS, the CubeSat SIM or, uh, or something else. So I'm gonna select the CubeSat SIM here. And, uh, and then this should, uh, this should transmit a, a slow scan uh, TV image. So this is running uh, Q, QSS TV. There we go. So this is um, Scotty 2 uh, is, is the uh, framing. Uh, the ISS uses um, PD120, but um, QSS TV has an auto mode so that it'll actually work, work with either. It's actually not decoding. It could be slightly off frequency. Interesting. All right, I'm just gonna reboot it here and do that. Um, there's also an APRS mode. Um, but, uh, but I don't, don't really have time to, uh, to show that. So I'm going to switch back to my slides here. And again, this, this, I'll, I'll just leave it running and I'll change mode every now and then over the next 20 minutes. So if the, if the web SDR wasn't working, um, you can, you can try it again. Um, so this is some of the simulated telemetry. This shows two different runs and you can see the, 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 the orbital period, the time between illumination and, uh, and, uh, and eclipse changes, the amplitude changes, um, those, the battery voltage changes um, each time you run it, um, which is fun. And I already mentioned the Fox in a Box uh, version three, uh, which you can get today. You can either download it using the link here um, from, from Burns' website, or you can, uh, you can buy the SD card with it already on there on the uh, AMSAT store. Okay, so, so the, uh, the CubeSat simulator light boards are, are uh, here. 
and they are actually they are actually um, on the AMSAT store right now. Let's just check on that. And if I hit reload here, except uh, Zoom has taken over my screen. Ah, okay. So they, they are still showing out of stock, but I'm sure Bruce will take care of this. Um, the, uh, that, that we do have a limited number of them that will be, that will be available. Um, and um, eventually we will, we will get more of them on the, uh, uh, on the AMSAT store as we have them, but they are still beta. So it's, it's only going to be, uh, to be periodic. Okay, um, so I'm going to end this part of the presentation here. All right. Um, so, Paul, how how are we doing with uh, with time here? Yep, we got. Uh, let's see, you have until uh, two fifteen central, so we still have about uh, we have plenty of time. Uh, oh, okay, twenty four minutes. So twenty. Yeah. Oh, excellent. Okay. All right. Um, so yeah. So it looks like there are a few questions. So yeah, so let's, uh, let's, let's get the panel on here. Uh, so um, uh, Pat, Pat Kilroy, N8PK, uh, says in the USA for flying unmanned free balloons, refer to part 101. Okay, so he's, he's referencing the, the, the official rules for those of you interested in high altitude ballooning. So thank you for that, Pat, and, uh, and thanks for all your uh, contributions to this project. Uh, Doug Phelps Jr. says, uh, where can I buy a CubeSat um, frame? Um, so if you mean the CubeSat simulator frame, which is basically these, these four parts here, um, the, the, the uh, STL files are on a site called Thingiverse. Um, and uh, you, can, you can download them for free there. there there's also a link at, the, at our website. Um, and then any, any 3D printer will, will print them for you, whether you've got one at your school or library or your local maker space. Um, you can also, it is also possible, there are sites out there that will, that will um, you basically give them the STL files and they will print one and, uh, and send it to you. Um, so there is a link in the wiki instructions. So if you don't have access to a 3D printer, um, you can get them printed. I, I can't remember how much. It might have been like twenty or twenty-five dollars, including shipping, um, if if you don't have it. So so that's about the cheapest. If you're talking about a real CubeSat frame, then someone else would need to would need to answer that. Uh, let's see. Um, Pete Spinelli says, "Is there a weatherproof box for the CubeSat sim?" Uh, so, yeah, nothing, nothing weatherproof. I mean, it's it's uh, it's really designed for the classroom, um, but of course, you can put it in any any type of enclosure, um, and uh, and if and as long as you uh, as long as you did watertight connections for the antenna and the uh, uh, and the and the um, solar panels, uh, I, I think that would be fine. Um, one day. Uh, as part of the uh, as part of the KidSat and the BuzzSat um, youth initiative that uh, that Frank is working on, um, we may have uh, weatherproof ones. Um, we, we may have an official design for that, but currently we don't. But if you want to if you want to work on that and share it with us, um, that would be great. Uh, yeah, and, and and Bernie says a styrofoam box and wrap in tape. Yeah. The, Okay, that's coming from an experienced ballooner. That's that's how they uh, that, that that's how they package everything. Capton tape. A <laughs> Capton. There you go. Yeah, gotta have the gotta have the right tape. Okay. Let's see if there's other other questions. Oh, here we go. Um, Doug says, "What is the availability of the next gen CubeSat sim for the Pi Zero?" Um, so are you, are you asking about the, about the new Pi Zero 2 boards that were just announced um, this week? Um, so uh, the, the, uh, I, I have not tested it yet. I have mine ordered. Um, I, I, won't, I won't get it for, uh, for another week or so. 
Um, but I'm pretty sure that it's that, that it will work. Uh, in which case, in which case, you could substitute um, instead of the pi zero w, you could just use the pi zero two, uh, and just have a little more a little more horsepower there. Um, but I, I do need to verify it. Sometimes the the R pi tx library um, is is definitely hardware dependent, um, and so there there could possibly be some changes. So I do need to verify that before um, uh, before that's uh, before that's confirmed. But I, I do expect that the uh, that the new pi zero two. Now everything works fine with the with the regular pi zero, um, but we're you know, we're, we're kind of like right on the edge. I had to play some games with the software to get everything to run. Uh, and of course you, you, you can't run anything else in the background. Uh, with this new Pi Zero 2, it's basically the same horsepower as the old Pi 3. So it should, it should have a lot of, uh, a lot of spare um, horsepower there. So, um, so, for, so for $5 more, um, it, it'll be a lot more processing power and it'll be great for us. We can, we can add many more um, future telemetry modes um, with that. Okay, let's see other uh, questions. Uh, yep, so, so Pat is uh, uh, also uh, saying that a weatherproof box with styrofoam box works one inch wall thickness for high altitude flights. Yep. Okay. So I think think we've come to the end of the questions there. So maybe uh, maybe now's a good time to uh, uh, to do the final uh, the final video. Ellen, I think we did have a, a giveaway of the uh, oh the giveaway the, yeah yes yeah I, so I have it um, I have it all boxed up here and uh, and ready to go. Um, so so yeah, Frank just needs to. Uh, needs to find who the, uh, who the lucky owner that's going to be. Yeah, the good news here is even if you've won before, you're still eligible for, for this prize. Okay, so let me choose this. Let me go back. And Paul, I don't know why the screen, the wheel is not showing up. Wheel is Even, showing up on the screen. It won't, it, you won't see the spin, the frame rate of the screen share is too low, but go okay. ahead and spin it. Okay, here we go. Peter Spinelli, November 4, Yankee Oscar Tango is the big winner. A great prize after a, a cap off a great presentation. All right, and uh, here, I'll just share this quickly here. So they are, uh, they are in stock in the, uh, in the AMSAT store right now. So, so if you didn't win, then uh, there's your chance. All right, and I will, uh, thanks Alan, and thanks Frank for doing that, the uh, giveaway. Uh, another one where the person, uh, person asking a question gets the, uh, wins the prize, uh, uncanny. Um, all right, I will uh, go ahead and get that video, that final video for you started, Alan. I'm Alan Johnson, KU2Y. I'm AMSAT's Vice President for Educational Relations. And I'm also an Associate Teaching Professor at Villanova University. So this presentation is on using high altitude balloons in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics education. And uh, I'm presenting this on behalf of my co-authors, uh, David White, WD6DRI, Jim McLaughlin, KI6ZUM, 
and Bernadette Lolly, who is a computer science teacher at Lawrence Woodmere Academy. So I just want to first say uh, that the reason we're talking about high altitude balloons uh, here is uh, that there's a renewed focus at AMSAT and, uh, and among some of us on using high altitude balloons um, in, in STEM education. Now, I'm no expert in, uh, in, in uh, high altitude balloons. I only have one, one under my belt, but it's, it's enough to, to really get me excited about this. Uh, I've, I really enjoyed it myself, and I really saw uh, how the experience uh, affected the, the students. Um, now, David, Jim, and Bernadette, they have many, many more launches and are much more knowledgeable than me. Um, but anyway, hopefully they will be, uh, they will be live uh, on the panel here uh, so that when the, when the hard questions come in, uh, they can answer them. But anyway, it's a, it's a privilege to be presenting this paper uh, on, on behalf of them today. So what is a, a HAB, a high altitude balloon? Um, it's also known as a weather balloon. And it's basically a way of, of getting, uh, getting payloads, getting sensors, instruments um, into the Earth's upper atmosphere. And, uh, and, and as we're going to talk about today, it's a, it's a great way of, um, of getting students excited about uh, science, technology, engineering, and math, so-called STEM education. Uh, so uh, high-altitude balloons, they can, they can reach altitudes as high as 40,000 meters or 130,000 feet, which is basically the edge, edge of space. And you can gather interesting data. You can take fantastic pictures. And uh, I would recommend uh, uh, reading a recent article uh, in the July-August 2021 AMSAT Journal by Bill Brown, WB8ELK. It's called Amateur Radio High Altitude Ballooning, and it's a great summary um, of this topic um, with regular balloons. And also, he also talks about Pico balloons. Um, the Pico balloon, you can potentially uh, fly it around the world even multiple times, which is pretty amazing. Um, so, so that's what, that's what a high altitude balloon is. Um, and, um, uh, you know, what, what are we talking about when we're talking about STEM payloads? Um, so it could be something as simple as an APRS tracker, right? Automatic packet reporting system. Um, so that, so that you can, uh, track the balloon's altitude and flight path in real time. And there's a number of websites that, that link in with the, with the worldwide APRS network and just automatically display it, um, HabHub and uh, APRS.FI and, and others are just, they're just fantastic. Um, and you can fly all kinds of interesting sensors and cameras. Um, some very typical ones are things, things like pressure, temperature, and altitude. And if you look at the figure on the left there, uh, from Wikipedia there, shows uh, the, um, how temperature and pressure change with, uh, with, with altitude. Um, it shows the uh, altitude in, uh, in, in kilometers there, starting, uh, you know, at ground level, going through the troposphere um, and all the way up into the, uh, in, into the, into the stratosphere um, and, and higher. Uh, so you can, you can gather this data and, uh, and, and actually see, see what it looks like. And you can fly all kinds of other sensors. Sensors these days are really cheap. It's really easy to interface them to an Arduino and either just store the data and recover it later or include it in your, in your telemetry and, and track it live. So radiation, visible light, ultraviolet, infrared, voltage and current, uh, magnetometers. There's just, just all kinds of things that you can do. Um, and of course, uh, amateur radio um, can, can play a great role in high altitude ballooning um, through, the, uh, through the RF transmitters whether it's just APRS uh, and utilizing the APRS network, or some of us are also experimenting with, with LoRa, uh, which is a long range uh, internet of things um, uh, uh, modulation scheme. Um, LoRa, unfortunately, it's closed and proprietary. Um, it's, it's, not, it's not free and open like, like we would like it, um, but it has some great properties in terms of traveling long distances uh, and a great trade off between bit rate and, uh, and, and distance. People have done some remarkable things with, with LoRa on, uh, on, on balloons. Um, I'm also hopeful that we can have an alternative to LoRa um, so, that, so that we can, we can use something that's, uh, that is open uh, in the future. 
Um, and th there are some global networks right now. There's one called the Things Network um, that is uh, primarily for Internet of Things devices, but in theory could be useful for high altitude balloons. And also uh, Tiny GS, the, the, uh, the sort of SatNogs version for LoRa satellites. Uh, they, they pick up packets um, all over the world, which is kind of fun. Uh, I, I have one that I operate um, periodically. Um, and of course, the other, the other thing with uh, tie in with ham radio uh, is antennas. So some of them could be like transmit antennas, for example, a J pole uh, can be a great choice. Um, because it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's omnidirectional, and it doesn't require a ground plane, um, since you're way, way above the ground on a balloon, um, or antennas on the ground for tracking uh and and picking up data so antennas with gains such as such as yaggies and being able to build them as uh, tape measure yaggies is a great great activity for students uh so i think high altitude balloons also have a relation to cubesats uh, which are which are um, which are also being widely used for stem education in uh, universities and high schools too in that uh, a balloon mission can be a precursor to a space mission um, so it can be a low cost activity, short time frame, you know, months instead of years. And, uh, but it still has many of the same elements. You can learn a lot of lessons, uh, really get your team going. Um, also, I think that the CubeSat simulator can also be used in this context too, to kind of bridge the gap between high altitude balloons and CubeSats and give you something that you can work on um, uh, basically in, in the classroom. Right, so before you actually put it up on the balloon, um, and uh, and you can use things like the uh, like the stem payload board, and uh, so this stem payload board here here's an example of one that's that that's built here. That's one of the three boards in the CubeSat sim, um, and uh, you know potentially it could be useful in high altitude balloons. Some of us have have flown them already. Um, it has a microcontroller here in red. Um, and then it's got sensors, the, the three axis gyro IMU, and also the um, pressure, temperature, humidity, uh, altitude sensor there. Um, and then it interfaces over the, uh, over the GPIO. So, so it could potentially be, be a, good, uh, uh, a, a good thing to use. All right, so I'm going to go through some, some photos here just to give you a flavor of what these are like. I'm, I'm sure many of you have done high altitude balloons, but Maybe some of you haven't, and maybe this will get you get you excited and get you involved in in a in a local school or or group. So the first one is the Mount Carmel High School in uh, in San Diego, California, where Jim and David are are key mentors there, and they've uh, shared these these photos here. Um, so that's actually uh, Jim and uh, and Jim and David's uh, daughters there at the high school uh, doing a uh, doing a, a balloon launch. And then here is a photo of it uh, uh, as it's uh, ascending. Uh, you can see the Pacific Pacific Ocean in the background there. Um, and then here it is. Uh, here it is uh, having landed and recovering it uh, from a remote area. In this case, the Anza Borrego Desert um, State Park. There you can see the the balloon. Pay, the um, parachute, the payload, and the radar reflector there. Uh, so I'll just share a couple from my own experience. As I said, my, my one uh, high altitude balloon launch from the Villanova University uh, CubeSat Club. So on the left there is our balloon just before we, we, we launch. And again, you can see the parachute in orange, the radar reflector, and the, uh, and, and the actual uh, payload. We, we flew a, um, a GPS tracker um and uh and also a, a lora payload as well and you can see the track there as it flew from uh, suburban philadelphia to its uh, landing in a very high tree in new jersey but but we did manage to recover uh, and then finally i got some great photos from bernadette of some of her high altitude balloon flights in england where apparently um you have to get a a special license to 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 launch amateur radio uh, up into up into the air, but she was involved with with some groups that um, that have done that, and there's some great uh, some great photos of hers here. So here is uh, here is basically getting ready. This was a launch um, in uh, Cambridge, 
they, they look pretty pretty organized to me. Um, you can identify some things like here's the here's the bottles filled with water for measuring the neck lift, so you know how much helium is going in. Various payloads. Um, here's another uh, example. This is a, a, a micro bit um, board, um, and then uh, and then there's also a, a Raspberry Pi uh, inside the payload box there. Uh, really, really neat, neat taping job there, I must say. Um, and then this one is uh, students from St. John Henry Newman School in Stevenage. And uh, you can see a bunch of sensors mounted on the outside there um, for, for measuring different things, uh, ultraviolet, temperature, um, pressure, and then also taking photos uh, on, on the Raspberry Pi. And then here's some of the uh, applications um, that, that, that she used. On the left is habhub.org. So that's showing the live tracking feed. You can see it gives you this nice little icon here. These are some applications for chasing and tracking. And then finally, this was them uh, recovering, basically using Google Maps to, to uh, drive to the X and, uh, and, and recover their um, payload. Uh, and then this one here, this also shows another Raspberry Pi um, payload uh, with, with uh, micro bit sensors and a camera. Um, you can also see the two battery packs there. They're actually uh, lithium um, uh, power packs. So, so simple, uh, low cost. And then finally ending here with, a, with an amazing image from near space there. So this is taken with the Raspberry Pi Noir camera, which is, the, which is their CCD camera with no infrared filter. That's what Noir stands for. And, uh, and so it, 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 uh, it incorporates visible and infrared light there. So great shot of looks like water and clouds and, uh, and, and the blackness of space there. So terrific pictures. Thank you for sharing those. Uh, so there's a lot of detail in the, uh, in the paper, which I'd encourage you uh, to read, including various opportunities for what you can teach, what students can learn uh, in STEM from high altitude ballooning. And this is just a, just a partial list. Um, so anyway, the, the article also has some lessons learned, some, uh, some very practical things for having a successful uh, balloon flight. Uh, there's a photo of our balloon at Villanova as it, uh, as it ascended. Um, so I, I recommend you reading the paper, the, uh, paper for those. And um, you know, hopefully we've convinced you that, that uh, high altitude ballooning and amateur radio are just a great tool for generating interest in students uh, in, in STEM. And um, I'm really interested in your feedback as AMSAT members as to what additional things AMSAT should do with high altitude ballooning. You know, what are some events? What are some, what, what are some things that we can do uh, to, to, to generate interest in this and, uh, and, and get students excited about STEM, about amateur radio, and ultimately um, about space. So, um, so thank you very much. Uh, there's also an appendix here listing some, some great links for uh, amateur radio and, uh, and uh, STEM. And uh, now we should be able to take some questions. Okay. So, uh, so I think we are almost out of time, but we could probably squeeze in a question or two. Uh, I don't see any, I don't see any new ones listed there though. So maybe I'll just take this uh, opportunity to, um, um, yeah. Oh, and yeah, there are a couple of questions, I think, uh, on the Q&A. Oh, hold on. Yeah. And there's also a question in the chat as well. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, there we go. Um, I see it now. I was missing it there. Uh, so Burns Fisher, uh, WB1FJ, who uh, runs the Fox in the Box project, uh, he says his clubs have experiences that the battery stop working low temperature at around 90,000 feet. I don't know if any of the panelists have a comment on that. We only ever fly the Energizer lithium batteries. We've had no difficulty with them and we have had trouble with doing things like a lithium ion or other rechargeable battery. 
And so from that perspective, we just don't, if it ain't broke, don't fix it now. Um, and the weather service launches, what is it? 2,800 worldwide balloons every day and they're all flying with lithium, the same energizer lithiums. Yeah, same here. We do energizer lithiums, but then uh, I do do the um, rechargeable batteries. I've never had a problem with them. Um, I always have a few of those in, in the payload as well. All right, um, let's see. Uh, uh, Emmanuel Gresh says, would you suggest telemetry on the two meter or 70 centimeter band? 70 centimeter is a smaller antenna. I would assume circular polarization for best reception since the balloon would probably be spinning. Um, well, it depends on what your ground stations are doing. In the case of APRS, you've kind of limited to your two meter. I mean, we have plans to do some 70 centimeter of APRS, but that still requires us to have our own ground stations. Um, Alan, do you happen to have a picture of the, a close up picture that you can share of the antenna that we use, the J pole, the twin lead J pole? Which is, um, which is a dual band antenna. It's a dual band J pole that we have been flying. So we can do both two meters and 70 centimeters. Yeah, and we like the antenna because of the of the pattern that is generated from it. It's pretty solid all the way around because it's treated as as a single pole on the way down. Um, and because we've been flying them upside down, the um, the liftoff angle is actually up, but we fly it upside down, so we get a liftoff angle that's down that helps point more towards the ground stations. Yeah, I'm just looking here to see if I can find the... Yeah, we've been building our own of these antennas more recently, but in the past, we just bought them from a ham on, on uh, eBay. They're just like $22 or something each. Yeah, I've, I've built them out of that, you know, that 600 ohm twin lead um, that we used to use for UHF antennas on television. Uh, yeah, I, I can't seem to find the picture for that. Okay. That's okay. But we can, if anybody gets a hold of us afterwards, we can send links. Uh, so here's a question from, uh, from Will Marchant. How many of these balloons end up as trash? Do we need to form a policy for making balloons and payloads biodegradable and safe for animals? Um, at one point, I think we saw something like people would find 20% of the weather balloons from the weather service. That's when they wanted them shipped back. Um, they don't need them shipped back. So they just want you to dispose of them. Um, we have had then some interesting discussions along this line about what do you do about the recycling and, and when they're, or, 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 um, or, or, or how, how you deal with the issue of having them end up where you don't get them recovered. And while the latex balloon does break down pretty quickly in the, in the uh, ultraviolet light, the foam and the electronics don't. And I don't know how to, I don't have a good answer for how to do that for the electronics. We try to recover every one we launch. Same with us in, in Cambridge, we try to recover everyone we launch. And if we, if we think there's a risk that we won't be able to recover it, we don't launch. Yes, very much that, I agree. Uh, so John Clude of Aris says, uh, any experience using Whisper on round the world balloons, pluses and minuses? Uh, well, the long duration ones like um, Bill ELK's balloons, those are whisper based. So those are long range. Um, the, the latex ones, like what we call the pop and drop ones, others have flown whisper on them. We have not yet, but I have a payload sitting here ready to fly and we can start flying again. All I need to do is basically put batteries in it and we're ready to go. Uh, have, haven't you guys done a um, done a, a floating buoy in the in the Pacific? 
Uh, we have one floating buoy that is still going in the Pacific. It's about halfway to Hawaii, and it is also whisper-based. We've had a couple of other ones that the batteries have run out, and so those are, we don't know where they are now, but we have one that's still going. All right. Uh, Doug says, uh, I believe that STEM Hab gets much more involvement than SATs. They launch what they build, they retrieve it later, doing the analysis more real time for those with short attention spans. Very good balloon group in Colorado. So yeah, it's just like a mini, it's like a mini, a, a mini space mission, but, uh, but cheap and quick. Yep. Uh, Emmanuel Gresh says, thinking of a small turnstile. So I guess back to, back to antennas. Uh, do, do you need circular polarization? Uh, it depends on what you're transmitting, I think, more than anything else. We've discussed turnstiles and we flew kind of a modified turnstile on one flight for UHF and it worked pretty well. Um, so I think that payload's still in the classroom somewhere. Um, but for, a, for APRS, all the ground stations are mostly vertically polarized. So that's um, something to think about your ground stations. How are they? Right, and when we're trying to reuse as much as possible of existing ground station infrastructure. Okay, uh, Jim says flying a low power beacon transmitter as well as primary payload transmitter is a good fallback for battery failure at altitude. Agreed, two independent transmitters is a good idea. And uh, oh, uh, Phil Phil Karn says uh, uh, even lithium batteries suffer from cold, but not as much as others. Uh, the uh, RS forty one radio sons use two Energizer AA lithiums. Even inside styrofoam, the voltage drops to two and a half volts during flight and recovers to three after landing. We need to recognize Phil as part of our mentor group at our high school. Yeah, you have quite a you have quite a group out there. Uh, Mike Parker asks, "What percentage get lost?" From the ones we've launched, we have got every single one back. Some take two or three years to get back. Eventually, somebody finds them. We've we've had a number end up in the Salton Sea, and that makes it much more difficult for recovery. We, we just, the one we launched two weeks ago was just recovered because someone called and, and I think Phil actually picked it up today. Okay. Uh, and I think Bernie said that they pretty much recovered theirs. So there you go. Um, Phil yeah. also says uh, they flew a, a successful round the world flight with Whisper from UCSD and that was uh, KK6UC. Uh, let's see what else. Oh, Phil also says uh, with antennas, radio sons use a simple quarter wave monopole with a 60 milliwatt FSK at 4,800 bits per second on 400 megahertz. And they're received easily at 100 kilometers plus with a ground plane. There is fading, however. Uh, let's see. And Pat had a few, uh, N8PK had a few. Comments, uh, CP flight antennas are not very practical for balloons. I guess he means circularly polarized. Uh, and uh, another comment from Phil saying, uh, yep, confirming that he, that he has, that he, that he recovered it. And uh, landed in someone's pasture. I think it got stomped on by an atom. Okay, so. <laughs> yeah, we've had one, uh land in a swamp the one we did in upstate new york and then we had one land on someone's roof uh just happened to be around christmas time so the kiddies in the house thought santa had arrived um and another one landed on a tree so <laughs> it all depends <laughs> our um if, if people know southern california our group has landed quite a few in the salton sea 
Oh, and I just see one uh, comment in the in the chat room there from uh, Donald Ferguson saying that they've used um, super caps, super capacitors uh, for for long flights uh, for uh, for the Pico balloons. He also says we had one return from Morocco through the State Department, second balloon to cross the Atlantic. So so well done. Okay, uh, Alan, I think uh, we're out of time here for uh, any further questions. So. Okay, well, thank, thanks everybody. And uh, thank you to the panelists for your, for your work on this. Thank you very much. All right, yep, thank you to all the participants. And it looks like the first round of CubeSat simulator lights have, uh, have indeed sold out. So look for a restock of those. I don't know what Alan uh, has planned for that. I know the component shortage um, makes it a little challenging. Yeah, we, we, we will get them on the store eventually, but I, at this point, I do not have a date. All right. Well, thank you very much for that update, Alan, and all the uh, excellent work that you're, you and your team are, are doing. Um, enjoy the rest of the day. Thanks, Paul. All right. Okay. Um, so at this point, uh, we, now have, uh, we now turn our attention to amateur radio on the International Space Station. So let me uh, get those uh, folks, Dave Taylor. Um, W8AAS and Frank Bauer um, into the uh, into the um, into the panel here. And we can let them uh, introduce uh, introduce uh, Eris. And we do have a couple of videos here. Uh, I don't know if they want me to play them, Dave, if you uh, I see you joined. You can just go ahead and play mine. Okay, sounds good. What we'll do. Good day, everyone. I'm Dave Taylor, W8AAS, AMSAT's U.S. Delegate to the ARIS International Working Group. Today I'll be reviewing what has happened with amateur radio on the International Space Station this past year and what we're working on for the future. Last December, ARIS reached a milestone, 20 years on the International Space Station. This slide is a very brief overview of our first two decades aboard ISS, Note the participation numbers taken from our regular reports to NASA. Over 1 million students have either talked to an astronaut, been involved in the educational activities associated with a contact, or watched a contact, either in person or remotely. ARIS conducted 65 contacts in fiscal year 2021, which is roughly the period since our last symposium. That's up from the previous year's 52 contacts, but down from a typical average of 80. The pandemic is still making things difficult for educators and ARIS, but the schools are learning to work with it. We did have a few planned contacts canceled at the last minute due to changes in the local COVID situation. More often, though, schools in that situation were able to switch over to a multi-point telebridge, thanks to good contingency plans. There were 16 contacts in the U.S. and three handled by the Canadian team, two in Canada and one in Chile. 62% were traditional contacts, directs, and a few telebridges. Both types have the students at a common location. The remaining 38% were multi-point telebridges with students at their homes or other separate locations. Last year I reported that several telebridge stations were out of service due to pandemic lockdowns. Currently only one station is unavailable. W5RRR at the Johnson Space Center is still closed to us. Last year, we introduced a multi-point telebridge to allow ARIS contacts to happen despite local quarantine or social distancing rules. COVID conditions vary around the world, so rather than force everyone to use the multi-point telebridge, we introduced a waiver process. Groups whose waiver request shows that they can safely hold a traditional direct or telebridge contact while obeying local regulations may do so. We've had to extend the waiver period several times as the pandemic continues. 
All Eris contacts are special in some way, but I found these to be of particular interest. We finally added Wyoming to our contact list this year. South Dakota is now the only U.S. state without an Eris contact. The area around Green Bank Observatory in West Virginia is a radio quiet zone. Not even cell phones are allowed, but they allowed the school next door to host a direct Eris contact. Several hams who work at the observatory ex assisted. The United States hosted its first Youth on the Air amateur radio camp at a former Voice of America transmitter site. If you've attended the Dayton Hamvention, you might have visited the site during their Hamvention open houses. This contact really impressed me. The deaf students at Mary Hare School concentrate more on verbal skills than sign language. They ask their questions in the usual way, then turned around to watch as Mark Van de Heij's answers were transcribed for them on a large projection screen. We already have interest in doing more of these. More schools are now live streaming their contact on the web, generally on a school website or the ARIS YouTube channel. Many make the live stream part of the educational activities, with students preparing special presentations to precede the contact. You can get announcements of upcoming contacts on the live stream URLs from ARIS Org, AMSET BB mailing list, and HAM news outlets. In addition to supporting schools as they host a contact, ARIS USA has been busy working on additional approaches to STEAM education. We look for opportunities to expand the number of students reached. Our ARIS Radio Experimenters Kit, containing a Raspberry Pi, software-defined radio, and associated electrical and radio lessons, is now in beta at a limited number of schools. Also, members of the ARIS team have been busier than usual making presentations, made possible because more events are being held virtually and are thus easier to attend. ARIS has many hardware projects either in work or under consideration. The interoperable radio system has been active in the Columbus module since last year, alternating between voice repeater and digipeater. We run each mode about a month at a time and make the switch at the end of an educational contact to use less crew time. We are still working on getting a second IORS in the Russian operating segment. The radio is in Russia and its multi-voltage power supply is complete and waiting for an opportunity for transfer to Russia. The pandemic has made it difficult both to arrange shipping and to discover if, if Roscosmos will require additional tests on their end before it launches. Because the Russian system has been delayed, ARIS is looking at getting one of our flight backup systems launched as an on-orbit spare to minimize recovery time if we have a failure with the current system. We have a prototype of the diplexer needed to add 1200 MHz receive capability in the Columbus module. The next step is pre-flight testing and paperwork. With the diplexer aboard ISS, we will have an experimental LV repeater capability. The HAM TV video transmitter has been repaired and is waiting to be shipped from Italy to the U.S. Before launch, we want to test it with a multi-voltage power supply, and NASA has some RF tests to perform. We're looking forward to having a video downlink again when launch becomes possible. However, because of the pandemic, we don't know when these events will occur. Here are a few of the potential additions to on-orbit hardware discussed at the ARIS International Meeting in June. None have been approved yet by the ARIS Technical Committee, but preliminary work is being done on some of them. The ARIS Pi project will develop a Raspberry Pi system to control the D710G radio. Access to the Pi via a NASA network might be possible, giving us ground control for mode changes, automated SSTV transmissions, and other operations. It could also be a platform for education experiments. The overlay generator is a small unit that would attach to the HAM TV video input and modify the incoming video stream. It will be able to overlay scrolling text messages on the video. It can also convert an HDMI signal into the NTSC needed by the transmitter, providing compatibility with NASA's new cameras. Preliminary plans for a new video system have expanded to become a multi-mode digital communications system along the lines of what we will need for operations beyond low Earth orbit. 
The antenna cable problem that took our new radio off the air earlier this year, when the Bartolomeo platform was installed on the Columbus module, remains a concern. The problem report is still under investigation by ESA and Airbus, and Eris is watching for developments. In the meantime, we're looking at what we can do to limit possible future impacts on our radio. Just mentioned our Eris International meeting. It was once again held in the virtual world. The meeting ran four days, for three hours each day, with delegates and volunteers from all regions of the world attending. As the agenda shows, presentations covered ERIS past, present, and future, with discussions on improvements to our operations, educational outcomes, and current and proposed hardware development. I've covered some of the operations and hardware topics already. Now I'll touch on some organizational issues. ERIS entered into some important discussions and signed two agreements this past year. First, our existing Space Act agreement with NASA was expiring and needed to be replaced. This agreement governs the relationship between ERIS and NASA, specifying the roles and responsibilities of each. Second, we reached a new partnership agreement with ISS National Labs, formerly called CASIS. This group manages utilization of ISS facilities in the U.S. operating segment. We've had a good relationship with them for many years, and this new agreement extends that into the future. Although not an agreement, ERIS was invited to make a presentation to members of the National Space Council, which exists to help the White House formulate space policy. We were able to introduce them to what ERIS and HAM Radio do to promote STEAM education, and we made some valuable contacts for the future. We've had spaceflight participants like Richard Garriott use our radios in the past. Today we're seeing many companies flying or planning to fly commercial crews to both ISS and their own facilities or vehicles. Eris is talking to as many of these companies as possible to encourage amateur radio as part of their endeavors. Hmm. Is it roving if you do it from Leo? ERIS 2.0 looks at expanding our educational range to make it less dependent on access to ISS crew. We will continue with current operations, providing access to astronauts and ISS-based signals for students and hams. We want to add educational access to lessons that can be done without scheduled crew time, such as remote control of robots via the ISS Digipeter, analysis of ISS telemetry sent via ham radio and viewed in a mission control style dashboard, electronics and radio lessons, and various types of imagery from space. While ERIS 2.0 looks outward, OPS 2.0 is looking inward at helping us do our job better or more easily. Some of this is already complete, such as getting the web domains ERIS.org and ERIS-USA.org. We've also created an ERIS-USA website for our region's needs and moved most of our email lists to ERIS-based servers. The remaining goals are very ambitious and will take longer. We're currently gathering requirements and looking at what will be needed to meet them. Having talked about the future of ERIS, I'd like to return to the early days. Tom Clark was instrumental in the development of amateur radio and human spaceflight with CEREX, the space shuttle program that led to ERIS. Frank Bauer has added a memoriam to Tom on the ERIS website with more details of Tom's contributions. Tom lived in Columbia, Maryland, as do I. While not a close friend of his, I had the privilege of occasionally spending time with him beyond the AMSAT and ERIS meetings we both attended. I miss him. To finish up, ERIS would like to thank these sponsors in the U.S. ERIS also extends its thanks to JVC Kenwood for providing the D710G radios and extensive engineering support to customize them to ERIS needs. Thanks also go to the generous donor donors shown here, and to those donors and volunteers among you who continue to help us introduce amateur radio and STEAM careers to students around the world. That's my update for this year. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Frank Bauer, KA3HDO. 
Dave Teal had just provided a very good overview of many of our ARIS activities this past year. For my presentation, I'm going to drill down in more depth on several ARIS key initiatives, particularly some of the educational in initiatives we have going on and a new strategic initiative that Dave described called ARIS 2.0. The ARIS program inspires, engages, and educates youth in STEAM, or science, technology, engineering, arts, and math, and encourages them to pursue STEAM careers. Our primary means of accomplishing this is through educational programs that lead up to a 10-minute contact with an astronaut on board the ISS via amateur radio. ARIS is also a strong proponent of lifelong learning. Our program's mantra is to inspire, explore, and experiment. We provide on-orbit capabilities and experiences that enable youth and radio amateurs to be inspired through the use of amateur radio and human spaceflight vehicles. We allow them to explore space by bringing the ISS into their schools and living rooms, and we provide opportunities for them to experiment with various facets of radio technology and sensor telemetry, and in the process, learn more about radio science, space communications, and ham radio. The amateur radio community have been on human spaceflight vehicles since Owen Garriott's flight in 1983. As a matter of fact, in two more years, we're gonna celebrate our 40th anniversary of operations on human spaceflight vehicles. And we've tracked uh, the space agencies as they moved from vehicle to vehicle, starting from the space shuttle and the shuttle amateur radio experiment to Mir, the precursor of the International Space Station, and then the International Space Station as ARIS. The ARIS program is celebrating several anniversaries. Starting in November 2020, we initiated our year-long 20th anniversary celebration of ARIS continuous operations on ISS. As a matter of fact, just a couple weeks after the first crew came on board, we were operational. And in December of 2000, we did our first school contact, the Burbank School, as shown on the right. Also, in just a few days, we're going to be celebrating our 25th anniversary as an ARIS team. As the uh, Holiday Inn sign shows, uh, we have been for 25 years working today for tomorrow. 25 years ago, we got a tremendous challenge from NASA. In 1996, Pam Mountjoy uh, said that if we really wanted to have a permanent station on ISS, we couldn't be disparate groups. We needed to combine our efforts around the world and have one voice to NASA and the space agencies on the development and operation of our ham radio systems and that only then would NASA agree to move forward. So they challenged us to convene a meeting at JSC, NASA Johnson Space Center, with the international amateur radio stakeholders attending. And actually, um, on November 4th and 5th, 1996, we conducted that meeting at Johnson Space Center with uh, amateur radio delegates from Canada, Europe, Japan, Russia, and USA. The result of that is the ARIS Working Group. So in just a few days, the ARIS team celebrates its 25th anniversary as a working group. The pictures shown here are some of the individuals that participated in that inaugural meeting. Some unfortunately have passed away. Others are a little older than that, but if you look closely, you can identify several individuals that you knew, you knew or you do know very well. Just uh, some of us are a little grayer than before. For nearly 25 years, ARIS has operated as a working group. That changed in May of 2020 when the ARIS USA team became a legal entity. ARIS USA now is a 501c3 nonprofit charitable organization. 
Our strategy is still to inspire, engage, and educate students in STEAM and to continue our strong ties with ARL, AMSAT, NASA, and ISS National Labs. But the important thing now is that we can sign agreements, we can solicit grants, and we can raise donations. And as a matter of fact, we now have two agreements in place, one with the ISS National Lab and a five-year agreement with NASA. We also have uh, new grants in place uh, since we last talked to you all, one with the National Science Foundation, which is led by the ISS National Lab called Student Mission Control, and a very recent one from ARDC called Student and Teacher Education via Radio Experimentation and Operations, or STEREO for short. We are also working on agreements and partnerships with several organizations, Morgan State University, Tuskegee Airmen Incorporated on youth engagement, and AIAA, or the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics. AIAA is an aerospace uh, uh, organization and we want to work with them to share their expert experiences with the era students on what it's like to be in aerospace. Since Aeris USA was formed about a year ago, we've installed five new senior leaders to provide more breadth and depth to our team. These leaders include Marty Shulman, November Victor III Hotel as Associate Director, Tom Henderson, Whiskey 9, Yankee Whiskey as Secretary, Jenna Dunham, Kilo Echo Zero, Alpha Oscar Alpha as the Director of Volunteer Resources, Randy Berger, Whiskey Alpha Zero Delta as the Director of Engineering, and Rita DeHart, Kilo Charlie 4, Romeo Mike Sierra as the Director of Public Engagement. In addition, Aeris USA have uh, two volunteer leadership positions still open and also other volunteer uh, functions across the organization where we need some help. So if you know of anybody or if you're interested in helping us in our leadership or in our functions, please let us know. So we talked about our new senior leaders, but this is the full leadership team and how we're constructed and our roles and responsibilities, if you will. Um, I'm the executive director. Marty is the associate director. Um, of course, we have our Aeris USA delegates, which include Rosalie White at the ARL and Dave Taylor from AMSAT. Uh, our program support um, with the ISS is uh, represented by Kenneth Ransom and Anna Guzman. Our secretaries, Tom Henderson, treasurer, Carol Jackson. Our director of volunteer resources is Jenna Dunham, director of education, Kathy Lamont, director of public engagement, Rita DeHart, director of engineering, Randy Berger. And we have two vacancies right now. Under the director of operations, Marty Schulman is in the acting position, and that's a vacant position. And we also are in need of a director of business development. Aris has three prime initiatives and they're all interrelated. The centerpiece of what we accomplish is STEAM education through image radio experiences on ISS. But to make these experiences happen, we need a team with solid expertise in spaceflight hardware development as well as in spaceflight operations. Together, this initiative triad makes Aeris STEAM education transform from a dream to reality. I find it amazing when I look at our outcomes after 21 years of continuous operations. You know, we do 60 to 120 schools a year. And since our, the beginnings, we've done over 1400 school contacts. And the thing that I'm most proud of are, is the tremendous volunteer support we get from uh, people all over the world that donate their time and their talent to make this program successful for our youth and for the image radio community around the world. As part of my presentation, I did want to give a quick shout out 
to the volunteer team that made the interoperable radio system a reality. This is our foundational system now on ISS. And actually, we're not done building them. We've built the eight of the 11 total units we wanted to produce. And so we're still in the construction and fabrication of these items. But as many of you know, the unit within the Columbus module has uh, been fully operational and has been doing a great job. So my thanks to all uh, that uh, made the interoperable radio system possible, both from a development perspective as well as from a financial perspective, because this was a very expensive endeavor, but it is a very high payoff system from an education and a ham radio perspective. I also want to give a quick status on the uh, hardware developments for the Lunar Initiative. In other words, the project called AREX or Amateur Radio Exploration. So we've been working with the Lunar Gateway as well as the Artemis program on potential payloads to be flown. Uh, we've uh, redesigned the system and we're calling it now Caviar, Communications, Audio, Visual and Imaging using Amateur Radio. This includes a crew cabin interface as shown in the center, as well as an external radio system with a fixed gain antenna as shown on the left. We are also working with uh, Kathy Sham, the uh, frequency coordinator at uh, NASA on lunar image radio frequency coordination. And um, it should be noted that um, this whole endeavor is going to uh, take some time to actually make happen on ISS. Our activities uh, occurred in fits and starts until we finally got manifested as part of, this, uh, as part of uh, the system. Actually, we were supposed to be on the US habitation module for space station. If you look at space station carefully, you'll see there is not one. So we got uh, aligned into the Russian um, FGB at the time and uh, were the first payload to fly. So, you know, right now, Gateway is uh, still going through some, some uh, development efforts, and we're working and following very closely on a monthly basis as to where they're at and where, when might be the right opportunity for ARIS to engage. In 2017, ARIS kicked off an initiative to enhance and expand our educational outcomes and opportunities through the ARIS USA Education Committee. And since that time, this committee has made tremendous progress. Now with uh, Kathy Lamont as the Director of Education, this team has led the proposal selection process. They've defined specific educational ambassadors that are helping guide and mentor teachers through their amateur radio contacts. And they're working with educators and NASA on lesson plans and many other things to enhance our educational outcomes. Also, they're working with us on this new initiative, which I'll talk about shortly, called ARIS 2.0. Two times a year, we issue a request for educational proposals from schools and informal educational institutions to host an ARIS contact with the ISS crew. Our fall proposal window is now open. As shown, it will close on November 24th. If you know of a worthy educational organization that would like to perform an ARIS contact, please direct them to the ARIS.org or ARIS-USA.org websites for more information. After a school's educational proposal has been approved for an ARIS contact, the school then spends the next three to six months doing pre-contact STEAM education. Some of the activities that they perform include ham radio technology demonstrations and interactions, working with radio and electronics kits, understanding space, space exploration and space research, physics, doing space art, and actually getting involved in satellite communications and understanding satellite orbits. I mentioned the use of radio and electronics kits in the education process. 
As a result, um, ARIS has developed a radio experimenters kit in conjunction with AMSAT's uh, uh, Vice President for Education, Alan Johnston. We're calling it the Space Pioneers Radio Kit Initiative, or SPARKY. This kit is focused on radio technology for elementary through high school students. It lets them learn all kinds of different electronics and communications concepts, including waves, wave propagation, circuits, codes and ciphers, and software-defined radio. In particular, uh, we have uh, ARIS Radio Pi, which is in prototype form, which uses an RTL-SDR dongle. It plugs into the Pi and it attaches to the provided antenna and provides the students an opportunity to investigate radio signals across the spectrum and to track and listen to satellites, including the space station. I would now like to focus on a new exciting ARIS education vision for the future, a program we call ARIS 2.0, Educating the Next Generation. ARIS 2.0 is an education strategy that will realize stronger, deeper, and more extensive educational outcomes than our current program. It will continue our core effort of enabling youth to talk to the ISS crew but will augment our educational initiatives with new in-space and ground-based systems and lesson plans. We will also leverage and augment our activities through new human spaceflight opportunities, such as the new commercial space stations and private astronauts in low Earth orbit, and work to fly our systems in deep space missions, such as the Lunar Gateway, Artemis, and Lunar Landers. Our intent is to make available education projects and experiments with diverse wireless capabilities. As can be expected, this initiative can only be accomplished through a tight integration of ARIS education, operations, and hardware development. In the next few slides, we'll discuss this initiative along with several efforts already underway to utilize the ARIS 2.0 vision. Some of these include the National Science Foundation Student Mission Control Project, the ARDC-sponsored STEREO Initiative, and the proposed STAR effort. The National Science Foundation Student Mission Control Project is the first ARIS 2.0 educational initiative that we'll discuss today. Student Mission Control, or SMC, is a joint project led by the ISS National Lab and co-supported by the University of Berkeley and ARIS. The ARIS contribution is an ARIS Pi student on orbit sensor system prototype. The objective of this project is to provide a series of creative, engaging ISS story themes using ISS real time or stored data. The SMC will employ data provided by ISS as well as data from the ARIS Pi sensor suite on board ISS. Students will mine, research, and manipulate this data just like a person in NASA's mission control facility would do. The idea is to take telemetry, which by itself may seem boring, and derive a story that is compelling for the students to engage in. This graphic shows the student on orbit sensor system concept of operations. Sensor measurements are fed into the ARIS Pi and then formatted for transmittal and then downlinked from the ISS. Ground stations around the world then capture the data and share it with ARIS via our student on orbit sensor system cloud server. This will then be sent autonomously to the SMC server at Berkeley for student use. Our second educational initiative is called STAR, or Space Telerobotics Using Amateur Radio. This is still an ARIS proposal that we hope to start up soon. The idea is to enhance and expand ARL's MARIA APRS robot control concept into a, an engaging telerobotics capability for youth. STAR will use APRS commands to remotely control a robot starting with a robot in the next room, 
then across town using digipeters, and ultimately by employing ISS as a relay. I am pleased to announce that our third educational initiative is now funded, thanks to a generous grant from ARDC. This initiative is called Student and Teacher Education via Radio Experimentation and Operations, or STEREO. This initiative will substantially improve our ARIS STEAM outcomes and will sustain our ARIS contact operations. STEREO consists of three primary initiatives that will be accomplished over the next five years. These include moving our wireless electronics experimenters kit, we call Sparky, from prototype to operational, and sending these kits to U.S. and international schools in advance of their ARIS contact. Number two is teaching the teacher. We, do the, we will do, be doing this through workshops and conference outreach. And the third is assuring ISS astronaut contacts through steady funding of these operations. All in all, we're really excited about this new initiative because it's going to be a game changer for ARIS and a game changer for education. As I mentioned previously, ARIS 2.0 can only be accomplished through the integration of education, hardware development, and operations. This chart shows how our hardware systems, when combined together, operationally can provide substantial different opportunities for the ham radio community, as well as for our youth and education. If we start in the middle, our foundational element of ARIS 2.0 is our interoperable radio system, which we launched last year. It provides opportunities for school contacts, voice repeater, APRS, and slow scan television, as well as contacts from the crew to ham radio operators on the ground when the crew is available. The other systems, which are all in yellow, are our next generation hardware augmentations. They include, starting with the ham TV, opportunities to have video downlinks, crew demonstrations, and crew experiments. Uh, our ARIS Pi that we're developing as part of the National Science Foundation grant will provide our uh, opportunities for slow scan up and down, radio commanding, downlink telemetry, soft software coding, and then a lot of different experimentation with uh, our hardware from Marcanista, which was a software defined radio, the STAR activity, the student mission control activity, and the stereo activity. We also on the far right are developing an L-band uplink, as Dave Taylor mentioned earlier. And um, in preparation for flying equipment to the moon, we will have a test bed which will demonstrate some of this activity on space station. This will provide an all digital system with multiple bands and modes, autonomous operation, operating it like a satellite with high speed telemetry, uh, all, uh, all different kinds of um, uh, downlinks, and also weak signal coding. All in all, this hardware system and the operations that go along with it will provide substantial opportunities for schools, the ham radio community, as well as anyone else that wants to listen in on our activities. And so going back to the triad uh, of hardware development on top, operations on the left, and education on the right, ARIS 2.0 will allow us to educate the next generation as well as provide lifelong learning to radio amateurs around the world and allow listeners, shortwave listeners, the opportunity to listen in with their software defined radios. So from an operations perspective, we'll be able to do command and data uplinks. We'll have multi-frequency, multi-mode operations and operations with distributed teams around the world. We'll also uh, be incorporating in 
our new Ops 2.0 IT tools to make uh, operations a seamless activity that can be done in remote locations, not just at the, Houston, uh, the Johnson Space Center in Houston. And then, as I said, education um, extended outcomes include the in-school and lifelong learning, engaging projects such as Stereo, the Student Mission Control, and STAR, and this will be available 24-7. And not only 24-7, but on multiple vehicles, space station, commercial space stations, and lunar vehicles. In other words, this is a total transformation of ARIS from where we are today to our future. We hope you enjoy this, um, this and, and are interested in helping us move from our current system and our current capabilities to ARIS 2.0. Anyone that has witnessed an ARIS contact understands the pure inspirational joy that emanates from these events. Over the years, ARIS has sparked the imagination of countless others to dream up new ways to convey the inspirational energy of astronaut ham radio space connections with students, whether in children's books, movies, documentaries, or television programs, these eras inspired literature and entertainment products further convey our STEAM education message and allow countless others to witness the fun and excitement of ham radio in space. I would like to take this opportunity to thank our ARIS USA sponsors whose help and support have allowed us to operate and sustain this program. In particular, I want to thank the NASA Space Communications and Navigation Organization, NASA SCAN, the ISS National Labs, ARDC, Amateur Radio Digital Communications, and our Amateur Radio Leadership, the American Radio Relay League, and AMSAT. All of these organizations provide real money contributions as well as in-kind support contributions. We thank you. And we would also like to recognize our major sponsors as shown here. I would especially like to recognize JVC Kenwood for their in-kind support of the D710GA radios and engineering modifications. That system is part of our foundational system that's part of Space Station. With that, I'd like to thank you all for uh, listening, but also to say that uh, I have one final item as part of my presentation, and that's a tribute to Tom Clark, which is next. My last few slides serve as a heiress and personal tribute to Tom Clark, K3IO, a dear friend and colleague. Tom was a pioneer and trailblazer in all that he did, and he left an indelible impression on human spaceflight amateur radio. As president of AMSAT at the time, he worked with senior leaders at ARL and NASA to set up agreements for Owen Garriott's inaugural flight on the space shuttle mission STS-9. Owen's flight paved the way for frequent flyer ham radio operations in the shuttle, international ham radio operations on the space station Mir, and of course our 21-year continuous operations on the ISS. Tom's technical and financial support to SARX and ARIS have been vital in moving these programs to new heights. Prior to his passing, Tom was also providing technical guidance in the development of lunar radio architectures that we were proposing for Lunar Gateway and other opportunities in and around the moon. Tom, Ron Paris, WA4SIR, and I all worked together at NASA Goddard. When Ron was selected as an astronaut for the Astro-1 astronomy mission, the three of us discussed ham radio on Ron's mission. This was in late 1984. Ron was originally planning to fly on a March 1986 mission, right after the Challenger mission. But when the initial ops plan for Ron's flight solidified, it was clear that Ron would have little time for general QSOs. Tom led a team of four of us, including Bob Berninga, WB4APR, 
to develop a plan to give back to the amateur radio community while Ron was preoccupied. What resulted were protocols and software for rapid message exchange via packet robot. And Bob, WB4APR's words, these discussions helped firm up ideas on how APRS could be used not only as a positioning tool, but also as a communications capability, allowing rapid status and message reporting, thus allowing lots of people to rapidly make exchanges during a brief satellite pass. The packet radio robot was used heavily in our SARX shuttle program, starting with Ron's STS-35 flight after the Challenger accident. APRS remains a staple in our ARIS onboard systems as well as image radio satellites around the world. I really treasured Tom's mentoring, advice, and support over the years. Tom and I worked on several GPS initiatives most notably the use of GPS above the constellation. I wanted to be able to use GPS as an onboard real-time navigation and timing sensor. Tom facilitated the manifest of the GPS experiment on AO40 that I led as a NASA principal investigator. This experiment rewrote the books of, on GPS use in space and we're now using GPS halfway to the moon and lunar landing experiments are being planned for 2023 all thanks to Tom. While I had worked with Tom since the early 1980s, my family really didn't get to know Tom and Elizabeth, his wife, very well until we started working with them on the many DC area AMSAT symposiums we supported. After Elizabeth's passing, Tom would go with us to various concerts. All of us treasured these events. And a tribute to Tom would not be complete without well, his interest in cars, photography, and music. Tom always enjoyed Bill Kirchin's rendition of Hot Rod Lincoln. Tom, my friend, thank you for all you've done for ARIS, NASA, AMSAT, and humanity. We will miss you, but I hope you enjoy your wonderful journey with Elizabeth amongst the stars. I guess at this point, uh, if there are any questions, I don't see any yet. Yeah, Frank, <clears throat> before we do that, I, Chet Ledwick oh, yes. had a letter I wanted to read. Please do. And uh, Paul, you're going to have to restart my video because you stopped it. <laughs> but in the meantime. There you go. OK, thanks. Uh, I had mentioned that Eris appoints Delegates to both the US and to Canada. Chet Ladewick, VE3CFK, couldn't be here today, but he sent me a short note that I can read to you all. This, this is his note. A year ago, we all had expressed our expectation of meeting in person for the 2021 AMSAT general meeting. Well, here we are, still meeting virtually. Sometimes our circumstances and progress did not move as quickly as we expect. And so has COVID-19 impacted ARIS activities in the Americas and the rest of the world. Over the past 12 months, only three ARIS contacts have been made in the Americas, North and South, excluding the USA. This is down from our average of about eight per year. All contacts during this past period have been conducted via multi-point telebridge to protect the students, teachers, and amateur radio operators from COVID-19. Although major progress has been made in vaccinations across Canada, we are still a long way away from vaccinating the majority of our citizens, according to our Canadian health experts, and hence a ways away from returning to pre-pandemic ARIS contacts. In addition to the Canadian ARIS contacts we have on our planning board, we also have a Chilean contact that is being developed. Additionally, we have a very interesting project in hand that will hopefully come to fruition. Axiom is scheduled to take the first Canadian private astronaut to the space station for a 10-day stay. Mark Pathy, 
an investor and philanthropist, will be Canada's 11th astronaut and will collaborate with both the Canadian Space Agency and Montreal's Children's Hospital during the mission. Pathy will take the role of mission specialist on the first ever entirely private mission to the International Space Station. He has agreed to conduct two ARIS contacts during his stay on the ISS. I want to thank AMSAT for their sponsorship of me as their Canadian delegate to ARIS International. It is both an honor and a privilege to hold this position. Hopefully next year we can meet in person. Respectfully, Chet Ladewick, VE3CFK. Okay, and with that, uh, Frank and I would be happy to answer any questions you folks have about Eris. Yeah, and Dave, uh, I'd like to add just a little bit about what um, uh, Chet said about the, the Axiom. I just want to make sure everybody understands. Uh, one of the things we are trying to do, this is still all preliminary. One of the things we need to do is to get these, there's, there's actually two astronauts on the Axiom flight that are interested in doing uh, Eris contacts. Um, but both of them need to get licensed. And um, we've actually, both of them have already gotten training on the radio system, but we're working with them to get them licensed. And that is a challenge. I'll say this late in the game, they're supposed to fly um, in, in the, February, in the early February timeframe. Exactly. So um, just so everyone does it, we don't get in front of it and say that this is going to happen. Uh, we still need to get them licensed. We are working very aggressively on that. And uh, we'll just see how that plays out. Um, the reason I bring that up is that um, when we went through this with Mir, our first couple flights, um, we had trouble getting the crew uh, licensed because of all of the things that were on their plate relative to all of their training. So this is new. Our relationship with Axiom is new. And so uh, we'll continue work in this, but uh, just um, this information is something that uh, we're excited about. It, it, it's, it's in line with our ARIS 2.0 initiative. Um, and we will get, well, we, we will make this happen. Um, we're just not totally sure it'll happen this, this go around. And I'm not trying to make it smaller than what it is, but I don't, I want to set level set the expectations. There's a question from Pat in the Q&A window. He says, can do you have that open there, Frank? Yeah, I got it now. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and just okay, for the so benefit Pat of the, yeah, just for the benefit of the stream, we'll want to read the question. Yeah. So, so Pat's asking, uh, are we reaching out to SpaceX and other similar organizations for partnerships? Or will we leave that to independent ham operators to fill the gap as during Mir? Now, now I don't understand that second part there, but uh, what I will say is we've been reaching out to all the organizations that make sense. Uh, SpaceX, uh, let me just say where we are relative to that. Um, to fly on one of their short-term missions is probably going to be a huge challenge. What we are trying to do is to work with the organizations, and I'm not saying we're not working with SpaceX, we are actually, but uh, we wanna work with the companies that are building these longer term space stations. Axiom is building a space station that will be attached to space, the International Space Station, but can be later detached and operated independently of the International Space Station. So our first objective was to start working with them. Now, if you watch the news in the past week, there's a couple other organizations, NanoRax as an example, and, and uh, Bezos' uh, Blue Origin that are built, gonna build space stations too. We're gonna start working with them uh, to do this. Now, relative to independent ham radio operators that, that Pat's bringing up, the reason I brought, I put in those slides about what happened on ISS, and, and what that was, was NASA's challenge to us to have one voice of amateur radio worldwide on, on human space, space flight amateur radio. They asked us to do that so that there isn't all of this disparate activities going on. And so um, we are hoping that the amateur radio team worldwide will work through the human space flight team that's working this in the various organizations in Eris USA, Eris Europe, and, and, and uh, all the others. 
So um, please reach out to them, uh, depending on what country you're living in. And uh, we will work our best uh, to, um, to, to work with these different companies. Uh, hopefully I answered that question. You're welcome, Pat. Uh, Pat says, thank you. I did also um, want to um, say something about what, uh, uh, I, I wanted to really um, reinforce, or enforce, or reinforce, I should say, what um, Alan Johnston's been doing, because it's been a very good partnership in education between what Alan has been working on uh, and what we just heard previous to Eris and what we've been working on with some of this radio kit stuff. I mean, basically we're working as a, as a, as a uh, team together on that. And then also say the same thing about Eric's, our image radio exploration activity is a combined AMSAT and Eris uh, activity. So Adam was asking about how does one go about volunteering for Eris? Uh, Dave Taylor is our AMSAT rep. He would be the start uh, or, or myself, but I would, I would uh, defer to Dave in that regard. So thank you for your interest on that. Uh, we really appreciate it. Now, if you can just contact either of us and we can pass it along to the appropriate people within ARIS. Mm -hmm. um, and then I just wanted to say one last thing. Um, you, you all saw that uh, ARDC now has come in and actually the little difference between Dave's sponsors and my sponsors is I added ARDC on the main page because the that happened after Dave did his recording. Um, is that uh, we just got this uh, this this new grant from ARDC? It's a five year activity, um, and and it's it's very exciting, and we're very happy and excited to work with them on, on, on moving our program forward and sustaining our operations and uh, and and allowing us to to bring some of these radio kits into a lot of different schools around the United States and around the world. All right, uh, thank you, Frank, and uh, thank you, Dave, for that uh, update on, on ARIS. Uh, thanks for everything you do. Uh, sure thing, for uh, Paul, and I again wanna thank AMSET for all of their sponsorship support um, over the years and even and this year and in the future. So thank you, Paul and Robert and the whole team. Certainly, uh, it's a very, very important effort. Uh, one of our uh, supporting human spaceflight activities is one of AMSAT's uh, a part of AMSAT's mission statement. So we are certainly interested in doing what we can to, uh, to support uh, ARIS and uh, all of your activities. Um, all right, well, I think uh, we have um, you know, run a bit over time, but it's not uh, too big of a deal. Uh, next thing we have is uh, another prize. Uh, Frank and one UW, are you around? I'm always here. Okay, and uh, our next prize uh, is uh, really uh, appropriate for everyone who would, uh, or for one lucky person anyway, who would like to make a toast to uh, uh, Tom Clark. Our next prize is uh, their choice of a, a drinkware, a beer stein, coffee mug, water bottle, tumbler, whatever the case may be, with customization. Uh, that's uh, the next prize from the, uh, from, the, uh, from the Zazzle store. So let's... Uh, Choose the screen here, share the sound, hit share, and I see the wheel anyway, and we'll give it a spin. Congratulations, uh, Tom Schusler, November 5, Hotel Yankee Papa. We'll uh, get the information off to you so you can get your uh, custom Zam uh, uh, Zazzle drinkware. All right. Uh, thank you, Frank, for that. And uh, for the winners of the uh, Zazzle prizes, I will be in contact to arrange the order and uh, any customization that's desired as well uh, on, those, uh, on those products. Um, all right, uh, and uh, just as a note, uh, I had meant, meant to mention this earlier, but uh, the, uh, for AMSAT members, the uh, 2021 symposium proceedings are now available 
uh, on the member portal under uh, member resources. I will, um, I will uh, post the link, the direct link into the, uh, into the uh, Zoom chat here so everybody can go to that. Um, so thank you um, very much. I am, uh, the next thing on our agenda is an AMSAT engineering update. Um, and that will be uh, with uh, AMSAT Vice President of Engineering, Jerry Buxton and Zero JY. And I'm working to get him into the, uh, uh, there we go, into the session now. For some reason, sometimes it takes a couple of clicks to get, uh, get somebody promoted to a panelist so they can present here in the webinar. So once Jerry is ready, I will uh, hand it over to him to, uh, uh, to take over. Are you ready, Jerry? You're still uh, muted and with no uh, no video yet. Uh, yeah, sorry. We're going camera uh, as, as well, right? Yep. Got it? Yes, uh, I see your screen and see you're ready to uh, begin a video. Well, Good afternoon. Welcome to the AMSAT Engineering Halloween Monster Chiller Horror Special. Everything very scary. Halloween, a good hollow, a good holiday. And I've got some video for you. First up, something called a brief mystery. I thought I would start with a brief history and how we got here. In 2009, then Vice President of Engineering, Tony Montero, introduced the Fox CubeSat. This was an important event for our satellite program and a big change in satellite designs. At four inches cubed, the volume of the Fox CubeSat was only about 7% that of AO51. And Fox would weigh in at 1.3 kilograms, just 11% of AO51's mass. The Fox CubeSat is about the size of a softball. The choice to go the CubeSat design was the way forward for AMSATs getting low cost or free launches. NASA had introduced a new program, the CubeSat Launch Initiative, that covers the cost of a launch for CubeSat projects that provided attributes matching the goals of NASA. Education is one of those goals, and AMSAT's key to being able to compete for launches. The Fox CubeSats provided invaluable information and learning in creating small space vehicles using COTS components and chips with little or no radiation shielding in the low Earth orbit environment. The experience gained was necessary for the future of low cost launch opportunities and the expanded complexity desired in future missions. With AMSAT's educational outreach being in common with NASA's goals in the CSLI program, the experiment hosting design of FOX turned out to be a very popular platform for student experiments and partnerships and wound up providing the opportunity for a total of five FOX-1 satellites to be added to the number of orbital satellites carrying amateur radio. All five were launched within a period of six years from October of 2015 through January of this year completing the FOX program in a little over a decade from its introduction. The FOX program is also directly responsible for attracting many new and veteran hams worldwide into amateur radio satellite activity, including students who worked on the STEM experiments flown on FOX that gained their amateur radio license as part of their work. 
The Fox One program also met one of the goals the AMSAT Board of Directors had drawn up in their 2017 strategy meeting in the design of the Fox One e-linear transponder. That is to provide our first amateur radio linear transponder module that is now available to educational partners to fly amateur radio on their own CubeSat missions. Ow! That was very scary, wasn't it? No, it wasn't. Who titled that? Brief history. Must have been somebody who got serious CHS. <laughs> Let's go with the next video about a fox tail. will reappear in the golf game later this hour. Jerry, your, um, your, your audio is not coming through the video. Uh, it's only coming through your mic. It's intended to be a one-off with the next missions taking on what would... Okay, say that again, please. Can you hear me? Can you hear me at all? Yes, yes, we can. It's uh, you're you're we're getting, having the same circumstance we did uh, when we tested this. Uh, the uh, audio is only coming through your mic, and we're getting the video doubled on your uh, on your camera input. Um, and the frame rate of the video is low too, so I, I'm not sure you're optimized for video and Zoom. I'm not sure that Zoom. I didn't know it had an optimization. So what do you suggest? I would um, I would go back. I would unshare your screen, reshare it. Make sure that you share audio and optimize for video in the uh, settings. And it worked so well last night, huh? <clears throat> Rich, should I reshare now? Uh, reshare. Do a reshare on the screen share. Go to, go to the screen share, and then you should see options for optimize for video and share audio or share sound. Ooh, yeah. Okay. I got that. So I will. Uh, yeah, we're seeing your whole desktop now. Starting. Which one? Uh, with your uh, timeline and messages and such. Really? Yep. Oh, Sorry, reshare the screen now. Oh, there we go. Sorry about that. Now you should see nothing. There we go. Back to the video. Well, I think, I don't know, Jerry. Jerry. 2011, it was decided go. to pursue a two-step Fox program, whereas the original designs for a single CubeSat were deemed too aggressive to implement while keeping risk tolerance within our acceptable range. <laughs> Make a note of this point, as it will reappear in the golf game later this hour. Fox 1, then, became the design that we see in Fox 1A through Fox 1E. It was originally intended to be a one-off, with the next missions taking on what was now Fox 2-type advances and more complex systems, including deployable solar panels. As it was, though, the platform quickly became an easy route to many Oscars, and the university partnerships and partnership offers were appearing, 
offering that educational component of a CSLI that would benefit all partners as well as AMSAT's educational component and the opportunity for a free launch to put up another Oscar. Vanderbilt ISD quickly joined us for another CSLI that was accepted and became FOX 1B. The intent for the FOX 1 program quickly grew after that to four satellites, and that was what I worked to achieve when FOX 1 was passed to me. As I became the new VPE, there was also excitement over the opportunities as well, and some concern over the longer time to orbit found in the CSLI program. The AMSAT Board of Directors found it an attractive price on a commercial launch that could put another CubeSat up sooner than the CSLI cycle and prioritizing, and after assuring them we could do anything, AMSAT contracted a launch through spaceflight. As it turned out, over a very short time, there were some unoccupied rooms on the Sherpa platform that allowed us to fly another CubeSat on the same launch at a good price. These satellites were the third and fourth Foxes, Fox-1C, before being renamed to Cliff, and Fox-1D. With the course laid out to fly four Fox-1, as we looked down the road to the completion of the fourth, we found that we had enough spare parts for another space frame and to cover one more satellite for many of the systems. With user input favoring a linear transponder, which was originally intended to be the type of radio on the FOX-2, our engineers were happy to pursue some new designs and have a fifth. Satellite, that is. Make another note, this one more time will also reappear in the golf game later this hour. Despite it being barely over a decade from the first designs to the final launch, all of the FOX-1 satellites were launched in a period of just over five years, between October 2015 and January 2021. In addition, the construction of the five satellites took about five years from the first FOX design discussions to the first completion, with completion meaning the date at which the satellite must be ready to fly and waiting for delivery and integration. After that completion of FOX-1A in 2015, it then took just over three years to complete the remaining four satellites. Yes, FOX-1E was even completed more than two and a half years before it launched. So while we waited, we decided to move on beyond FOX-1, even though there was a good demand for hosting experiments, and that would help us get CSLI launches. We had several design discussions, both online and much better, of course, in person, during the building and testing of the FOX-1 birds. The ideas were in the same direction as was originally envisioned for FOX-2 and built upon with the experiences and current interests of our engineers. But there were real reasons that the FOX-1 program could not continue as it had been. The cells for the battery were no longer manufactured or available. The FM radios used devices that were defunct, and in one case, the whole company went away. Even the FOX-1E linear transponder had end-of-life devices that would need to be changed. In order to continue the FOX-1 program, the satellite would need some major redesigning and resources, both human and financial. I chose to move forward with the golf program in order to take advantage of new systems and ideas that were born in ascent, and because the engineers prefer challenges and larger stakes rather than punching out the same thing repeatedly. FOX-1 was definitely not murdered. It lived a very amazing and fast-paced lifetime that contributed CubeSat capabilities and learning to our engineering that led the way to golf. Are you there? Yeah. 
Yep, we can hear you, Jerry. I just got a prompt to start the video. To start your video? Yeah. Did you stop? Well, you stopped your video. You stopped I, well, the... I mean, was I streaming just a second ago? Yes, yes. Oh, okay, well, the pop-up said that the host wants me to start the video, which I thought meant that I lost my video or something. Well, you, you stopped the playback of the video. It's paused at 9 minutes, 13 seconds. Right, but I was talking to the camera, and apparently that didn't work. Huh? Oh, yeah, yeah. No, I had to... Yeah, because you're you're because the uh, for some reason the video feed was coming through your camera and we we're also getting room audio that was feeding back, so I had to shut your camera off. Oh, I did mute it. Very well. All right. No, actually, it's not very well. I told you it's Halloween. It's scary. Yes, it is certainly. <laughs> so, um, I will press on to the next video here then. Oops. Because we're having so much fun. Hold on to your seats. From Reno, Nevada. It's the 2017 AMSAT Space Symposium and General Meeting, starring the Board of Directors. In October 2017, at the AMSAT Board of Directors meeting in Reno, I proposed Golf Tee and the Golf Program to the Board. There were several meetings and planning talks going on since late summer 2017, with an in-person meeting of several system leads just prior to the board meeting in Reno in order to get final buy-in or concerns for the golf project. The board were persuaded by the preparation work that we had done and the opportunities ahead for development of hardware and capability toward higher orbits and approved support for Golf T. In addition, during the two days of board meetings, I found that there could be an opportunity for an orbit suitable to our plans for a Golf 1 satellite to be the first to escape low LEO in the near future and decided it would be advisable to submit a CSLI during 2017 in order to get our foot in the door for such an opportunity. I wound up No, Jerry, you're good. Continue. Keep playing the video. Requesting the approval of the board to commence a Golf 1 mission for higher orbit, and the board did approve that as well. It was necessary to have a commitment to financing the Golf 1 project in order to submit a CSLI, as well as for Golf T, in the next month. Golf drew from ascent for the RT, IHU, and SDR systems, and both the 500 km Golf T orbit and the proposed 1200 km Golf 1 orbit would be excellent stepping stones for the RTIHU, as well as building some base microwave skills with the SDR. Golf also was given a strong push forward on our timeline by the proposal from Ragnarok Industries to partner in a CSLI to fly their attitude determination and control system that was being developed as a low-cost alternative in the CubeSat hardware market. It is by no means the first time AMSAT has partnered with developers of a new system, and would be beneficial to both AMSAT and Ragnarok. Work began on the Golf T CONOPS requirements and functional performance specification. While our engineers were fleshing out the design ideas and prototyping systems, NASA was looking for a launch opportunity that would fit our desired orbit. While Golf T carries a few systems developed and used in the FOX-1 program, often referred to as the legacy systems, the platform is an entirely new design. These legacy systems, a FOX-1 IHU, improved command receiver, and FOX-1E type linear transponder, are an LTM like those I mentioned earlier. The LTI or linear transponder interface board on Golf T is a full FOX-1 IHU rather than the pared down IHU version that performs as the LTM interface to the host bus on partner LTMs and is fully capable of running the Golf T systems. 
This legacy system is flown as a backup IHU at radio to the RTIHU system in radio and the Edis SDR. Should the new exploratory golf systems miss the mark or fail to perform on their first flight, the legacy systems are there to provide known command, telemetry, and ham radio capabilities in order to meet the basics as an amateur radio satellite. Golf T was proposed to the CSLI program as a technology demonstrator. While obviously consisting of existing technology components, the ability to deploy solar panel wings for greater power generation, mitigate reset events of the space vehicle IHU, test high-speed telemetry downlinks and multiband microwave operating modes, and effect three-axis stabilization and pointing with the Ragnarok ADAC, are innovations and implementations of technology being developed by AMSAT to meet AMSAT CubeSat mission goals. Deployable solar panel wings, varieties of microwave antennas, radiation event resistant IHUs, and attitude control systems are available commercially, but are very expensive ways to meet our mission desires. Our AMSAT engineers like to design things themselves, making the most out of less pricey COTS parts in order to innovate as well as create more satellites for an equivalent cost to one commercially produced bird. The T in Golf T stands for Technology Exploration Environment, and what we learn in the construction and flight of Golf T will guide us and enable better successive versions of the Golf Series platform. Golf 1 will be on the heels of Golf T, and our engineers have been exploring and devising new modes, configurations, and better techniques already as we learn the design and build of Golf T. Golf T is manifested on a Vox Launcher 1 mission for the USSF in the summer of 2022. The fact that it is a new design has pushed completion closer to launch, and that is expected. However, our vendor Ragnarok has been experiencing big delays in their production and subsequent deliverable items to AMSAT. Much of the delay is attributed to COVID-19 restrictions and lockdowns at their headquarters as it is located in New York City. Nonetheless, we are at a decision point for whether we would be able to proceed with the full Ragnarok ADAC and EPS package or turn to alternatives or a descope of the Ragnarok piece of the CSLI in order to be ready to fly on time. The decisions and choices are complex and will play out in the next month as we see if Ragnarok is able to start catching up with their deliverables. Many of the systems in Golf T have been discussed in print and in presentations at the past four years of space symposiums. The interactions between the legacy IHU and the new radiation tolerant IHU that are necessary for three devices to work together happily are as intriguing as they are important. And Burns Fisher, WB1FJ, created a video to describe what takes place. Hello everyone, I'm Burns Fisher, WB1FJ, and welcome to my messy shack slash lab, uh, where I'm developing the software for the Golf T spacecraft and also putting together the initial what we call flat set of the Golf T spacecraft. So um, I'll give you an idea of what's going on here. Get slightly out of the way so you can see some of this. Right here is the actual flat set that contains um, a number of the boards for the um, processors as well as the uh, RXTX, the transmitter, and the command receiver. Um, this is uh, obviously a power supply for the thing. This is a, a very early prototype of a board that connects um, many of the parts of the spacecraft to uh, together. And over here, uh, we have an Edis 310, which will be getting used for uh, on the spacecraft for the 10 gigahertz high-speed downlink as well as some of the microwave uplinks. I'm going to show you this a little bit closer. Um, this is the flat sat board uh, along with the uh, prototypes and the E310. Uh, but just notice on the flat sat board, there is 
one, two, three different uh, programming uh, boards because there are one, two, three processors on the thing. Uh, in general, if for uh, fallback purposes, if one fails, then um, another one takes over, and I'm going to be showing you that in a few minutes. We also have a, um, this thing is called a cannibal uh, for uh, it has a CAN bus and lets me send CAN signals into the uh, spacecraft in order to test all that part of it. Over here, we have uh, three consoles. Remember I said there were three computers on board, and uh, these are uh, consoles for each one of them, a console meaning where the programmer and tester can sit and uh, give commands and receive information from each processor individually, uh, as opposed to having to do the whole thing over radio, which of course would be what we would do in space. And right beside here, we have uh, something that may be familiar to you. Fox Telem is uh, running here. So I want to show you uh, right now what we have working so that uh, we can power down or pretend to fail one of the processors and everything fails over to the other processor. Uh, first I'm going to I think uh, Jerry's internet might have uh, just uh, taken a bit of a fritz there. We lost the screen share. There we go. I think I heard you there for a second, Jerry. Okay, well, I'm not sure if Jerry's going to make it back on or not with the video. Um, Sorry, yeah. what's going okay. on? Yeah, we lost the screen share. It paused right when, uh, uh, just after Burns opened the SSH clients. Yeah, you know what? Uh, I restarted it too, and now it says it's paused again. So uh, let me see, how do you unpause it? Um, Well, yeah, how, oh, there we go. How to help it? You got it? Yep. Oh, I want to show you uh, right now what we have working so that uh, we can power down or pretend to fail one of the processors and everything fails over to the other processor. Uh, first, I'm going to power the whole rig on, and you should see three computers all start up. And there we go. Here is the legacy ISU. Here is the primary uh, radiation tolerant IHU. And here is the secondary radiation tolerant IHU. So back to these consoles, you can see that the one on the right called the secondary console is uh, saying CTRL bus. So that means the RT IHU is in control of the spacecraft, and this particular secondary cons uh, secondary processor has the spacecraft bus. And uh, I have turned on the telemetry, so if we look over here, uh, we can see uh, an eye diagram, we can see a nice strong signal coming out, and we can see 
uh, nice bits being decoded. So now I'm going to go back here and um, reset this particular processor. Reset IHU. And what will happen is that it will switch over to the other uh, processor. So I'm going to go here and show you the signal. And here we go. I'm going to hit reset. Kachunk. There, it reset. And suddenly, we have another signal there. And it's not quite as strong because it doesn't have the antenna configuration identically. But you can see that it very quickly uh, started once again sending signals. And I'll show you over here that the primary console uh, the primary console says uh, starting radio and also you can see that it now says it is in control of the bus and um, the secondary console is not in control of the bus. Okay, the uh, RTIHU is now sending telemetry over the digital command transceiver. And I am next, uh, let me show you the consoles first here, that the um, primary RTIHU console is in control and has the bus. Uh, the LIHU console here, uh, it says it's alive, but it does not have the bus, it's not in control. Okay, so now I'm just gonna show you what happens. Uh, I'm going to send a command to power down the RTIHU, and this would also happen if it failed in any way, of course. So here goes the command, and you shall see that it briefly goes into essentially um, contingency mode, and the LIHU takes over and starts sending um, telemetry. And over here, once again, we can see that the LIHU is now in control, and the RTIHU uh, does nothing because it's powered down. So thanks for listening and watching. Uh, I hope you found this interesting and that you can see from this that AMSAT Engineering is working hard to build and deliver uh, the Golf T spacecraft. This is Burns Fisher, WB1FJ, and I'm clear. Well, I'm back. And that, that's the end of the video that I have. Okay, yeah, we can see you, Jerry, so. Oh, okay. Right. It was popping up saying that, uh, yep. that uh, yep, I couldn't get on here. In any case, I found the culprit, so next time ought to be better. <laughs> yes, the ghosts. I got to, uh, that, that's the last of the video I have. I thought, <clears throat> especially since it's behind some time for Q&A real, real quick here, about, what, 10 or 15 minutes, but I have to take a break first because I'm going to need to clear my throat. Okay. Um, Let me share the screen first so that you don't see my face there. <laughs> All right, there we go. <laughs> okay, so um, in addition to Jerry, we are joined by a number of uh, AMSAT's uh, engineering team, uh, Burns Fisher, WB1FJ, Chris, G0KLA, Eric Skoog, K1TVV, uh, Ray Roberge, um, Blanking on your call sign right now, and uh, Zach Metzinger, N0ZGO, which this year I got the call in the right order, I think, right? Yes. <laughs> got it. All right. So um, if anybody has any questions for our uh, engineering team, uh, uh, they're, they're available now to, uh, to answer uh, any questions you might have. Uh, otherwise, if uh, any of you have any remarks while we wait for some questions to pop up, uh, go right ahead. 
I think Jerry cut off the uh, little bit where I showed what the Fox to Lim looks like. But uh, if you've seen Fox to Lim for the Fox satellites, you'll know there's a couple of pages. There's a lot of information on uh, the Golf T pages, which has uh, you know lot, lots of information about what failures or what or what kinds of errors uh, have been fixed or not fixed, and uh, you know just lots of lots of new stuff because we have a lot faster download. Well, we have, uh, we don't have any questions popping up right now. Um, so, uh, Jerry, I, I see you're back with us. Did you have any Anything else to uh, to add? Yes. I could talk a little bit about uh, the orbital debris as we were discussing yesterday. Uh, if you caught the board of directors meeting, you would have heard probably most or uh, more than what I'm gonna say right now. And, and you probably, you've heard me talk before about the orbital debris and the regulations, how they have been uh, kind of tightened and enforced more and especially with the proliferation of satellites going into low earth orbit now and some other circumstances that have gone on the the moves to protect against you know polluting space with space junk have as, as is typical for you know trying to cover a, a governmental area the world or whatever it really kind of puts the crunch on on the little guys if you will so we're faced with some very difficult conditions right now that pretty much make it so that as of looking for the orbit for golf one which was originally intended to be 1200 we're probably going to be lucky to get above 550 and uh, if that's 550 kilometers because it has to be able to re-enter within 25 years. The trick difference between that and the Foxes is there's more mass with the 3U, therefore that will help keep it up longer, but we also have more drag with the solar panels extended. So depending on the orientation of the satellite in the orbit, whether it's going face on into the orbit or sideways into the orbit, if you will, um, if you put it into an, uh, an orbit that would let the uh, face on last for 10 years, then the sideways want to be up there 100. So it's, it's really impossible to determine what we can do with that and the current regulations for licensing the CubeSats that is the FCC license in the US here is that you uh, when they do the orbital debris assessment they have to consider that nothing works nothing that you have on the spacecraft and so you don't deploy deorbit devices or solar panels or solar wings or any of that type of stuff or propulsion even if you were going to use propulsion so that leaves us in the situation of being after, after everything was going so good to get up higher and all of a sudden, boom, there's a kind of a lid clamped on it. So I've been working on that a lot. There are uh, some you know, opportunities that are on the horizon, I guess you'd say. You've got Spaceflight doing their, uh, I forgot the exact name for what they put on it, but basically the uh, Sherpa ring that goes uh, via the uh, cislunar orbit to get to uh, geo height. And they also talked about hosting payloads on that. And uh, I asked them about, because if you saw their presentation, they go up, they go around the moon, they come back, and then they start circularizing the uh, geo orbit. I asked them if they, you know, what do you think about dropping somebody off in that elliptical uh, geo orbit there, basically, that has a per yeah, perigee of, of geo height. And then the apogee is, I don't know where, but I'd take it. And so there's, things like that to explore and see what happens with the regulation you know paul works on uh, works on a lot of that with the sec and responses to their rulemaking and such for us uh, so right now golf golf t golf one golf t was going to be in leo anyway golf one we're going to fly that in leo but in you know do the same additive improvement process that we will get from golf t um, and and continue to build up our capability to be able to survive in higher orbits. Okay. Uh, yep. Thanks for that, uh, Jerry. Uh, uh, orbital debris regulations are certainly a, 
uh, a big challenge for uh, for anybody who's uh, looking to launch something into uh, into space. Um, it's like we have a, it's like we have a question uh, from uh, our own Dr. Mark Hammond, uh, an eight MH. The bird is going to be very frequently agile. What is the current best guess for default uh, default uplink, downlink, and telemetry format? Frequently agile, is that what you said? Frequency agile. I like the frequently part. What? Uh, so what was the question? Anybody else? Uh, what is the current best guess for default uh, uplink, downlink, and uh, telemetry format? Format? Well, the uplink and downlink is going to be uh, the, the at the base level. It's the Fox One E linear transponder, uh, an LTM. So it'll be. Uh, Two meters up, 70 centimeters down, voice, CW, uh, whatever you want to fit in there. The telemetry is 1200 BPSK, as is that uh, LTM, linear transponder module. The SDR that's flying will give us opportunities to do other things, if you will. So we're planning a minimum of having the 10 gigahertz downlink of the fastest telemetry speed that we can make work from a LEO. And, uh, but in addition, it, we have the possibility of having uplinks on uh, 1.2, 2.4, 5, and 5 gigahertz. Whether those will be active or not, we don't know. A lot of it, a lot of what we can do with the SDR relies on the attitude control because it's going to take a lot of power, and generating a lot of power is uh, hard to do without a lot of solar panels, and and so uh, that that also conflicts a little bit with where your microwave antennas are pointing depending on how things are mounting because the solar panels might be pointing at the sun over here but the earth over here so the uh, you know the microwave antennas can't be pointing at the earth while the maximum power is being obtained but we um, we're putting the capability in because we're developing it for golf one to be able to use these other frequencies and if, if um, if all of the qualifications, qualifying gets out of the way, that's to test the solar panel deployment, test the RTIHU, test the ADAC, then we, we can certainly start fiddling. Okay, thank you, Jerry. I don't know if, uh, if uh, Ray wanted to add anything about the uh, SDR. I know that's uh, his primary. Right, so, uh, well, uh, first off with Burns' presentation, uh, there is a, another processor on board. It's called the SDR. And uh, uh, I know he wasn't showing that uh, as part of it, but basically it uh, will operate on the CAN bus also. Uh, so anyway, the SDR has modes, uh, as Jerry said, uh, uh, pretty much you can have any band below uh, six gigs uh, to receive. So in reality, the hardware uh, is capable of VHF, UHF, L-band, S-band, and C-band uh, going in. Um, and the output, of course, is uh, hardwired to the uh, X-band downlink. So as Jerry said, the uh, attitude control system really is the, uh, is the uh, a long pull in that. Um, however, for input, we have various modes that I'd like to try out, uh, both linear and uh, nonlinear modes, both singular and in combination. Larry sa as uh, Jerry said, the uh, requirement is a high-speed mode, and uh, I'm planning on using a, uh, a high-speed packet mode, uh, very similar to the Voyager system, which uh, will give me over a megabit uh, going down. Uh, also, we'll have the capability of doing uh, uh, a, a division of that uh, rate, probably by 64 or 20, which translates to a 30 uh, kilohertz bandwidth downlink or 100 kilohertz bandwidth downwith band length of data. Tongue-tied. I know what you meant. Yeah, there you go. Um, so, uh, and what we'd use that for is to uh, actually uh, check out the attitude control system. Uh, so uh, we can download the data to verify that that's working. So there's lots of data in and in, in good ADS uh, to look at star maps, et cetera. But it'll be capable of everything. I think Burns wanted uh, the complete uh, tally of, a, of, of one rotation of the Earth and we can store that on board and, and downlink that. So uh, 
So we have a lot of hardware capability. As Jerry said, we'll, we'll see if we have time, uh, but uh, I'm hoping. Yeah, sorry about that, uh, Ray. I, uh, <laughs> I mean, I showed a picture of the SD. Yeah. Yeah, and it's I even fine. have a console for it. <laughs> yeah. Okay, um, thank you, uh, thank you for that, Ray and uh, and Burns. Um, so there is uh, a question here, a couple questions, but we'll go first uh, to Mike Parker, KT7D. Uh, in the FCC proposal a year or two, or a year or two ago, maneuvering was going to re be required uh, to miss other spacecraft to move around spa uh, other spacecraft if there was. Uh, 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 conjunction warning. Uh, is AMSAT working on that? And uh, before I turn it back over to Jerry, um, I do want to note that uh, that uh, proposal is still in the uh, notice of proposed rulemaking stage, the uh, further notice of proposed rulemaking stage where it has sat for the last um, year and a half. So I don't know if there will be any developments on that. Hopefully, um, hopefully there'll be some changes before that uh, a final report and order on that one. Uh, go ahead, Jerry. Uh, how do you know I was going to say something? <laughs> Actually, I just wanted to add that, yeah, uh, Mike, that that piece of it is kind of like what I'm just looking at as a possibly, in a sense, like a nail in the coffin because it it uh, it in is is its own chicken and egg thing uh, in itself with not letting people fly with propulsion if they don't know what they're doing to making people fly with propulsion or maneuvering in order to stay out of the way of people, but they don't necessarily know how to do it, right? So I don't know. It's all, like I said, I, with, with NOAA and, and the licensing of the cameras on Fox 1 CND, that the whole process, which started, I started many years ago, I think it was around 2014, um, that was a totally cumbersome thing like we are Google Earth or something, you know, and we had to have and get a waiver for encryption and, you know, not releasing the images and all this kind of stuff. And uh, so we just had to work through all that paperwork and I was not too thrilled with it. Fortunately, the guy I worked with there was understanding of what was going on. And in, right after he retired, not right after, but about a year after, they actually did uh, come up with the four levels of, of security. So. Uh, we get wind up in level one now with the two cameras that aren't really working right now. <laughs> it would have been less work, but that's where it is now. So that's a, that's a good outcome, but the, it, it was really a good taste of what happens when rules are made for, you know, Google or IBM or something. And, and we're AMSAT or hobbyists, you know. All right. Thank you, Jerry, uh, for that. And I think uh, one of the things um, uh, you referenced the chicken and egg problem with propulsion. And I think just for the benefit of, uh, some of our attendees here. Uh, the uh, the uh, uh, problem is that uh, launch providers and other payload owners don't want volatile chemicals on their um, on their launches. So the uh, there's uh, it's difficult to get uh, to actually if you want to fly propulsion, even if you can afford the expensive systems that some of, some of them are, um, that uh, that you might not be able to fly it because uh, because the launch provider doesn't want that. Uh, Jerry, I don't know if you have anything to add to that. Yeah, that's a, a good point there. Um, so what happens is it's generally it's because the, our CubeSats, especially if it's Alana or, or such, um, are riding as a secondary payload. So there's a much more expensive satellite that's actually paying for most of the rocket on the top there, and they do not want to risk any anything with that from amateurs, so to speak. The right. ones that you know that you have a better chance of, of being able to do that with in my opinion as the way i see what's developing are the smaller ones that are launching just cubesats right so if you're on a just cubesat launch well you got probably a lot better chance of getting away with it however the ones that are typically scheduling that are the ones that only go to about 500 kilometers anyway so it's not a matter of being able to get where you want to go you know uh, pushing up beyond that where maneuvering would even be useful or deorbit. So it's, it'll develop, hopefully, that they do a lot more CubeSat launches. I, I think my whole point for the thing is, you know, it's obviously not going to happen tomorrow. Okay. Uh, thank you, Jerry. Yep. Uh, good, uh, good answer on that. Good uh, Mark has another question here. Uh, might there be a Gulf 1A, 1B, 1C, rather like how the Fox 1 family expanded? 
There could be, huh? The ABC, I, don't, I mean, in my mind when, especially since Golf 1 is the only one that's been chartered, if you will, it just numbering them, you know, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, or whatever. So, but, you know, going 1, A, B, C, D, you could do that. Except, I, I think, okay, foxes were called A, B, C, D because there was originally intended to only be one. And then we tacked an A on that when the second one was going to be built, and then B, C, D, and E. And with golf, the expectation is to build more than one, so one, two, three, four makes more sense to me anyway. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for that answer, Jerry. Um, there are no more questions at the time. We are out of the allotted time, but uh, if anybody has any final words uh, before we, uh, before we um, move, on to, uh, move on to our next segment of today's session. Anybody on the engineering panel here? Want to say anything? I will. Just real quick. I, I since uh, Paul loused up my entire presentation with Zoom there, um, that was my fault. I I, I was I, I was unaware exactly how Zoom would handle that. So the point is, I would like to be able to answer more questions if there are any. So maybe we can schedule a Zoom, not immediately. Because uh, I haven't slept for three days, but you know, uh, in a week or two or something like that, if people would be interested in getting together, or I could do it on Twitch because I have a Twitch account, and uh, just get on there and, and talk to people, and and the other other engineers could join too if they want, because I think it's, I, I intended to have more Q and A time with my presentation, but if we hadn't had to stop it so many times, you know, we we would have had another 15 minutes. Thank you. Yep, we certainly uh, we certainly can schedule um, you know we can set, schedule Zoom meetings, uh, informal Zoom meetings, uh, uh, more of these. Uh, certainly, if the uh, I'm certain if we give uh, the members uh, some notice, we'll get a good a good turnout for uh, short sessions here and there. So, um, with that, I think we are have come to the engineering section, and that is uh, actually the end of theoretically the end of the symposium part of today's proceedings. Uh, we are now uh, going into the uh, annual general meeting, the AMSAT uh, annual general meeting. Uh, so I will um, hand it over to uh, AMSAT President Robert Bankston, KE4AL. Uh, if he is online and ready to go, it looks like he is. Uh, I will hand it over to him to formally close the symposium and open, up, open the uh, 2021 AMSAT general meeting. Wow, what a, Paul, it's not good there. You're good. Okay, good, thank you. Uh, I don't see my video coming up. Uh, coming up for everybody else, it's fine. Okay, uh, but anyway, so wow, what an incredible uh, symposium. A, uh, it was nice to see the tributes, all the tributes to Dr. Tom Clark, K3IO. Uh, a true friend of AMSET and pa pioneer for amateur radio, amateur radio satellites, and uh, as well as the digital technologies. So uh, that was great to see. And the uh, for the other presenters, uh, the information that you shared with us on uh, your projects that you're working on and updates within AMSET organization uh, was very enlightening. So thank you very much for that time. So with that, I will close this session of the 2021 Dr. Tom Clark K3IO Memorial Space Symposium, and we will now proceed to the 2021 AMSAT General Meeting. Let me get the slide set up here. And where did the screen share go? Oh, there's my title slide. Uh, so my name is Robert Bankston, KE4AL. I am the president of AMSAT, more formally known as the Radio Amateur Satellite Corporation. Uh, our agenda for this general meeting is uh, first, I'd like to uh, do some, take a few moments to do some special recognition. Uh, then we'll go over with AMSAT's current governance, governance and leadership. Uh, followed by our 2021 accomplishments. Uh, then let you know where AMSAT is as of today, as well as uh, 
what's next, then uh, I'm going to hand over the screen to uh, our VP of development, Frank Kronowskis, for an update from development, and then to uh, Bruce Page, KK5DO, for awards, uh, contests and awards. And then from that, we will uh, open up the floor to our members for a question and answer period. So uh, as far as special recognition, you know, we can't even get started without talking about Dr. Tom Clark. Uh, we lost him last month. Uh, he was a great asset to uh, AMSAT, ARIS, Amateur Radio, uh, and uh, to the, the entire science uh, academy and world. So uh, for AMSAT, uh, for those who don't know, Tom served uh, over 44 years uh, of continuous service on AMSAT's board of directors and was uh, bestowed with the title of last year as he stepped down as Director Emeritus. Uh, he was also uh, named President Emeritus for his leadership and service in the 1980s as president of AMSAT. Uh, but we, uh, we've always recognized Tom as an uh, expert in all things associated with AMSAT and uh, digital technology. So, uh, he will greatly be missed. So I just wanted to say thank you, Tom, and best wishes to you. Uh, next, I'd like to talk about Drew Glassbrenner. Uh, Drew has uh, stepped down from the board of directors of uh, this past year, or this year, I'm sorry. Uh, and he's been on the board for 14 years. In addition to that, uh, I've seen pictures of Drew uh, back when he was a young, uh, young man, so uh, it appears to be that he has served his almost his entire adult life with AMSAT. So uh, we thank him for his service as a director. Uh, he is continuing at this moment to uh, serve on the IRU Satellite Advisory Panel representing Region 2. Uh, he is also our Oscar number coordinator and is serving as the AMSAT VP of Operations. Uh, always a, a great wealth of knowledge uh, he brings honesty and candor to the conversation uh, as well as expertise. So we appreciate that and thank him for that. So allow me to talk now about the uh, AMSAT's governance and leadership. Uh, our directors uh, we had that were elected in 2020 uh, and will be up again for election in 2022 is Mark Kamen, N8MH uh, from Coates, North Carolina. Uh, Bruce Page, KK5DO, uh, Roman Forest, Texas, and Paul Stetzer, N8HM. Uh, even though he's from Michigan, he currently resides in Washington, D.C. Uh, elected this year, our new uh, directors, uh, Joseph Armbruster, KJ4JIO, uh, who resides in Orlando, Florida. Uh, myself, down in Dothan, Alabama. Jerry Buxton, N0JY, Granbury, Texas. Zach Metzinger, N0 Zulu Golf Oscar, South Lake, Texas. Uh, and then I would like to thank the outgoing uh, directors. Uh, of course, as I mentioned, Drew Glassbrenner, uh, Michelle Thompson, and Patrick Stoddard. Appreciate your service. Uh, the officers who uh, deal with the day-to-day uh, -day operations of AMSET, the president is myself. Uh, the executive vice president is Paul Stetzer, N8HM. VP of Engineering, Jerry Buxton. VP of Operations, Drew Glassbrenner. VP of Educational Relations, Alan Johnson, KU2Y. VP of Development, Frank Kronowskis, N1UW, who uh, has recently moved from Minis uh, Minneapolis, Minnesota, or, or within that vicinity, uh, down to the warmer climates of Tucson where he's joined us today and spun the wheel. Uh, our treasurer is Steve Belter, N9IP, out of West Lafayette, Indiana. And currently our VP of user services and secretary positions are vacant. Other key leaders include AMSAT journal, uh, the AMSAT journal editor, Joseph Kornowski, KB6IGK, who uh, resides in Austin, Texas. Our AMSAT News Service uh, editor, Martin Johns, K0JM, uh, out of Minneapolis, Minnesota. 
our IT team leader, Joe Fitzgerald, KM1P, Boston, Massachusetts. And our two ARIS international delegates, uh, Dave Taylor, W8AAS, who represents the United States, and Czech, Chet Ladovic, VE3CFK, who represents uh, North, Central, and South America, with the exception of the United States. And uh, Chet lives in Sarnia, uh, Ontario, Canada. Uh, in addition to uh, to the leadership there, we have a, uh, a great core of volunteers uh, that assist us with AMSAT, anywhere from engineering to education to administration, uh, IT. Uh, for all those, I greatly appreciate your uh, donating your time to us. Uh, we could not exist without you. So let's talk about what we did uh, in 2021. Uh, of course, uh, the year started out with the launch of Fox 1E, Radifex Set 2, and then once it reached space and, and uh, met the requirements, became AO 109. Uh, once uh, it was launched, uh, which uh, it was Virgin Orbit's Launcher 1 that took us to space, uh, we ran into some troubles. Uh, and I would say that uh, when things get going, tough or when things are tough the uh it's it's what your volunteers do after that which uh, sets them apart from the rest and that's certainly what happened with uh, ao 109. Uh, i had the opportunity to sit on a lot of the conversations uh, as they uh, work to troubleshoot the problems uh, coming up with uh, trying to first identify what happened and then number two how to fix it uh, and so that level of effort uh, and some assistance from outside forces uh, helped us uh, identify that we could uh, uh, indeed communicate and command, uh, communicate through and command AO 109. So uh, I saw recently on Twitter, it was posted that we actually had our first uh, long distance record uh, with AO 109 between K8YSE, uh, John, and Glenn AA5PK. So it's workable. Uh, it is a challenge. Uh, so if you're up for it, give it a try. And especially try and collect some more telemetry. We'd really appreciate that. Uh, next up is our engineer teams are, has been brief. We're making some great progress on Golf T, uh, which will then fall into Golf One. Uh, if everything goes well, we may see a launch next summer. Uh, but we are uh, working through uh, several issues with supply issues, and uh, we'll make sure that that happens one way or another, I suppose. Uh, AMSAT is uh, partnering with the University of Maine, uh, where, and they're using the linear transponder, transponder module on their MESAT-1, uh, which I believe MESAT-1, if I read it correctly, stands for Maine's first satellite. Uh, so we were working with them. Uh, and as uh, Alan Johnson shared with us today, the CubeSat simulator program is just going uh, all out. Uh, they've worked through all their beta testing and they have launched their first uh, production model of CubeSat simulator, uh, simulator those four uh, PCB boards that we we're offering uh, on the AMSAT store, uh, as well as uh, the announcement of the CubeSat Sim Lite, uh, which is a uh, went up on the board and quickly sold out within about 10 minutes. So it uh, looks like some great opportunities there to advance our STEM initiatives. Uh, and I'm really excited about that. Uh, next up, we, it's kind of like the back office, the boring stuff, but the modernization of AMSET uh, continues. And what I like to term uh, life without Martha. Uh, Martha, of course, retired in December 31st of 2020. And uh, we quickly found out how much that she did uh, on January 1st, because the emails kept coming. Uh, so while we certainly uh, miss Martha, we uh, had to do a little bit of scrambling uh, to redelegate some of those, uh, those tasks that she performed on a daily basis. Uh, really our modernization efforts started in uh, back in May of 2020 with the launch of the online uh, member management system. Uh, and we've continued that process as we move forward. So uh, things are looking up. We've got a, a few snags that we're still working on, 
but for the most part, I could call that uh, part complete. Uh, from a, uh, a guidance or policy standpoint, uh, we amended our bylaws in 2021. That allowed us to, uh, number one, uh, better define the duties of the, uh, the officers, as well as allowed us to more effectively communicate with our uh, members by eliminating, elim or I guess, updating uh, some older technologies and how we communicate, such as we're required to mail everything. Uh, so we now have that electronic capability, which we put to use this year uh, quite often uh, through emails, uh, through our online member management system, as well as we conducted this year's uh, board of directors elections through Wild Apricot. Uh, then finally, uh, the board passed a uh, strategic plan, which is uh, offers us a, a roadmap to focus on as we move forward and, uh, and face the new challenges. So where are we at right now? Uh, that's what the biggest question I always get is how much money do we have and how many members? How's our membership doing? So uh, I will say we're in strong financial position. We're sitting right now with about $950,000 in cash and investments that can be easily uh, converted to cash. Uh, so we have that capability. Uh, the, we continue to have a healthy stream of donations. They are down slightly from the previous year, uh, but that was clearly offset by the amount of cost cutting measures that we took in our modernization processes. Uh, we have reduced uh, overhead costs by 31%. In 2020, uh, over two, uh, correction, 2021 versus 2020, and uh, that is just the first nine months of uh, of this year, uh, the first three quarters. So we expect to do even better. Uh, we are uh, because our donations are down just a little bit. We expect to uh, achieve the same profit margin or. Uh, net revenues uh, as the previous year. Uh, in addition, uh, I've been working with Frank Karnauskas and we are going to uh, start exercising our grant writing and fundraising raising skills that, that we built up in the past year. And that should start next week. So membership, of course, uh, the big thing is uh, our online member portal. Uh, this put the members in charge of their accounts so they could uh, change it 24 seven uh, over the internet, as well as uh, increased our capability to uh, communicate with them. Uh, since we launched the online member management portal, we are looking at uh, that we stayed over 4,000 members. Uh, and as of today, we're at 4,045. Uh, I think we, we hit a high of about 4,100 uh, earlier in the year, and that fluctuates uh, basically on a monthly basis. The, uh, another thing that since we have this online member database, we can uh, get a better look into uh, where our membership is spread out. And we're actually in 76 countries. Now, the bulk of that is in the US. So we're looking at about 83% of our membership is in the US, 4% in Canada, and the other uh, 13 or 14 percent is spread throughout the remaining 74 countries. So what are we going to do next? Well, I think our uh, strategic plan gives us a, uh, an excellent, ro excellent roadmap. If you haven't seen it yet, it's in the AMSAT journal, which is available through the online member management system launch.amsat.org. Uh, as it's been printed in the journal for the past two issues. In addition, you can go to our public website, amset.org and forward slash strategic plan. Uh, just a, a general overview of that real quick is that we uh, have HEO, highly elliptical orbits or high earth orbits at the top. Uh, that's our, our focus for strategic objectives, uh, followed by golf and golf, uh, as Jerry elaborated with the pending uh, regulatory restrictions is a 
critical part in uh, helping us go back to higher orbits. Uh, we also have the third item is our partnership with uh, ARIS in supporting human spaceflight on the International Space Station, uh, the Lunar uh, Gateway, and for what other projects that, uh, that follow along with that. Uh, next up is uh, low Earth orbits. Uh, low Earth orbits uh, we're going to be using to, number one, prove ourselves as part of the regulatory uh, restrictions. Uh, but the uh, FM portion of the band uh, could truly be supported in LEO, as well as our partnerships with universities and other uh, CubeSat organizations. And then last on there is our uh, STEM. Uh, we strongly support uh, STEM initiatives. And so uh, in addition to the CubeSat simulator, we are looking to expand uh, AMSAT's uh, programs to include high altitude balloon launches, either uh, separately or as part of the uh, CubeSat simulator initiative. And then last but not least, uh, we have our youth initiative itself. As we look at new ways to contact, uh, connect with the uh, future satellite builders, scientists, uh, mathematicians, and uh, even just amateur radio operators. Uh, and hopefully that all comes together. Uh, so having a plan is great, but we really need to uh, put that in action. Uh, so a couple of things that we need to do to focus on that is uh, we have to look at how we manage our projects. Uh, there is a uh, new organizational methods. There is uh, data storage, data security is what we have to worry about as well. Uh, and then uh, finding ways to better share that with our, uh, with our membership and with the world uh, so that we can all uh, benefit. One thing that is, uh, we've got a strategic plan and it's, it's ambitious. So any expansion is gonna meet need that we need more volunteers. Uh, so as I said earlier, we do have a great common core of volunteers. However, uh, everybody is just about at full bandwidth. So to do any more work, uh, we're gonna need more volunteers. So that is gonna be my effort beginning in November uh, to start uh, recruiting volunteers uh, from engineering to administration. Uh, we need help in, in basically every area uh, to be able to uh, do the things that we want to do. Uh, and then the last part about that is that uh, those regulatory restrictions are clearly going to define our future. So we have to make sure that we stay on top of that. Uh, Paul Stetzer, our EVP, has uh, been doing a great job of that and joining with ARRL to respond uh, back in, I believe, 2020. Uh, and now we just have to sit patiently and wait until their next announcement that they make. Now, uh, and follow along in Tom's uh, style, we need to continue looking uh, forward, uh, not to sit idly and be content. So we need to focus on developing new communication systems and methods that allow us to communicate more effectively and more efficiently in space. Uh, we need to examine those uh, spacecraft requirements that we're gonna to need to operate in the future, as well as establish a path to uh, ensure that we uh, have the necessary builders, operators, and leaders for tomorrow. So as I talked about uh, FM and LEO, uh, the board yesterday at our meeting uh, approved a, uh, a plan for FM satellites. So we are, uh, you know, FM satellites are very important. Uh, FM, they call, let's call them easy sats. Uh, not only do, are they used to uh, introduce people to amateur radio, but many of our, op, uh, our members are content with just operating the FM bands in LEO. So uh, what draws them to them is that low cost of uh, entry, you know, uh, HT and a handheld antenna, and they're simple to use. Uh, They've also been great for our ambassadors or, or for any operator as you go out and work satellites in public. 
to demonstrate to the world, uh, to the public, uh, amateur radio in, in space. Uh, FM satellites also serve as a stepping stone to more advanced satellites such as linear and digital. Uh, so you enter with FM and then you work your way up. Uh, one thing, if you've, if you've gotten on an FM pass in the past few years, it gets really congested. And that just proves how popular they are. So uh, AO91 and AO92 are, are uh, only functioning uh, spacecraft up there right now. They're having issues. They're on borrowed time. Uh, so we need a plan of action to move forward uh, quickly. So uh, we recognize this when we were doing our strategic plan. So uh, section 4.1 talked about that we need to make sure that we uh, develop, deploy, and support a series of space spacecraft. So we're talking sustained operations there. So the short-term solution is uh, yesterday, the board authorized the purchase of a commercial FM1U CubeSat. Uh, the reason why we decided on per purchasing a commercial unit is number one, the quick turnaround. Uh, from the day you signed the contract, you could have one launched in six months. Uh, if we were uh, to develop a system, which we plan to do, uh, it is gonna take a little bit of a time. So uh, as an interim fix, uh, we're going to purchase a 1U CubeSat. Uh, it's going to be VHF up, UHF uh, down, uh, and it'll have an FM repeater, 400 milliwatts. Uh, other than uh, telemetry for the spacecraft, uh, it's health. Uh, it's just a radio, so no other science projects involved. It'll have dual band cross dipole antennas. Uh, Instead of a microprocessor, which we norm typically have, this one will come with a, a, an onboard computer operating free RTOS. And it will also include, as a uh, power system, four lithium ion cells uh, and a MPP multi point tracker. Uh, now, when I say purchase, I had an asterisk up there, and that's because the authorization of the board was. Uh, challenged me to find external funding. So they approved uh, or added the re requirement that I obtain 90% of that funding uh, externally to AMSAT. Uh, FM satellites are used worldwide. Uh, we're not the only ones that use it. So uh, it's only applicable that we uh, that share that responsibilities with others. So I'll be working on that. Uh, as we move forward, starting tomorrow. Okay, I'm gonna turn the, uh, the screen over to uh, Frank Kronowskis, our VP of Development, and uh, allow him to uh, brief you on uh, what he is working on. Okay, thank you, Robert. And I got to stop share, I think. And there you go. There we go. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, just a, a couple of quick things in, in review here. Uh, one is to uh, talk a little bit about the, uh, uh, the fundraising activities that we, uh, we did uh, conduct in uh, 2021, which is essentially the, uh, the President's Club here. So if you give me just a second here to uh, change, uh, share this, the screen here. Okay, is that uh, showing up, Robert? Yes, it is. Okay, great. Uh, we made a, uh, some changes to the, the President's Club uh, that had been around for, for years, but we wanted to uh, kind of rejuvenate it. And uh, uh, the two things that we did was, uh, first of all, we made it uh, an annual affair as opposed to an open-ended uh, contribution as, as was uh, before. And uh, the second thing was we established a, a, a series of tiers uh, that uh, re uh, recognize the uh, our, our generous donor for uh, for all of the uh, the contributions that they they made. So what I wanted to do just uh, uh, briefly was uh, recognize. I think I have to. Uh, there we go. Recognize our, our generous uh, donors from uh, from the last year. Uh, our at the uh, the top of the. Uh, 
uh, the pile here are, are, are uh, two titanium uh, level uh, donors, which uh, represent uh, gifts of uh, five thousand uh, dollars or more. And that was uh, uh, John Body and uh, William Brown. We want to thank you for your, your very generous uh, contributions there. Also, like to recognize uh, Alan Biddle, WA4SCA, for his uh, contribution at the, the, the platinum level. Uh, the gold level, uh, Barry Baines, WD4ASW, James Hain, W2IMY, Glenn Miller, AA5 Papa Kilo. A number of uh, silver uh, level donors, uh, K0VPL, KE9V, W1FJ, N8MH, W2UDT, K0JM, KK4AK, N6CL, W5RKN, Cheryl Printon, and for JJS and WA1 EA, I can't see that. Is it whiskey or Victor there? <laughs> whiskey. Okay, WA1 uh, Echo uh, Alpha Whiskey. Thank you very, very much for those contributions at the, at the silver level. Uh, at the bronze level, we had W5 RBD, W3 WE, KF3 BX, N4 MRV, uh, KS1G, K9 EK, KK5 DO, W5 GLD, and at the, the core level, have uh, a, a broad number of uh, uh, contributors there N0JY, N6DD, KA4ASK, WA4LM, uh, K4NAV, KN6DPI, AB0XE, K7SYS, CE3JSX, K1WP, WXP, KM3 Tango, KF7 ZBK, W7 NEV, K9 ECT, w, W8 W, KC8 IV, W1 OX, W8 SBI, uh, WA5 uh, TJB, W4 EAT, K1 uh, LKR, N8 HM, K0 CFI, K4 SHF, W8 AAS, and K6 FW. Altogether, uh, the generous contribution from uh, all of these uh, uh, contributors represented about uh, uh, a, a little bit better than thirty-three thousand dollars in donations to uh, to Ampset, which was uh, which is really terrific. We we thank all of you for for very much. And the uh, but still uh, there's still time to join. Okay, we still have a couple months left in the year. So if you go to uh, Ampset.org, our uh, homepage there. Uh, near the, the top of the, the page there, there's a little icon there where you can click and uh, there's still time to join the, the President's Club and uh, uh, get at least your certificate, the uh, really neat uh, commemorative coins and the uh, remove before flight uh, key tags. Okay, so uh, thank you everybody for, uh, for that. Uh, the next thing I want to uh, mention is uh, that uh, at the, uh, the board meeting yesterday, we did uh, uh, talk about uh, what our uh, promotional, our fundraising plans are for uh, 2022. Uh, we will begin a very uh, uh, aggressive, aggressive effort because, you know, $33,000 is a lot of money, yes, but the cost of uh, uh, getting in the space is really quite substantial. And uh, I think we all have to recognize that it, the, the cost is such these days that uh, a lot of this money is going to have to come from uh, outside the, the traditional amateur radio community. So what that means is that we need to uh, uh, weave into our, our missions uh, the uh, kinds of uh, programs that warrant uh, the, uh, uh, the, the launches from, from NASA for uh, worthy scientific and educational purposes, and then from the uh, various philanthropic organizations uh, demonstrate our uh, engineering uh, expertise or, or uh, purpose of scientific advancement and education present that story in a, in a strong fashion to the contributor, the uh, perspective of contributors, and uh, hopefully earn the uh, uh, the kind of money that we need to uh, uh, keep us in a, a steady flow of satellites. One of the ways that we are going to do that, if I can uh, share the screen uh, one more time here, is just throw a couple slides at you. Uh, Okay, where we uh, talked about the, uh, uh, the, the youth initiative that we, uh, the board authorized uh, back in October of 2019. Uh, we spent a, a year uh, working on this and uh, we we're ready to, to pull the trigger on that uh, really early in uh, uh, 2022. 
Uh, what we uh, are looking at in bringing this out is we've uh, trademarked two uh, names, uh, KidSat, which we'll use towards our promotions and programs for uh, kids in the uh, elementary uh, years, and uh, BuzzSat uh, for those uh, youths in, in their uh, high school years. I need to click here again. Okay. Uh, as part of that effort, uh, we own the domain names uh, kidsat.com uh, and org. Uh, buzzsat.com and org, uh, and uh, we will uh, have a strong uh, web presence uh, uh, with, of our, with our programs. Uh, four uh, pr uh, primary features uh, of the, the youth initiative uh, uh, will be a strong uh, web-based curriculum, and I'll talk about that in just uh, uh, one second. Uh, we're uh, going to uh, run a uh, fleet of uh, online SDRs that are uh, specialized uh, for uh, youth use that will focus on uh, the, the satellites that uh, carry uh, educational uh, missions. Uh, we uh, have plans for uh, some uh, CubeSat simulators that will uh, run online uh, that will focus on the earth sciences. Uh, and then, of course, uh, we hope to uh, uh, be able to use the uh, AMSAT satellite fleet to uh, promote uh, our uh, educational missions in the, uh, uh, the satellites that we fly. One last thing I, I do want to uh, mention that uh, uh, our, our primary message when we when we go to uh, talking to these kids are we want to put uh, satellites uh, into perspective and how they fit into our everyday life. And our, our uh, motto or our pitch to kids is see how satellites in space uh, can help us make life better on Earth. So space and satellites uh, will not be presented in kind of an abstract or uh, uh, something unto themselves, although that's a uh, obviously a, a very, very worthy uh, topics. But, uh, you know, uh, the fact of the matter is uh, most kids don't know what ham radio are. They, at the face of it, unless they know what it is, don't have much interest in it. So what we are intending to do is uh, use amateur radio in a lab environment to demonstrate how satellites do help us make life better back on Earth. And the areas that uh, kids are most uh, in interested in or any earth sciences, uh, uh, you know, meteorology, climate change, uh, natural habitat, wildlife protection, and other career uh, uh, matters that are of career interest, uh, career interest uh, to the kids. So uh, I'm really excited about this. I think the, the board was very excited about uh, what we're looking at. And uh, just uh, keep an eye out for uh, when we uh, pull the trigger on this thing and make it happen in early 2022. Thank you, Robert. And you're muted. I see, I see my lips moving, but uh, I wasn't <laughs> hearing anything. Uh, so, uh, Frank, I want to thank you for uh, transforming and relaunching the uh, AmpSense Preso Club, uh, a great initiative. I know that took a lot of work on your part, so I appreciate it, uh, as well as your efforts on the uh, the youth initiative. Uh, it looks like a great opportunity, uh, and I hope it goes really well. Uh, for those that don't know, and I'm going to embarrass uh, Frank here a little bit, uh, I personally, although I've never shared it with him, I call him Martha too, because he is the one uh, when the uh, when Martha retired, he's the one that stepped up, volunteered to allow those uh, emails to flow through him. Uh, he's done a great job managing, and he's uh, really uh, kept me straight. So I appreciate and thank you, Frank. Yeah, but all those dresses you see in my closet, those are my wife's, not, uh, yes. not yes. mine. So thank you. Uh, all right, next up is uh, an update from our contest and awards section. Bruce Page, our director of contest and awards, uh, KK5DO. So, uh, Bruce, if you are ready, I will uh, release the screen to you. All right, thanks, uh, Robert. Um, Paul, can you go ahead and run the video? Yes, sir. Just one second. Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us here at the AMSAT Virtual Symposium this year. I am Bruce Page, KK5DO, the AMSAT Director of Contests and Awards. I'm also on the board of directors. As I have done for the past 20 years, I have the pleasure of scoring and announcing the winners of Field Day. 
This year, the ARRL once again allowed home stations on commercial power to work anyone. We have allowed the same rule for this year. We had 22 stations participate this year, and we had 29 satellites in use. I count the satellites based on the modes available. If a satellite has CW and phone, that would be counted as two satellites. If it had APRS and FM, that would count as two satellites. There were 1,144 QSOs reported, with a total of 1,223 points. A majority of the contacts were phone at 1,112 points. This year, as we had last year, there are three groups of winners. Those operating club stations, those operating battery or home emergency power, and those operating home on commercial power. In first place this year, moving up from second place last year, is the Huntsville Amateur Radio Club K4BFT with 149 points. In second place is the Lafayette DX Association W9LDX. In third place, the same position they were in last year is the Johnson Space Center Amateur Radio Club W5RRR, where my good friend Andy, W5ACM, was a big part of their field day. He became a silent key shortly before field day. He was not forgotten. John, AB5SS, placed a picture of Andy over the operating station. For home on emergency power, first place goes to Alex, VA3ASE, with 134 points. Second place goes to Scott, K5TA. And third place goes to Steve, KS1G. The last class of operation receiving a certificate is home on commercial power. First place goes to Dave, W2GDJ, with 99 points. Second place goes to Scott, K5TA. And third place goes to Terry, N6AJ. Once again, I would like to thank everyone that participated and submitted a log. And now, I would like to announce a new award that AMSAT is offering to the satellite community. Although it really is not new, it is a new award for AMSAT. I work with the Central States VHF Society for them to allow AMSAT to continue offering their reverse VUCC or VUCC stroke R award as an AMSAT award. The award was officially transferred to AMSAT on September 16th, 2021. We have all those that have received the award listed on the new award page for the reverse VUCC at AMSAT.org. There's one upgrade that I have to now process for Randy, WI7P, who was the first recipient of the reverse VUCC award. Take a look at the new award and see if you have enough grids worked from to earn the first AMSAT issued award. And thanks for joining us. Thank you, Bruce. Thank you, Bruce, Paul, for that update. Uh, Paul has to start oh. that uh, video back or start my video in case someone's got some questions. There he right. goes. Okay. I, yeah, I don't see any. I, I don't see any questions uh, about about awards. Um, Yay! But uh, uh, if uh, let's see, we do have uh, a couple of questions about. Um, first of all, the cost of the commercial satellite, uh, and the launch cost. Uh, basically, how much money that we need to raise uh, in order to. Uh, get this uh, get this project get the FM satellite off the ground, uh, and then why U VU rather than UV? All right. Uh, the is my audio coming in? Yes. Okay. The uh, uh, the cost is is still a little bit up in the air uh, because we're not exactly sure of the configuration. Originally, I obtained a quote for uh, one uh, flight model 
one spare, a uh, flight spare, and one engineering model, plus a launch to a uh, sun synchronous orbit at 500 uh, kilometers. Uh, that price was uh, approximately $283,000 US. Uh, we were, uh, I have to get back with the, uh, with the vendor and uh, see uh, if we want to re rearrange anything. But uh, for right now, I will be uh, probably making an announcement in the next week or two uh, to formally launch the, uh, the fundraising campaign for that uh, and the formal announcement of the program. The uh, YVU, uh, because we are looking at purchasing a uh, ready-built package CubeSat, uh, and those uh, VU is what the two vendors that offer uh, FM repeaters within a, a CubeSat uh, have available. Uh, there are no UV uh, repeaters. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Robert, uh, for, for that. Um, see if we have any other questions here. Um, we got that. Okay. Um, yes. Thanks to Bruce for his many years of dedications to award services. Yes. And uh, certainly he's been a, uh, certainly he's been a star in that, uh, in that department for, uh, for many years now. Um, including expanding the program uh, to include some great, great awards. All right, well, we are um, slightly over uh, the promised end time. Uh, does anybody have any uh, uh, questions? Robert, uh, any, uh, does anybody have any other comments or questions before, uh, before we uh, shut this down? Yeah, I would like to uh, echo uh, your comments there about Bruce there. He's done a great job. Uh, not, not only does he uh, do contests and awards, uh, he also is the, uh, the manager for the AMSAT store and serves as a director. Uh, plus, uh, he does the, uh, the amateur satellite spot on the ARRL podcast. So uh, we greatly appreciate all the, uh, the time that he donates to AMSAT uh, and doing a great job at, at that. Thank you. Yes, be sure to check out the, uh, if, if uh, I don't know how many people are aware of the ARRL audio news posted on their website, as well as on the, uh, uh, on, the uh, on various podcasting platforms, but uh, uh, there's always a satellite update every Thursday generally, and uh, that is content is supplied by, uh, by Bruce faithfully every, every Thursday. So um, I think we are ready then. Uh, in the absence of any further uh, questions, I think we're ready to uh, officially close the, uh, some, the general meeting in the symposium. Um, so uh, does, does anybody have any comments before we, uh, before we close? We will be per, uh, proceeding to a uh, informal session, so we'll keep the Zoom session open. Uh, we can promote any attendee who wants to stick around and uh, kind of chat amongst ourselves um, to, uh, to panelists so you can turn your cameras and microphones on. Um, so, uh, does anybody have any, anybody who's currently on the panel, uh, which are all the AMSAT board members and senior officers that are with us today, uh, does anybody have any further comments? Oh, we have one more prize to give away. Oh, that's right. Thank that's you for coming. Thanks for reminding me. Go ahead. All righty. For some reason, my camera likes to go dark on me. Okay. Our, uh, our last prize, uh, is going to be a, uh, give me one second here. Our last prize is going to be a, a gift of your choice from the Zazzle store. Anything that we have in the, Z uh, in the Zazzle store, okay, with customization uh, is our prize. So you can uh, pick what it is that you would like to have. <laughs> Let's spin the, uh, the wheel one more time here. <laughs> Rizgala, Oscar Delta Five, Romeo India is our winner for our last prize. Congratulations. Back to you, Paul. Okay, uh, thank you, Frank. And yes, I will be uh, uh, getting in touch with the uh, recipients of all of the 
uh, Zazzle prizes to uh, to uh, work through that. Uh, luckily, they do ship internationally, so that last one won't be <laughs> won't be a problem. Uh, we uh, will have a bit higher cost on the shipping though. So, but that's uh, uh, we we're also saving a lot by not hosting the uh, symposium in uh, uh, in Minneapolis, um, paying for all those costs. So, all right. Um, so uh, with that. Uh, there was a question about saving the chat and Q&A. Uh, this should be the chat and Q&A should be recorded. Um, so I will look at uh, posting that, um, uh, posting at least relevant uh, stuff on the AMSAT website uh, to keep that, uh, keep, avail uh, keep that available for everybody. So if nobody else has anything further, I think it's uh, time to close uh, the symposium and general meeting. Thanks to everybody who presented today. Uh, everybody who um, everybody who submitted papers to the proceedings, uh, thanks uh, thanks especially to Dan Schultz and eight uh, Fox Golf uh, Victor um, for um, for putting together the symposium proceedings, which are now available on the uh, AMSAT member portal for all AMSAT members. I'll also send out a um, an email to uh, to um, to all of our uh, registered attendees, noting that uh, the proceedings are of uh, the symposium are now available. Um, and again, thanks to everybody who joined us today. Uh, and uh, that will uh, close today's symposium. Again, stick around and we will promote you to, uh, to panelists um, if you want to stick around for a discussion. Paul, are you still there? Oh. Yes. Hey. Uh, yeah. I would be remiss if I didn't thank you for uh, all the effort you put into this today. Uh, great job, uh, you and uh, the other volunteers uh, for our virtual team. So I really appreciate your effort. Thank you very much. All right. Yes. Thank you, and thanks to uh, thanks to Frank and uh, One UW for being the prize uh, the prize czar today. The uh, prize. I learned how to share audio. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you can't top what I had to learn. All right, well, we will uh, close the YouTube stream now and uh, leave the Zoom open. So 7-3 to everybody viewing us uh, on the YouTube and thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, an archive of this will continue to be available on YouTube uh, for future viewing. 7-3 all. Like,